Section 0 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matthew Munoz. The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. Advertisement. The general design of the following sheets is to enlist imagination under the banner of science, and to lead her votaries from the looser analogies, which dress out the imagery of poetry, to the stricter, ones which form the retiocination of philosophy. While their particular design is to induce the ingenious to cultivate the knowledge of botany by introducing them to the vestibule of that delightful science, and recommending to their attention the immortal works of the celebrated Swedish naturalist Linnaeus. In the first poem, or Economy of Vegetation, the physiology of plants is delivered, and the operation of the elements, as far as they may be supposed to affect the growth of vegetables. In the second poem, or Loves of the Plants, the sexual system of Linnaeus is explained, with the remarkable properties of many particular plants. Apology. It may be proper here to apologize for many of the subsequent conjectures on some articles of natural philosophy as not being supported by accurate investigation or conclusive experiments. Extravagant theories, however, in those parts of philosophy where our knowledge is yet imperfect are not without their use, as they encourage the execution of laborious experiments or the investigation of ingenious deductions to confirm or refute them and since natural objects are allied to each other by many affinities, every kind of theoretic distribution of them adds to our knowledge by developing some of their analogies. The Rosicrucian doctrine of gnomes, sylphs, nymphs, and salamanders was thought to afford a proper machinery for a botanic poem, as it is probable that they were originally the names of hieroglyphic figures representing the elements. Many of the operations of nature were shadowed or allegorized in the heathen mythology, as the first Cupid springing from the egg of night, the marriage of Cupid and Psyche, the rape of Proserpine, the congress of Jupiter and Juno, death and resuscitation of Adonis, etc., many of which are ingeniously explained in the works of Bacon, volume 5, page 47, 4th edition, London, 1778. The Egyptians were possessed of many discoveries in philosophy and chemistry before the invention of letters. These were then expressed in hieroglyphic paintings of men and animals, which, after the discovery of the alphabet, were described and animated by the poets, and became, first, the deities of Egypt, and afterwards of Greece and Rome. Allusions to those fables were therefore thought proper ornaments to a philosophical poem, and are occasionally introduced either as represented by the poets, or preserved on the numerous gems and medallions of antiquity. End of section zero. Section one of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts. Part one, The Economy of Vegetation by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To the author of the poem on the loves of the plants, by the Rev. W. B. Stevens. Oft though thy genius D, amply fraught with native wealth, explore new worlds of mind, whence the bright oars of drossless wisdom brought, stamped by the muse's hand, enrich mankind. Though willing nature to thy curious eye, involved in night, her mazy depths betray, till at their source thy piercing search descry the streams that bathe with life our mortal clay. Though, boldly soaring in sublimer mood, Through trackless skies on metaphysic wings, Thou darest to scan the approachless cause of good, And weigh with steadfast hand the sum of things. Yet wilt thou, charmed amid his whispering bowers, Oft with lonely step by glittering derwent stray, Mark his green foliage, count his musky flowers, That blush or tremble to the rising ray? while fancy, seated in her rock-roofed dell, listening the secrets of the vernal grove, breathes sweetest strains to thy symphonious shell, and gives new echoes to the throne of love. 
Repton, November 28, 1788. End of section 1. Section 2 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts. Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Economy of Vegetation, Canto 1, Lines 1 through 188. Stay your rude steps, whose throbbing breasts enfold the legion fiends of glory or of gold. Stay, whose false lips seductive simpers part, while cunning nestles in the harlot heart. For you no dryads dress the roseate bower, for you no nymphs their sparkling vases pour. Unmarked by you, light graces swim the green, and hovering cupids aim their shafts unseen. But thou, whose mind the well-attempered ray of taste and virtue lights with purer day, whose finer sense each soft vibration owns with sweet responsive sympathy of tones. So the fair flower expands its lucid form to meet the sun and shuts it to the storm. For thee my borders nurse the fragrant wreath, my fountains murmur and my zephyrs breathe. Slow slides the painted snail, the gilded fly smooths his fine down to charm thy curious eye. On twinkling fins my pearly nations play, or win with sinuous train their trackless way. My plumy pairs in gay embroidery dressed form with ingenious bill the pensile nest to love's sweet notes attune the listening dell, and echo sounds her soft symphonious shell. Note. So the fair flower, line 13. It seems to have been the original design of the philosophy of Epicurus to render the mind exquisitely sensible to agreeable sensations, and equally insensible to disagreeable ones. End note. And, if with thee some hapless maid should stray, disastrous love, companion of her way, oh, lead her timid steps to yonder glade, whose arching cliffs depending alders shade. There, as meek evening wakes her temperate breeze, and moonbeams glimmer through the trembling trees. The rills that gurgle round shall soothe her ear, the weeping rocks shall number tear for tear. There, as sad Philomel, alike forlorn, sings to the night from her accustomed thorn, while at sweet intervals each falling note sighs in the gale and whispers round the groat. The sister woe shall calm her aching breast, and softer slumbers steal her cares to rest. Note. Disastrous Love, line 26. The scenery is taken from a botanic garden about a mile from Litchfield, where a cold bath was erected by Sir John Floyer. There is a grotto surrounded by projecting rocks, from the edges of which trickles a perpetual shower of water, and it is here represented as adapted to love scenes, as being thence a proper residence for the modern goddess of botany, and the easier to introduce the next poem on the loves of the plants according to the system of Linnaeus. End note. Winds of the north, restrain your icy gales, nor chill the bosom of these happy vales. Hence in dark heaps ye gathering clouds revolve. Disperse ye lightnings, and ye mists dissolve. Hither, emerging from yon orient skies, botanic goddess, Bend thy radiant eyes, or these soft scenes assume thy gentle reign. Pomona, Ceres, Flora in thy train, or the still dawn thy placid smile effuse, and with thy silver sandals print the dews. In noon's bright blaze thy vermil vest unfold, and wave thy emerald banner starred with gold. Thus spoke the genius as he stepped along, and bade these lawns to peace and truth belong. Down the steep slopes he led with modest skill the willing pathway and the truant rill. Stretched o'er the marshy vale yon willowy mound, where shines the lake amid the tufted ground. Raised the young woodland, smoothed the wavy green, and gave to beauty all the quiet scene. She comes, the goddess, through the whispering air, bright as the morn descends her blushing car, each circling wheel a wreath of flowers entwines, and gemmed with flowers the silken harness shines. 
the golden bits with flowery studs are decked, and knots of flowers the crimson reins connect. And now on earth the silver axle rings, and the shell sinks upon its slender springs. Light from her airy seat the goddess bounds, and steps celestial press the pansied grounds. Fair spring advancing calls her feathered choir, and tunes to softer notes her laughing lyre, bids her gay hours on purple pinions move, and arms her zephyrs with the shafts of love. Pleased gnomes, ascending from their earthy beds, play round her graceful footsteps as she treads. Gay sylphs attendant beat the fragrant air on winnowing wings and waft her golden hair. Blue nymphs emerging leave their sparkling streams and fiery forms alight from orient beams. Musked in the rose's lap fresh dews they shed, or breathe celestial lusters round her head. Note. Pleased gnomes, line 73. The Rosicrucian doctrine of gnomes, sylphs, nymphs, and salamanders affords proper machinery for a philosophic poem, as it is probable that they were originally the names of hieroglyphic figures of the elements, or of genii presiding over their operations. The fairies of more modern days seem to have been derived from them and to have inherited their powers. The gnomes and sylphs, as being more nearly allied to modern fairies, are represented as either male or female, which distinguishes the latter from the ore of the Latin poets, which were only female, except the winds, as Zephyrus and Oster may be supposed to have been their husbands. End note. First the fine forms her dulcet voice requires, which bathe or bask in elemental fires. From each bright gem of day's refulgent car, from the pale sphere of every twinkling star, from each nice pore of ocean, earth, and air, with eye of flame the sparkling hosts repair, mix their gay hues, in changeful circles play, like motes that tenant the meridian ray. So clear lens collects with magic power the countless glories of the midnight hour. Stars after stars with quivering luster fall, and twinkling glide along the whitened wall. Pleased as they pass, she counts the glittering bands, and stills their murmur with her waving hands. Each listening tribe with fond expectance burns, and now to these and now to those she turns. 1. Nymphs of primeval fire, your vestal train hung with gold tresses o'er the vast inane, pierced with your silver shafts the throne of night, and charmed young nature's opening eyes with light, when love divine, with brooding wings unfurled, called from the rude abyss the living world. Let there be light, proclaimed the Almighty Lord. Astonished chaos heard the potent word. Through all his realms the kindling ether runs, and the mass starts into a million suns. Earths round each sun with quick explosions burst, and second planets issue from the first bend as they journey with projectile force in bright ellipses their reluctant course. Orbs wheel in orbs, round centers centers roll, and form, self-balanced, one revolving whole. Onward they move amid their bright abode, space without bound, the bosom of their god. Note. Nymphs of Primeval Fire, line 97. The fluid matter of heat is perhaps the most extensive element in nature. All other bodies are immersed in it, and are preserved in their present state of solidity or fluidity by the attraction of their particles to the matter of heat, since all known bodies are contractible into less space by depriving them of some portion of their heat, and there is no part of nature totally deprived of heat, there is reason to believe that the particles of bodies do not touch but are held towards each other by their self-attraction, and recede from each other by their attraction to the mass of heat which surrounds them, and thus exist in an equilibrium between these two powers. If more of the matter of heat be applied to them, they recede further from each other, and become fluid. If still more be applied, they take an aerial form, and are termed gases by the modern chemists. Thus, when water is heated to a certain degree, it would instantly assume the form of steam, but for the pressure of the atmosphere, which prevents this change from taking place so easily. The same is true of quicksilver, diamonds, and of perhaps all other bodies in nature. They would first become fluid, and then aeriform by appropriated degrees of heat. 
on the contrary, this elastic matter of heat, termed caloric, in the new nomenclature of the French academicians, is liable to become consolidated itself in its combinations with some bodies, as perhaps in nitre, and probably in combustible bodies as sulfur and charcoal. See note on line 232 of this canto. Modern philosophers have not yet been able to decide whether light and heat be different fluids, or modifications of the same fluid, as they have many properties in common. See note on line 462 of this canto. End note. Note. When love divine, line 101. From having observed the gradual evolution of the young animal or plant from its egg or seed, and afterwards its successive advances to its more perfect state or maturity, Philosophers of all ages seem to have imagined that the great world itself had likewise its infancy and its gradual progress to maturity. This seems to have given origin to the very ancient and sublime allegory of Eros, or divine love, producing the world from the egg of night as it floated in chaos. See line 419 of this canto. The external crust of the earth, as far as it has been exposed to our view in mines or mountains, countenances this opinion, since these have evidently for the most part had their origin from the shells of fishes, the decomposition of vegetables, and the recrements of other animal materials, and must therefore have been formed progressively from small beginnings. There are likewise some apparently useless or incomplete appendages to plants and animals, which seem to show they have gradually undergone changes from their original state, such as the stamens without anthers, and styles without stigmas of several plants, as mentioned in the note on Curcuma, volume 2 of this work. Such is the halteries, or rudiments of wings of some two-winged insects, and the paps of male animals. Thus swine have four toes, but two of them are imperfectly formed, and not long enough for use. The elantoid in some animals seems to have become extinct, in others it is above tenfold the size, which would seem necessary for its purpose. Buffon du Cochon, T6, page 257. Perhaps all the supposed monstrous births of nature are remains of their habits of production in their former less perfect state, or attempts towards greater perfection. End note. Note, through all his realms, line 105. Mr. Herschel has given a very sublime and curious account of the construction of the heavens with his discovery of some thousand nebulae, or clouds of stars, many of which are much larger collections of stars than all those put together which are visible to our naked eyes, added to those which form the galaxy or milky zone which surrounds us. He observes that in the vicinity of these clusters of stars there are proportionally fewer stars than in other parts of the heavens, and hence he concludes that they have attracted each other, on the supposition that infinite space was at first equally sprinkled with them as if it had at the beginning been filled with a fluid mass, which had coagulated. Mr. Herschel has further shown that the whole sidereal system is gradually moving round some center, which may be an opaque mass of matter. Philosophical Transactions 574 If all these sums are moving round some great central body, they must have had a projectile force, as well as a centripetal one, and may be thence be supposed to have emerged or been projected from the material where they were produced. We can have no idea of a natural power which could project a sun out of chaos, except by comparing it to the explosions or earthquakes owing to the sudden evolution of aqueous or of other more elastic vapors, of the power of which under immeasurable degrees of heat and compression we are yet ignorant." It may be objected that if the stars had been projected from a chaos by explosions, that they must have returned again into it from the known laws of gravitation. This, however, would not happen if the whole of chaos, like grains of gunpowder, was exploded at the same time, and dispersed through infinite space at once, or in quick succession, in every possible direction. The same objection may be stated against the possibility of the planets having been thrown from the sun by explosions, and the secondary planets from the primary ones, which will be spoken of more at large in the second canto, but if the planets are supposed to have been projected from their suns, and the secondary from the primary ones, at the beginning of their course, 
they might be so influenced or diverted by the attractions of the suns or sun in their vicinity as to prevent their tendency to return into the body from which they were projected. If these innumerable and immense suns thus rising out of chaos are supposed to have thrown out their attendant planets by new explosions as they ascended, and those their respective satellites, filling in a moment the immensity of space with light and motion, a grander idea cannot be conceived by the mind of man. End note. 2. Ethereal powers. You chase the shooting stars, or yoke the volleyed lightnings to your cars. Cling round the aerial bow with prisms bright, and pleased untwist the sevenfold threads of light. Eve's silken couch with gorgeous tints adorn, and fire the arrowy throne of rising morn. Or, plumed with flame, in gay battalion spring to brighter regions borne on broader wing, where lighter gases, circumfused on high, form the vast concave of exterior sky. With airy lens the scattered rays assault, and bend the twilight round the dusky vault. Ride, with broad eye and scintillating hair, the rapid fireball through the midnight air. Dart from the north on pale electric streams, fringing night's sable robe with transient beams. Or, rain the planets in their swift careers, gliding with borrowed light their twinkling spheres. Alarm with comet blaze the sapphire plain, the wan stars glimmering through its silver train. Gem the bright zodiac, stud the glowing pole, or give the sun's phlogistic orb to roll. Note. Chase the shooting stars, line 115. The meteors, called shooting stars, the lightning, the rainbow, and the clouds, are phenomena of the lower regions of the atmosphere. The twilight, the meteors, called fireballs, or flying dragons, and the northern lights, inhabit the higher regions of the atmosphere. See additional notes number one. End note. Note. Cling round the aerial bow, line 117. See additional notes number two. End note. Note. Eve's Silken Couch, line 119. See additional notes, number 3. End note. Note. Where lighter gases, line 123. Mr. Cavendish has shown that the gas called inflammable air is at least ten times lighter than common air. Mr. Lavoisier contends that it is one of the component parts of water and is called by him hydrogen. It is supposed to afford their principal nourishment to vegetables and thence to animals, and is perpetually rising from their decomposition. This source of it in hot climates and in summer months is so great as to exceed estimation. Now, if this light gas passes through the atmosphere without combining with it, it must compose another atmosphere over the aerial one, which must expand, when the pressure above it is thus taken away, to inconceivable tenuity. If this supernatural gaseous atmosphere floats upon the aerial one, like ether upon water, what must happen? 1. It will flow from the air line, where it will be produced in the greatest quantities, and become much accumulated over the poles of the earth. 2. The common air, or lower stratum of the atmosphere, will be much thinner over the poles than at the line, because if a glass globe be filled with oil and water, and whirled upon its axis, the centrifugal power will carry the heavier fluid to the circumference and the lighter will in consequence be found round the axis. 3. There may be a place at some certain latitude between the poles and the line on each side of the equator where the inflammable supernatant atmosphere may end, owing to the greater centrifugal force of the heavier aerial atmosphere. 4. Between the termination of the aerial and the beginning of the gaseous atmosphere, the airs will occasionally be intermixed, and thus become inflammable by the electric spark. These circumstances will assist in explaining the phenomena of fireballs, northern lights, and of some variable winds and long-continued rains. Since the above note was first written, Mr. Volta, I am informed, has applied the supposition of a supernatant atmosphere of inflammable air to explain some phenomena in meteorology, and Mr. Lavoisier has announced his design to write on this subject. Trete de Chimie, tome 1. I am happy to find these opinions supported by such respectable authority. End note. Note. And bend the twilight. Line 126. The crepuscular atmosphere, or the region where the light of the sun ceases to be refracted to us, is estimated by philosophers to be between 40 and 50 miles high, at which time the sun is about 18 degrees below the horizon, 
and the rarity of the air is supposed to be from 4,000 to 10,000 times greater than at the surface of the earth. Coates's Hydrostatical and Pneumatical Lectures, page 123. The duration of twilight differs in different seasons and in different latitudes. In England, the shortest twilight is about the beginning of October and of March. In more northern latitudes, where the sun never sinks more than 18 degrees below the horizon, the twilight continues the whole night. The time of its duration may also be occasionally affected by the varying height of the atmosphere. A number of observations on the duration of twilight in different latitudes might afford considerable information concerning the aerial strata in the higher regions of the atmosphere, and might assist in determining whether an exterior atmosphere of inflammable gas or hydrogen exists over the aerial one. End note. Note. Alarm with comet blaze, line 133. See additional notes, number 4. End note. Note. The sun's phlogistic orb, line 136. See additional notes, number 5. End note. 3. Nymphs, your fine forms with steps impassive mock earth's vaulted roofs of adamantine rock. Round her still center tread the burning soil, and watch the billowy lavas as they boil, where, in basaltic caves imprisoned deep, reluctant fires in dread suspension sleep, or sphere on sphere in widening waves expand, and glad with genial warmth the incumbent land. So when the mother bird selects their food with curious bill and feeds her callow brood, warmth from her tender heart eternal springs, and pleased she clasps them with extended wings. Note, round the still center, line 139, many philosophers have believed that the central parts of the earth consist of a fluid mass of burning lava, which they have called a subterraneous sun, and have supposed that it contributes to the production of metals and to the growth of vegetables. See additional notes, number six. End note. Note, or sphere on sphere, line 143. See additional notes, number seven. End note. You from deep cauldrons and unmeasured caves blow flaming airs or pour vitrescent waves, or shining oceans ray volcanic light, or hurl innocuous embers to the night while with loud shouts to Etna Hecla calls, and Andes answers from his beaconed walls, sea-wildered crews the mountain stars admire, and beauty beams amid tremendous fire. Note, hurl innocuous embers, line 152. The immediate cause of volcanic eruptions is believed to be owing to the water of the sea, or from lakes or inundations, finding itself a passage into the subterranean fires, which may lie at great depths. This must first produce by its coldness a condensation of the vapor there existing, or a vacuum, and thus occasion parts of the earth's crust or shell to be forced down by the pressure of the incumbent atmosphere. Afterwards, the water being suddenly raised into steam produces all the explosive effects of earthquakes and by new accessions of water during the intervals of the explosions, the repetition of the shocks is caused. These circumstances were hourly illustrated by the fountains of boiling water in Iceland, in which the surface of the water in the boiling wells sunk down low, before every new ebullition. Besides these eruptions occasioned by the steam of water, there seems to be a perpetual effusion of other vapors, more noxious and, as far as it is yet known, perhaps greatly more expansile than water from the volcanoes in various parts of the world, as these volcanoes are supposed to be spiracula or breathing holes to the great subterraneous fires, it is probable that the escape of elastic vapors from them is the cause that the earthquakes of modern days are of such small extent compared to those of ancient times, of which vestiges remain in every part of the world, and on this account may be said not only to be innocuous, but useful. End note. Thus when of old, as mystic bards presume, huge cyclops dwelt in Etna's rocky womb, on thundering anvils rung their loud alarms, and leagued with Vulcan forged immortal arms. Descending Venus sought the dark abode, and soothed the labors of the grisly god, while frowning loves the threatening falchion wield, and tittering graces peep behind the shield. With jointed mail their fairy limbs o'erwhelm, or nod with pausing step the plumed helm, 
With radiant eyes she viewed the boiling ore, heard undismayed the breathing bellows roar, admired their sinewy arms and shoulders bare, and ponderous hammers lifted high in air. With smiles celestial blessed their dazzled sight, and beauty blazed amid infernal light. 4. Effulgent maids, you round deciduous day, tressed with soft beams your glittering bands array. On earth's cold bosom, as the sun retires, confine with folds of air the lingering fires, or eve's pale forms diffuse phosphoric light, and deck with lambent flames the shrine of night. So, warmed and kindled by meridian skies, and viewed in darkness with dilated eyes, Bologna's chocks with faint ignition blaze, Beccari's shells emit prismatic rays, so to the sacred sun in Memnon's fane, spontaneous concords choired the matin strain. Touched by his orient beam, responsive rings the living lyre, and vibrates all its strings. Accordant ails the tender tones prolong, and holy echoes swell the adoring song. Note. Confine with folds of air, line 176. The air, like all other bad conductors of electricity, is known to be a bad conductor of heat, and thence prevents the heat acquired from the sun's rays by the earth's surface from being so soon dissipated, in the same manner as a blanket, which may be considered as a sponge filled with air, prevents the escape of heat from the person wrapped in it. This seems to be one cause of the great degree of cold on the tops of mountains, where the rarity of the air is greater, and it therefore becomes a better conductor both of heat and electricity. See note on Barometz, volume 2 of this work. There is, however, another cause to which the great coldness of mountains and of the higher regions of the atmosphere is more immediately to be ascribed, explained by Dr. Darwin in the Philosophical Transactions, volume 78, who has there proved by experiments with the air gun and air pump that when any portion of the atmosphere becomes mechanically expanded, it absorbs heat from the bodies in its vicinity, and as the air which creeps along the plains expands itself by a part of the pressure being taken off when it ascends the sides of mountains, it at the same time attracts heat from the summits of those mountains, or other bodies which happen to be immersed in it, and thus produces cold. Hence he concludes that the hot air at the bottom of the Andes becomes temperate by its own rarefaction when it ascends to the city of Quito, and by its further rarefaction becomes cooled to the freezing point when it ascends to the snowy regions on the summits of those mountains. To this he also attributes the great degree of cold experienced by the aeronauts and their balloons, and which produces hail in summer at the height of only two or three miles in the atmosphere. End note. Note. Diffuse phosphoric light, line 117. I have often been induced to believe from observation that the twilight of the evenings is lighter than that of the mornings at the same distance from noon. Some may ascribe this to the greater height of the atmosphere in the evenings having been rarefied by the sun during the day. But as its density must at the same time be diminished, its power of refraction would continue the same. I should rather suppose that it may be owing to the phosphorescent quality, as it is called, of almost all bodies. That is, when they have been exposed to the sun, they continue to emit light for a considerable time afterwards. This is generally believed to arise either from such bodies giving out the light which they had previously absorbed, or to the continuance of a slow combustion which the light they had been previously exposed to had excited. See the next note. End note. Note. Beccari's Shells, line 182. Beccari made many curious experiments on the phosphoric light, as it is called, which becomes visible on bodies brought into a dark room, after having been previously exposed to the sunshine. It appears from these experiments that almost all inflammable bodies possess this quality in a greater or less degree. White paper or linen, thus examined after having been exposed to the sunshine, is luminous to an extraordinary degree, and if a person shut up in a dark room puts one of his hands out into the sun's light for a short time and then retracts it, he will be able to see that hand distinctly and not the other. These experiments seem to countenance the idea of light being absorbed and again emitted from bodies when they are removed into darkness, 
but Beccari further pretended that some calcareous compositions, when exposed to red, yellow, or blue light through colored glasses, would on their being brought into a dark room emit colored lights. This mistaken fact of Beccari's, Mr. Wilson decidedly refutes, and among many other curious experiments discovered that if oyster shells were thrown into a common fire and calcined for about half an hour, and then brought to a person who had previously been some minutes in a dark room, many of them would exhibit beautiful irises of prismatic colors, from whence probably arose Beccari's mistake. Mr. Wilson from hence contends that these kinds of phosphori do not emit the light they had previously received, but that they are set on fire by the sun's rays, and continue for some time in a slow combustion after they are withdrawn from the light. Wilson's Experiments on Phosphori, Dodsley, 1775. The Bolognian stone is a selenite, or gypsum, and has been long celebrated for its phosphorescent quality after having been burnt in a sulfurous fire, and exposed when cold to the sun's light. It may be thus well imitated. Calcine oyster shells half an hour, pulverize them when cold, and add one-third part of flowers of sulfur, press them close into a small crucible, and calcine them for an hour or longer, and keep the powder in a phial close stopped. A part of this powder is to be exposed for a minute or two to the sunbeams, and then brought into a dark room. The calcined Bolognian stone becomes a calcareous hepar of sulfur, but the calcined shells, as they contain the animal acid, may also contain some of the phosphorus of kunkel. End note. Note. In Memnon's Fane, line 183, see additional notes number 8. End note. End of section 2. Section 3 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 1, lines 189 through 278. You with light gas the lamp's nocturnal feed, which dance and glimmer o'er the marshy mead. Shine round Calendula at twilight hours, and tip with silver all her saffron flowers. Warm on her mossy couch the radiant worm, guard from cold dews her love-illumined form. From leaf to leaf conduct the virgin light, star of the earth and diamond of the night. You bid in air the tropic beetle burn, and fill with golden flame his winged urn or gild the surge with insect sparks that swarm round the bright oar the kindling prow alarm, or arm in waves electric in his ire the dread gymnotus with ethereal fire. Onward his course with waving tail he helms, and mimic lightning scare the watery realms. So, when with bristling plumes the bird of Jove vindictive leaves the ardent fields above, Born on broad wings, the guilty world he awes, and grasps the lightning in his shining claws. Note, the lamps nocturnal, line 189. The ignis fatuus, or jack-o'-lantern, frequently alluded to by poets, is supposed to originate from the inflammable air, or hydrogen, given up from morasses, which, being of a heavier kind from its impurity than that obtained from iron and water, hovers near the surface of the earth, and, uniting with common air, gives out light by its slow ignition. Perhaps such lights have no existence, and the reflection of a star on watery ground may have deceived the travelers, who have been said to be bewildered by them. If the fact was established, it would much contribute to explain the phenomena of northern lights. I have traveled much in the night, in all seasons of the year, and over all kinds of soil, but never saw one of these will-o'-wisps. End note. Note. Shine round calendula, line 191. See note on tropeolum in volume 2. End note. Note. The radiant worm, line 193. See additional notes, number 9. End note. Note. The dread gymnotus, line 202. The Gymnotus electricus is a native of the river of Surinam in South America. Those which were brought over to England about eight years ago were about three or four feet long, and gave an electric shock, 
as I experienced, by putting one finger on the back near its head and another of the opposite hand into the water near its tail. In their native country they are said to exceed twenty feet in length and kill any man who approaches them in a hostile manner. It is not only to escape its enemies that this surprising power of the fish is used, but also to take its prey, which it does by benumbing them and then devouring them before they have time to recover, or by perfectly killing them, for the quantity of the power seemed to be determined by the will or anger of the animal, as it sometimes struck a fish twice before it was sufficiently benumbed to be easily swallowed. The organs productive of this wonderful accumulation of electric matter have been accurately dissected and described by Mr. J. Hunter, Philosophical Transactions, Volume 65, and are so divided by membranes as to compose a very extensive surface and are supplied with many pairs of nerves larger than any other nerves of the body. But how so large a quantity is so quickly accumulated as to produce such amazing effects in a fluid ill-adapted for the purpose is not yet satisfactorily explained. The torpedo possesses a similar power in a less degree, as was shown by Mr. Walch, and another fish lately described by Mr. Patterson, Philosophical Transactions, Volume 76. In the construction of the laden file, as it is called, which is coated on both sides, it is known that above 100 times the quantity of positive electricity can be condensed on every square inch of the coating on one side than could have been accumulated on the same surface if there had been no opposite coating communicating with the earth, because the negative electricity, or that part of it which caused its expansion, is now drawn off through the glass. It is also well known that the thinner the glass is, which is thus coated on both sides so as to make a laden file or plate, the more electricity can be condensed on one of its surfaces till it becomes so thin as to break, and thence discharge itself. Now it is possible that the quantity of electricity condensable on one side of a coated file may increase in some high ratio in respect to the thinness of the glass, since the power of attraction is known to decrease as the squares of the distances, to which this circumstance of electricity seems to bear some analogy. Hence, if an animal membrane, as thin as the silkworm spins its silk, could be so situated as to be charged, like the laden bottle, without bursting, as such thin glass would be liable to do, it would be difficult to calculate the immense quantity of electrical fluid which might be accumulated on its surface. No land animals are yet discovered which possess this power, though the air would have been a much better medium for producing its effects. Perhaps the size of the necessary apparatus would have been inconvenient to land animals. End note. Note. In his Shining Claws, line 208, alluding to an antique gem in the collection of the Grand Duke of Florence, Spence. End note. 5. 1. Nymphs, your soft smiles uncultured man subdued, and charmed the savage from his native wood. You, while amazed his hurrying hordes retire from the fell havoc of devouring fire, taught the first art, with piney rods to raise, by quick attrition the domestic blaze, fan with soft breath, with kindling leaves provide, and lift the dread destroyer on his side. So, with bright wreath of serpent tresses crowned, severe in beauty, young Medusa frowned, erstwhile subdued, round wisdom's aegis rolled, hissed the dread snakes, and flamed in burnished gold, flashed on her brandished arm the mortal shield, and terror lightened o'er the dazzled field. Note of Devouring Fire, line 212. The first and most important discovery of mankind seems to have been that of fire. For many ages it is probable fire was esteemed a dangerous enemy, known only by its dreadful devastations, and that many lives must have been lost, and many dangerous burns and wounds must have afflicted those who first dared to subject it to the uses of life. It is said that the tall monkeys of Borneo and Sumatra lie down with pleasure round any accidental fire in their woods, and are arrived to that degree of reason, that knowledge of causation, that they thrust into the remaining fire half-burnt ends of the branches to prevent its going out. 
one of the nobles of the cultivated people of Otaheita, when Captain Cook treated them with tea, catched the boiling water in his hand from the cock of the tea urn and bellowed with pain, not conceiving that water could become hot like red fire. Tools of steel constitute another important discovery in consequence of fire, and contributed perhaps principally to give the European nations so great superiority over the American world. By these two agents, fire and tools of steel, mankind became able to cope with the vegetable kingdom and conquer provinces of forests, which in uncultivated countries almost exclude the growth of other vegetables, and of those animals which are necessary to our existence, and to this, that the quantity of our food is also increased by the use of fire, for some vegetables become salutary foods by means of the heat used in cookery, which are naturally either noxious or difficult of digestion, as potatoes, kidney beans, onions, cabbages. The cassava, when made into bread, is perhaps rendered mild by the heat it undergoes, more than by expressing its superfluous juice. The roots of white bryony and of arum, I am informed, lose much of their acrimony by boiling. End note. Note. Young Medusa frowned. Line 218. The Egyptian Medusa is represented on ancient gems with wings on her head, snaky hair, and a beautiful countenance which appears intensely thinking, and was supposed to represent divine wisdom. The Grecian Medusa, on Minerva's shield, as appears on other gems, has a countenance distorted with rage or pain, and is supposed to represent divine vengeance. The Medusa was one of the Gorgons, at first very beautiful and terrible to her enemies. Minerva turned her hair into snakes, and Perseus, having cut off her head, fixed it on the shield of that goddess, the sight of which then petrified the beholders. Danet Dictionary. End note. 5. 2. Nymphs, you disjoin, unite, condense, expand, and give new wonders to the chemist's hand. On tepid clouds of rising steam aspire, or fix in sulfur all its solid fire. With boundless spring elastic airs unfold, or fill the fine vacuities of gold. With sudden flash, vitrescent sparks reveal, by fierce collision from the flint and steel, or mark with shining letter Kunkel's name in the pale phosphor's self-consuming flame. So the chaste heart of some enchanted maid shines with insidious light by love betrayed. Round her pale bosom plays the young desire, and slow she wastes by self-consuming fire. Note. Or fix in sulfur, line 226. The phenomena of chemical explosions cannot be accounted for without the supposition that some of the bodies employed contain concentrated or solid heat combined with them, to which the French chemists have given the name of caloric. When air is expanded in the air pump or water evaporated into steam, they drink up or absorb a great quantity of heat. From this analogy, when gunpowder is exploded, it ought to absorb much heat, that is, in popular language, it ought to produce a great quantity of cold. When vital air is united with phlogistic matter in respiration, which seems to be a slow combustion, its volume is lessened, the carbonic acid and perhaps phosphoric acid are produced, and heat is given out, which according to the experiments of Dr. Crawford would seem to be deposited from the vital air. But as the vital air in nitrous acid is condensed from a light elastic gas to that of a heavy fluid, it must possess less heat than before, and hence a great part of the heat which is given out in firing gunpowder, I should suppose, must reside in the sulfur or charcoal. Mr. Lavoisier has shown that vital air, or oxygen, loses less of its heat when it becomes one of the component parts of nitrous acid than in any other of its combinations and is hence capable of giving out a great quantity of heat in the explosion of gunpowder. But as there seems to be great analogy between the matter of heat, or caloric, and the electric matter, and as the worst conductors of electricity are believed to contain the greatest quantity of that fluid, there is reason to suspect that the worst conductors of heat may contain the most of that fluid, as sulfur, wax, silk, air, glass. See note on line 174 of this canto. End note. Note. 
The Trescent Sparks, line 229. When flints are struck against other flints, they have the property of giving sparks of light, but it seems to be an internal light, perhaps of electric origin, very different from the ignited sparks which are struck from flint and steel. The sparks produced by the collision of steel with flint appear to be globular particles of iron which have been fused and imperfectly scorified or vitrified. They are kindled by the heat produced by the collision, but their vivid light and their fusion and vitrification are the effects of a combustion continued in these particles during their passage through the air. This opinion is confirmed by an experiment of Mr. Hawksby, who found that these sparks could not be produced in the exhausted receiver. See Keir's Chemical Dictionary, Article Iron and Article Earth, Vitrifiable. End note. Note. The Pale Phosphor, line 232. See additional notes. Number 10. End note. You taught mysterious bacon to explore metallic veins and part the dross from ore. With sylvan coal and whirling mills combine the crystalled nitre and the sulphurous mine. Through wiry nets the black diffusion strain and close an airy ocean in a grain. Pent in dark chambers of cylindric brass slumbers in grim repose the sooty mass. Lit by the brilliant spark, from grain to grain runs the quick fire along the kindling train. On the pained eardrum bursts the sudden crash, starts the red flame, and death pursues the flash. Fear's feeble hand directs the fiery darts, and strength and courage yield to chemic arts. Guilt with pale brow the mimic thunder owns, and tyrants tremble on their blood-stained thrones. Note and close an airy ocean, line 242. Gunpowder is plainly described in the works of Roger Bacon before the year 1267. He describes it in a curious manner, mentioning the sulfur and nitre, but conceals the charcoal in an anagram. The words are, sed tamen salis petre lure mope can ubre, et sulfuris et sic facies tonitrum et coriscationem si scias artificium. The words lure mope can ubre are an anagram of carbonium pulvere. Biographia Britannica, Volume 1, Bacon, De Secretis Operibus, Caput 11. He adds that he thinks by an artifice of this kind Gideon defeated the Midianites with only 300 men. Judges, Chapter 7, Chambers Dictionary, Article Gunpowder. As Bacon does not claim this as his own invention, it is thought by many to have been of much more ancient discovery. The permanently elastic fluid generated in the firing of gunpowder is calculated by Mr. Robbins to be about 244, if the bulk of the powder be 1, and that the heat generated at the time of the explosion occasions the rarefied air thus produced to occupy about 1,000 times the space of the gunpowder. This pressure may therefore be called equal to 1,000 atmospheres, or 6 tons upon a square inch. As the suddenness of this explosion must contribute much to its power, it would seem that the chamber of powder, to produce its greatest effect, should be lighted in the center of it, which I believe is not attended to in the manufacture of muskets or pistols. From the cheapness with which a very powerful gunpowder is likely soon to be manufactured from aerated marine acid, or from a new method of forming nitrous acid by means of manganese or other calciform ores, it may probably in time be applied to move machinery and supersede the use of steam. There is a bitter invective in Don Quixote against the inventors of gunpowder as it levels the strong with the weak the knight cased in steel with the naked shepherd, those who have been trained to the sword with those who are totally unskillful in the use of it, and throws down all the splendid distinctions of mankind. These very reasons ought to have been urged to show that the discovery of gunpowder has been of public utility by weakening the tyranny of the few over the many. End note. 6. Nymphs you erstwhile on simmering cauldrons played, and called delighted savory to your aid, bade round the youth explosive steam aspire, and gathering clouds, and winged the wave with fire. 
bade with cold streams the quick expansion stop, and sunk the immense of vapor to a drop. Pressed by the ponderous air, the piston falls, resistless, sliding through its iron walls. Quick moves the balanced beam of giant birth, wields his large limbs, and nodding shakes the earth. Note. Delighted Savory, line 254. The invention of the steam engine for raising water by the pressure of the air in consequence of the condensation of steam is properly ascribed to Captain Savory. A plate and description of this machine is given in Harris's Lexicon Technicum, article Engine. Though the Marquis of Worcester, in his Century of Inventions printed in the year 1663, had described an engine for raising water by the explosive power of steam long before Savory's. Mr. Desaguliers affirms that Savory brought up all he could procure of the books of the Marquis of Worcester, and destroyed them, professing himself then to have discovered the power of steam by accident, which seems to have been an unfounded slander. Savory applied it to the raising of water to supply houses and gardens, but could not accomplish the draining of mines by it, which was afterward done by Mr. Newcomen and Mr. John Cowley at Dartmouth in the year 1712, who added the piston. A few years ago, Mr. Watt of Glasgow much improved this machine, and with Mr. Bolton of Birmingham has applied it to a variety of purposes, such as raising water from mines, blowing bellows to fuse the ore, supplying towns with water, grinding corn, and many other purposes. There is reason to believe it may in time be applied to the rowing of barges and the moving of carriages along the road. As the specific levity of air is too great for the support of great burdens by balloons, there seems no probable method of flying conveniently but by the power of steam, or some other explosive material, which another half-century may probable discover. See additional notes, number 11. End note. The giant power from Earth's remotest caves lifts with strong arm her dark reluctant waves. Each caverned rock and hidden den explores, drags her dark coals and digs her shining oars. Next, in close cells of ribbed oak confined, gale after gale, he crowds the struggling wind. The imprisoned storms through brazen nostrils roar, fan the white flame, and fuse the sparkling ore. Here high in air the rising steam he pours, to clay-built cisterns, or to lead-lined towers. Fresh through a thousand pipes the wave distills, and thirsty cities drink the exuberant rills. There the vast millstone with inebriate whirl, on trembling floors his forceful fingers twirl, whose flinty teeth the golden harvests grind, feast without blood, and nourish humankind. Note. Feast without blood, line 278. The benevolence of the great author of all things is greatly manifest in the sum of his works, as Dr. Balgai has well evinced in his pamphlet on Divine Benevolence Asserted, printed for Davis, 1781. Yet, if we may compare the parts of nature with each other, there are some circumstances of her economy which seem to contribute more to the general scale of happiness than others. Thus the nourishment of animal bodies is derived from three sources. One the milk given from the mother to the offspring. In this excellent contrivance, the mother has pleasure in affording the sustenance to the child, and the child has pleasure in receiving it. 2. Another source of the food of animals includes seeds or eggs. In these, the embryon is in a torpid or insensible state, and there is, along with it, laid up for its early nourishment a store of provision, as the fruit belonging to some seeds and the oil and starch belonging to others. When these are consumed by animals, the unfeeling seed or egg receives no pain, but the animal receives pleasure which consumes it. Under this article may be included the bodies of animals which die naturally. 3. But the last method of supporting animal bodies by the destruction of other living animals, as lions preying upon lambs, these upon living vegetables, and mankind upon them all, would appear to be a less perfect part of the economy of nature than those before mentioned, as contributing less to the sum of general happiness. End note. End of section 3.
Section 4 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 1, lines 279 through 412. Now his hard hands on Mona's rifted crest, bosomed in rock, her azure oars arrest. With iron lips as rapid rollers seize the lengthening bars, in thin expansion squeeze, descending screws with ponderous flywheels wound the tawny plates, the new medallions round. Hard dyes of steel the cuprious circles cramp, and with quick fall his massy hammers stamp. The harp, the lily, and the lion join, and George and Britain guard the sterling coin. Note, Mona's Rifted Crest, line 279, alluding to the very valuable copper mines in the Isle of Angsley, the property of the Earl of Uxbridge. End note. Note, with iron lips, line 281, Mr. Bolton has lately constructed at Soho near Birmingham a most magnificent apparatus for coining, which has cost him some thousand pounds. The whole machinery is moved by an improved steam engine, which rolls the copper for halfpence finer than copper has before been rolled for the purpose of making money. It works the coupoirs or screw presses for cutting out the circular pieces of copper, and coins both the faces and edges of the money at the same time, with such superior excellence and cheapness of workmanship, as well as with marks of such powerful machinery as must totally prevent clandestine imitation, and in consequence save many lives from the hand of the executioner, a circumstance worthy the attention of a great minister. If a civic crown was given in Rome for preserving the life of one citizen, Mr. Bolton should be covered with garlands of oak." By this machinery four boys of ten or twelve years old are capable of striking thirty thousand guineas in an hour, and the machine itself keeps an unerring account of the pieces struck. End note. Soon shall thy arm, unconquered steam, afar, drag the slow barge, or drive the rapid car, or on wide-waving wings expanded bear the flying chariot through the fields of air. Fair crews triumphant, leaning from above, shall wave their fluttering kerchiefs as they move, or warrior bands alarm the gaping crowd, and armies shrink beneath the shadowy cloud. So mighty Hercules, o'er many a climb, waved his vast mace in virtue's cause sublime. Unmeasured strength with early art combined, awed, served, protected, and amazed mankind. First two dread snakes at Juno's vengeful nod climbed round the cradle of the sleeping god. Waked by the shrilling hiss and rustling sound, and shrieks of fair attendants trembling round, their gasping throats with clenching hands he holds, and death untwists their convoluted folds. Next, in red torrents from her sevenfold heads, fell Hydra's blood on Lerna's lake he sheds grasps Achilles with resistless force, and drags the roaring river to his course, binds with loud bellowing and with hideous yell the monster bull and threefold dog of hell. Note, So Mighty Hercules, line 297. The story of Hercules seems of great antiquity, as appears from the simplicity of his dress and armor, a lion's skin and a club, and from the nature of many of his exploits, the destruction of wild beasts and robbers. This part of the history of Hercules seems to have related to times before the invention of the bow and arrow, or of spinning flax. Other stories of Hercules are perhaps of later date, and appear to be allegorical, as his conquering the river god Achilles and bringing Cerberus up to daylight. The former might refer to his turning the course of a river, and draining a morass, and the latter to his exposing a part of the superstition of the times. The strangling the lion and tearing his jaws asunder are described from a statue in the Museum Florentium, and from an antique gem, and the grasping of Antaeus to death in his arms as he lifts him from the earth is described from another ancient cameo. The famous pillars of Hercules have been variously explained, 
Pliny asserts that the natives of Spain and Africa believed that the mountains of Abila and Calpe on each side of the Straits of Gibraltar were the pillars of Hercules, and that they were reared by the hands of that god, and the sea admitted between them. Pliny Historia Naturalis, page 46, edited Manute Benet, 1609. If the passage between the two continents was opened by an earthquake in ancient times, as this allegorical story would seem to countenance, there must have been an immense current of water at first run into the Mediterranean from the Atlantic, since there is at present a strong stream sets always from thence into the Mediterranean. Whatever may be the cause, which now constantly operates, so as to make the surface of the Mediterranean lower than that of the Atlantic, it must have kept it very much lower before a passage for the water through the straits was opened. It is probable before such an event took place the coasts and islands of the Mediterranean extended much further into that sea, and were then, for a great extent of country, destroyed by the floods occasioned by the new rise of water, and have since remained beneath the sea. Might not this give rise to the flood of Deucalion? See note Cassia, volume 2 of this work. End note. Then, where Nemea's howling forests wave, he drives the lion to his dusky cave. Seized by the throat the growling fiend disarms, and tears his gaping jaws with sinewy arms, lifts proud Antaeus from his mother plains, and with strong grasp the struggling giant strains. Back falls his fainting head and clammy hair, writhe his weak limbs and flits his life and air. By steps reverted o'er the blood-dropped fen, he tracks huge Caicus to his murdering den where breathing flames through brazen lips he fled, and shakes the rock-roofed cavern o'er his head. Last with wide arms the solid earth he tears, piles rock on rock on mountain mountain rears, heaves up huge Abila on Afric's sand, crowns with high Calpe Europe's salient strand, crests with opposing towers the splendid scene, and pours from urns immense the sea between. Loud o'er her whirling flood Charybdis roars, Affrighted Scylla bellows round his shores, Vesuvio groans through all his echoing caves, And Etna thunders o'er the insurgent waves. 7. 1. Nymphs, your fine hands ethereal floods amass From the warm cushion and the whirling glass, Beard the bright cylinder with golden wire, And circumfuse the gravitating fire. Cold from each point cerulean lustres gleam, Or shoot in air the scintillating stream. So, borne on brazen talons, Watched of old the sleepless dragon, O'er his fruits of gold. Bright beamed his scales, his eyeballs blazed with ire, And his wide nostrils breathed enchanted fire. Note. Ethereal floods amass, line 335. The theory of the accumulation of the electric fluid by means of the glass globe and cushion is difficult to comprehend. Dr. Franklin's idea of the pores of the glass being opened by the friction, and thence rendered capable of attracting more electric fluid, which it again parts with, as the pores contract again, seems analogous in some measure to the heat produced by the vibration or condensation of bodies, as when a nail is hammered or filed till it becomes hot as mentioned in additional notes number seven. Some philosophers have endeavored to account for this phenomenon by supposing the existence of two electric fluids, which may be called the vitreous and resinous ones, instead of the plus and minus of the same ether. But its accumulation on the rubbed glass bears great analogy to its accumulation on the surface of the laden bottle, and cannot perhaps be explained from any known mechanical or chemical principle. See note on Gymnotus, line 202 of this canto. End note. Note. Cold from each point, line 339. See additional note, number 13. End note. You bid gold leaves in crystal lanterns held, approach attracted and recede repelled, while paper nymphs instinct with motion rife and dancing fawns the admiring sage surprise. Or, if on wax some fearless beauty stand, and touch the sparkling rod with graceful hand, through her fine limbs the mimic lightnings dart, and flames innocuous eddy round her heart. 
o'er her fair brow the kindling lustres glare blue rays diverging from her bristling hair while some fond youth the kiss ethereal sips and soft fires issue from their meeting lips so round the virgin saint in silver streams the holy halo shoots its arrowy beams note you bid gold leaves line three hundred forty five alluding to the very sensible electrometer improved by mr bennett it consists of two slips of gold leaf suspended from a tin cap in a glass cylinder which has a partial coating without communicating with the wooden pedestal if a stick of sealing wax be rubbed for a moment on a dry cloth and then held in the air at the distance of two or three feet from the cap of this instrument the gold leaves separate such is its astonishing sensibility to electric influence see bennett on electricity johnson london the nerves of sense of animal bodies do not seem to be affected by less quantities of light or heat End note note the holy halo line three hundred fifty eight i believe it is not known with certainty at what time the painters first introduced the luminous circle round the head to import a saint or holy person. It has now become a part of the symbolic language of painting, and it is much to be wished that this kind of hieroglyphic character was more frequent in that art, as it is much wanted to render historic pictures both more intelligible and more sublime. And why should not painting as well as poetry express itself in metaphor or in indistinct allegory? A truly great modern painter lately endeavored to enlarge the sphere of pictorial language by putting a demon behind the pillow of a wicked man on his deathbed, which, unfortunately for the scientific part of painting, the cold criticism of the present day has depreciated, and thus barred perhaps the only road to the further improvement in this science. End note. You crowd in coated jars the denser fire, pierce the thin glass and fuse the blazing wire, or dart the red flash through the circling band of youths and timorous damsels hand in hand, starts the quick ether through the fibre trains of dancing arteries and of tingling veins, goads each fine nerve with new sensation thrilled, bends the reluctant limbs with power unwilled, palsies cold hands the fierce concussion own, and life clings trembling on her tottering throne. So from dark clouds the playful lightning springs, rives the firm oak, or prints the fairy rings. Note, with new sensation thrilled, line 365. There is probably a system of nerves in animal bodies for the purpose of perceiving heat, since the degree of this fluid is so necessary to health that we become presently injured either by its access or defect, and because almost every part of our bodies is supplied with branches from different pairs of nerves, which would not seem necessary for their motion alone. It is therefore probable that our sensation of electricity is only of its violence in passing through our system by its suddenly distending the muscles, like any other mechanical violence, and that it is general pain alone that we feel, and not any sensation analogous to the specific quality of the object. Nature may seem to have been niggardly to mankind in bestowing upon them so few senses, since a sense to have perceived electricity and another to have perceived magnetism might have been of great service to them many ages before these fluids were discovered by accidental experiment, but it is possible an increased number of senses might have incommoded us by adding to the size of our bodies. End note. Note. Palsy's cold hands, line 367. Paralytic limbs are in general only incapable of being stimulated into action by the power of the will. Since the pulse continues to beat and the fluids to be absorbed in them, and it commonly happens when paralytic people yawn and stretch themselves, which is not a voluntary motion, that the affected limb moves at the same time. The temporary motion of a paralytic limb is likewise caused by passing the electric shock through it, which would seem to indicate some analogy between the electric fluid and the nervous fluid, which is separated from the blood by the brain, and thence diffused along the nerves for the purposes of motion and sensation. 
it probably destroys life by its sudden expansion of the nerves or fibers of the brain, in the same manner as it fuses metals and splinters wood or stone, and removes the atmosphere when it passes from one object to another in a dense state. End note. Note. Prince the Fairy Rings, line 370. See additional note, number 13. End note. Nymphs, on that day ye shed from lucid eyes celestial tears and breathed ethereal sighs, when Richmond reared, by fearless haste betrayed, the wiry rod in Neva's fatal shade. Clouds o'er the sage with fringed skirts succeed, flash follows flash, the warning corks recede. Near and more near he eyed with fond amaze the silver streams and watched the sapphire blaze. Then burst the steel, the dart electric sped, and the bold sage lay numbered with the dead. Nymphs, on that day ye shed from lucid eyes celestial tears and breathed ethereal sighs. Note. When Richmond reared, line 373, Dr. Richmond, professor of natural philosophy at Petersburg, about the year 1763, elevated an insulated metallic rod to collect the aerial electricity, as Dr. Franklin had previously done at Philadelphia, and as he was observing the repulsion of the balls of his electrometer approached too near the conductor, and receiving the lightning in his head with a loud explosion was struck dead amidst his family. End note. You led your Franklin to your glazed retreats, your air-built castles and your silken seats, bade his bold arm invade the lowering sky, and seize the tiptoe lightnings ere they fly. O'er the young sage your mystic mantle spread, and wreathed the crown electric round his head. Thus when on wanton wing intrepid love snatched the raised lightning from the arm of Jove, quick o'er his knee the triple bolt he bent, the clustered darts and forky arrows rent, snapped with illumined hands each flaming shaft, his tingling fingers shook and stamped and laughed. Bright o'er the floor the scattered fragments blazed, and gods retreating trembled as they gazed. The immortal sire, indulgent to his child, bowed his ambrosial locks and heaven-relenting smiled. Note, you led your Franklin, line 383. Dr. Franklin was the first that discovered that lightning consisted of electric matter. He elevated a tall rod with a wire wrapped around it, and fixing the bottom of a rod into a glass bottle, and preserving it from falling by means of silk strings, he found it electrified whenever a cloud parted over it, receiving sparks by his finger from it, and charging coated files. This great discovery taught us to defend houses and ships and temples from lightning, and also to understand that people are always perfectly safe in a room during a thunderstorm if they keep themselves at three or four feet distance from the walls, for the matter of lightning in passing from the clouds to the earth, or from the earth to the clouds, runs through the walls of a house, the trunk of a tree, or other elevated object, except there be some moister body, as an animal in contact with them, or nearly so and in that case the lightning leaves the wall or tree and passes through the animal. But as it can pass through metal with still greater facility, it will leave animal bodies to pass through metallic ones. If a person in the open air be surprised by a thunderstorm, he will know his danger by observing on a second watch the time which passes between the flash and the crack, and reckoning a mile for every four seconds and a half, and a little more for sound travels at the rate of 1,142 feet in a second of time, and the velocity of light through such small distances is not to be estimated. In these circumstances, a person will be safer by lying down on the ground than erect, and still safer if within a few feet of his horse, which being then a more elevated animal will receive the shock in preference as the cloud passes over. See additional notes number 13. End note. Note, Intrepid Love, line 389. This allegory is uncommonly beautiful, representing divine justice as disarmed by divine love and relenting of his purpose. It is expressed on an agate in the great duke's collection at Florence. Spence. End note. 8. 
when air's pure essence joins the vital flood and with phosphoric acid dyes the blood your virgin trains the transient heat dispart and lead the soft combustion round the heart life's holy lamp with fire's successive feed from the crowned forehead to the prostrate weed from earth's proud realms to all that swim or sweep the yielding ether or tumultuous deep you swell the bulb beneath the heaving lawn brood the live seed unfold the bursting spawn nurse with soft lap and warm with fragrant breath the embryon panting in the arms of death youth's vivid eye with living light adorn and fire the rising blush of beauty's golden morn note transient heat dispart line 401 dr crawford in his ingenious work on animal heat has endeavored to prove that during the combination of the pure part of the atmosphere with the phlogistic part of the blood that much of the matter of the heat is given out from the air and that this is the great and perpetual source of the heat of animals to which we may add that the phosphoric acid is probably produced by this combination by which acid the color of the blood is changed in the lungs from a deep crimson to a bright scarlet there seems to be however another source of animal heat though of a similar nature and that is from the chemical combinations produced in all the glands since by whatever cause any glandular secretion is increased as by friction or topical inflammation the heat of that part becomes increased at the same time thus after the hands have been for a time immersed in snow on coming into a warm room they become red and hot without any increased pulmonary action besides this there would seem to be another material received from the air by respiration which is so necessary to life that the embryon must learn to breathe almost within a minute after its birth or it dies the perpetual necessity of breathing shows that the material thus acquired is perpetually consuming or escaping and on that account requires perpetual renovation perhaps the spirit of animation itself is thus acquired from the atmosphere which if it be supposed to be finer or more subtle than the electric matter could not long be retained in our bodies and must therefore require perpetual renovation end note end of section four Section 5 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 1, lines 413 through 600. Thus when the egg of night on chaos hurled, burst and disclosed the cradle of the world, first from the gaping shell refulgent sprung, immortal love his bow celestial strung o'er the wide waste his gaudy wings unfold beam his soft smiles and wave his curls of gold with silver darts he pierced the kindling frame and lit with torch divine the ever-living flame note thus when the egg of night line four hundred thirteen there were two cupids belonging to the ancient mythology one much elder than the other the elder Cupid, or Eros, or divine love, was the first that came out of the great egg of night, which floated in chaos, and was broken by the horns of the celestial bull, that is, was hatched by the warmth of the spring. He was winged and armed, and by his arrows and torch pierced and vivified all things, producing life and joy. Bacon, volume 5, page 197, quarto edition, London, 1778. Quote, at this time, says Aristophanes, sable-winged night produced an egg, from whence sprung up like a blossom Eros, the lovely, the desirable, with his glossy golden wings. End quote. Avibus, Bryant's Mythology, Volume 2, page 350, second edition. This interesting moment of this sublime allegory, Mrs. Cosway has chosen for her very beautiful painting, she has represented Eros, or divine love, with large wings, having the strength of the eagle's wings, and the splendor of the peacock's, with his hair floating in the form of flame, and with a halo of light vapor round his head, which illuminates the painting, 
where he is in the act of springing forwards and with his hands separating the elements. 9. The goddess paused, admired with conscious pride, the effulgent legions marshalled by her side, forms sphered in fire with trembling light arrayed, ends without weight and substance without shade, and, while tumultuous joy her bosom warms, waves her white hand and calls her host to arms. Unite, illustrious nymphs, your radiant powers call from their long repose the vernal hours. Wake with soft touch, with rosy hands unbind the struggling pinions of the western wind. Chafe his wan cheeks, his ruffled plumes repair, and wring the raindrops from his tangled hair. Blaze round each frosted rill or stagnant wave, and charm the naiad from her silent cave, where, shrined in ice, like Niobe she mourns, and clasp with hoary arms her empty urns. Call your bright myriads, trooping from afar, with beamy helms and glittering shafts of war. In phalanx firm the fiend of frost assail, break his white towers and pierce his crystal mail, to Zembla's moon-bright coasts the tyrant bear, and chain him howling to the northern bear. Note. Of the Western Wind, line 430. The principal frosts of this country are accompanied or produced by a northeastern wind, and the thaws by a southwestern wind, the reason of which is that the northeastern winds consist of regions of air brought from the north, which appear to acquire an easterly direction as they advance, and the southward winds consist of regions of air brought from the south, which appear to acquire a westerly direction as they advance. The surface of the earth nearer the pole moves slower than it does in our latitude, whence the regions of air brought from thence move slower, when they arrive hither, than the earth's surface with which they now become in contact, that is, they acquire an apparent easterly direction, as the earth moves from west to east faster than this new part of its atmosphere. The southwestern winds, on the contrary, consist of regions of air brought from the south, where the surface of the earth moves faster than in our latitude, and have therefore a westerly direction when they arrive hither by their moving faster than the surface of the earth, with which they are in contact, and in general the nearer to the west and the greater the velocity of these winds, the warmer they should be in respect to the season of the year, since they have been brought more expeditiously from the south than those winds which have less westerly direction, and have thence been less cooled in their passage. Sometimes I have observed the thaw to commence immediately on the change of the wind, even within an hour, if I am not mistaken, or sooner. At other times the southwestern wind has continued a day or even two before the thaw has commenced, during which time some of the frosty air which had gone southwards is driven back over us, and in consequence has taken a westerly direction, as well as a southern one. At other times I have observed a frost with a northeastern wind every morning, and a thaw with a southwestern wind every noon for several days together. See additional note 33. End note. Note. The Fiend of Frost, line 439. The principal injury done to vegetation by frost is from the expansion of the water contained in the vessels of plants. Water converted into ice occupies a greater space than it did before, as appears by the bursting of bottles filled with water at the time of their freezing. Hence frost destroys those plants of our island first, which are most succulent, and the most succulent part first of other plants, as their leaves and last year's shoots, the vessels of which are distended and burst by the expansion of their freezing fluids, while the drier or more resinous plants, as pines, yews, laurels, and other evergreens, are less liable to injury from cold. The trees in valleys are on this account more injured by the vernal frosts than those on eminences, because their early succulent shoots come out sooner. Hence fruit trees covered by a six-inch coping of a wall are less injured by the vernal frosts because they're being shielded from showers and the descending night dews has prevented them from being moist at the time of their being frozen, which circumstance has given occasion to a vulgar error amongst gardeners 
who suppose frost to descend. As the common heat of the earth in this climate is forty-eight degrees, those tender trees which will bear bending down are easily secured from the frost by spreading them upon the ground and covering them with straw or fern. This particularly suits fig trees as they easily bear bending to the ground and are furnished with an acrid juice which secures them from the depredations of insects but are nevertheless liable to be eaten by mice. See additional notes number 12. End note. So when enormous Grampus, issuing forth from the pale regions of the icy north, waves his broad tail and opes his ribbed mouth and seeks on winnowing fin the breezy south, from towns deserted rush the breathless hosts, swarm round the hills and darken all the coasts. Boats follow boats along the shouting tides, and spears and javelins pierce his blubbery sides. Now the bold sailor, raised on pointed toe, whirls the winged harpoon on the slimy foe. Quick sinks the monster in his oozy bed, the blood-stain surges circling o'er his head, steers to the frozen pole his wanted track, and bears the iron tempest on his back. 10. On wings of flame, ethereal virgins, sweep o'er the earth's fair bosom and complacent deep where dwell my vegetative realms benumbed, in buds imprisoned or in bulbs entombed, pervade pellucid forms their cold retreat, ray from bright urns your viewless floods of heat, from earth's deep wastes electric torrents pour, or shed from heaven the scintillating shower. Pierce the dull root, relax its fibre trains, thaw the thick blood which lingers in its veins, Melt with warm breath the fragrant gums that bind the expanding foliage in its scaly rind, and as in air the laughing leaflets play and turn their shining bosoms to the ray, nymphs with sweet smile each opening glower invite, and on its damask eyelids pour the light. Note, in Buds Imprisoned, line 460, the buds and bulbs of plants constitute what is termed by Linnaeus the hibernaculum, or winter cradle, of the embryon vegetable. The buds arise from the bark on the branches of trees, and the bulbs from the caudex of bulbous-rooted plants, or the part from which the fibers of the root are produced. They are defended from too much moisture, and from frosts, and from the depredations of insects by various contrivances, as by scales, hairs, resinous varnishes, and by acrid rinds. The buds of trees are of two kinds, either flower buds or leaf buds. The former of these produce their seeds and die. The latter produce other leaf buds or flower buds and die. So that all the buds of trees may be considered as annual plants, having their embryon produced during the preceding summer. The same seems to happen with respect to bulbs. Thus, a tulip produces annually one flower-bearing bulb, sometimes two and several leaf-bearing bulbs, and then the old root perishes. Next year the flower-bearing bulb produces seeds and other bulbs, and perishes, while the leaf-bearing bulb, producing other bulbs only, perishes likewise. These circumstances establish a strict analogy between bulbs and buds. See additional notes number 14. End note. Note. Viewless floods of heat. Line 462. The fluid matter of heat, or caloric, in which all bodies are immersed, is as necessary to vegetable as to animal existence. It is not yet determinable whether heat and light be different materials or modifications of the same materials, as they have some properties in common. They appear to be both of them equally necessary to vegetable health, since without light green vegetables become first yellow, that is, they lose the blue color, which contributed to produce the green, and afterwards they also lose the yellow, and become white, as it is seen in celery blanched or etiolated for the table by excluding the light from it. The upper surface of leaves, which I suppose to be their green organ of respiration, seems to require light as well as air, 
since plants which grow in windows on the inside of houses are equally solicitous to turn the upper side of their leaves to the light. Vegetables at the same time exude or perspire a great quantity from their leaves, as animals do from their lungs. This perspirable matter, as it rises from their fine vessels, perhaps much finer than the pores of animal skins, is divided into inconceivable tenuity, and when acted upon by the sun's light appears to be decomposed, the hydrogen becomes a part of the vegetable, composing oils or resins, and the oxygen combined with light or caloric ascends, producing the pure part of the atmosphere or vital air. Hence, during the light of the day, vegetables give up more pure air than their respiration injures, but not so in the night, even though equally exposed to warmth. This single fact would seem to show that light is essentially different from heat, and it is perhaps by its combination with bodies that their combined or latent heat is set at liberty and becomes sensible. See additional note 34. End note. Note. Electric torrents pour, line 463. The influence of electricity in forwarding the germination of plants and their growth seems to be pretty well established, though Mr. Ingenhaus did not succeed in his experiments, and thence doubts the success of those of others. And though M. Roulin, from his new experiments, believes that neither positive nor negative electricity increases vegetation, both which philosophers had previously been supporters of the contrary doctrine, for many other naturalists have since repeated their experiments relative to this object, and their new results have confirmed their former ones. Mr. de Ornoy and the two Rosiers have found the same success in numerous experiments which they have made in the last two years, and Mr. Carmoy has shown in a convincing manner that electricity accelerates germination. Mr. de Ormoy not only found various seeds to vegetate sooner and to grow taller which were put upon his insulated table and supplied with electricity, but also that silkworms began to spin much sooner which were kept electrified than those of the same hatch which were kept in the same place and manner, except that they were not electrified. These experiments of Mr. de Ormoy are detailed at length in the Journal de Physique of Rosier, Tom 35, page 270. Monsieur Bartholon, who had before written a tract on this subject and proposed ingenious methods for applying electricity to agriculture and gardening, has also repeated a numerous set of experiments, and shows both that natural electricity as well as the artificial increases the growth of plants and the germination of seeds, and opposes Mr. Ingenhaus by very numerous and conclusive facts. Ibid. Toma 35, page 401. Since by the late discoveries or opinions of the chemists there is reason to believe that water is decomposed in the vessels of vegetables, and that the hydrogen or inflammable air of which it in part consists contributes to the nourishment of the plant and to the production of its oils, rosins, gums, sugar, etc., and lastly, as electricity decomposes water into these two airs, termed oxygen and hydrogen, there is a powerful analogy to induce us to believe that it accelerates or contributes to the growth of vegetation, and, like heat, may possibly enter into combination with many bodies or form the basis of some yet unanalyzed acid. End note. So shall my pines, Canadian wilds that shade, where no bold step has pierced the tangled glade, high towering palms that part the southern flood with shadowy aisles and continents of wood, oaks whose broad antlers crest Britannia's plain, or bear her thunders o'er the conquered main, shout as you pass, inhale the genial skies, and bask and brighten in your beamy eyes, bow their white heads, admire the changing clime, shake from their candied trunks the tinkling rhyme with bursting buds their wrinkled barks adorn and wed the timorous floret to her thorn deep strike their roots their lengthening tops revive and all my world of foliage wave alive thus with hermetic art the adept combines the royal acid with cobaltic mines marks with quick pen in lines unseen portrayed the blushing mead, green dell, and dusky glade, 
shades with pellucid clouds the tintless field, and all the future group exists concealed. Till waked by fire the dawning tablet glows, green springs the herb, the purple floret blows, hills, vales, and woods in bright succession rise, and all the living landscape charms his eyes. Note, thus with hermetic art, line 487. The sympathetic inks made by Zafre, dissolved in the marine and nitrous acids, have this curious property, that being brought to the fire, one of them becomes green, and the other red. But what is more wonderful, they again lose their colors, unless the heat has been too great, on their being again withdrawn from the fire. Fire screens have been thus painted, which in the cold have shown only the trunk and branches of a dead tree and sandy hills, which on their approach to the fire have put forth green leaves and red flowers and grass upon the mountains. The process of making these inks is very easy. Take zaffre as sold by the druggists, and digest it in aqua regia, and the calx of cobalt will be dissolved, which solution must be diluted with a little common water to prevent it from making too strong an impression on the paper. The color, when the paper is heated, becomes a fine green-blue. If zaffre or regulus of cobalt be dissolved in the same manner in spirit of nitre or aqua fortis, a reddish color is produced on exposing the paper to heat. Chemical Dictionary by Mr. Kerr, Article Ink Sympathetic. End note. 11. With crest of gold should sultry Sirius glare, and with his kindling tresses scorch the air, with points of flame the shafts of summer arm, and burn the beauties he designs to warm. So erst, when Jove his oath extorted mourned, and clad in glory to the fair returned, while loves at forky bolts their torches light, and resting lightnings gild the car of night, his blazing from the dazzled maid admired, met with fond lips, and in his arms expired. Nymphs, on light pinion lead your bannered hosts high o'er the cliffs of Orkney's gulfy coasts, leave on your left the red volcanic light, which Hecla lifts amid the dusky night. Mark on the right the Dofrin's snow-capped brow, where whirling maelstrom roars and foams below. Watch with unmoving eye, where Cepheus bends, his triple crown, his sceptred hand extends, where studs Cassiope with stars unknown her golden chair and gems her sapphire zone wherewith vast convolution Draco holds the ecliptic axis in his scaly folds, or half the sky his neck enormous rears, and with immense meanders parts the bears. Onward the kindred bears with footstep rude dance round the pole, pursuing and pursued. Note. With stars unknown, line 515, alluding to the star which appeared in the chair of Cassiopeia in the year 1572, which at first surpassed Jupiter in magnitude and brightness, diminished by degrees, and disappeared in eighteen months. It alarmed the astronomers of the age, and was esteemed a comet by some. Could this have been the Georgium Sidus? End note. There in her azure quaff and starry stole, Grey twilight sits and rules the slumbering pole, Bends the pale moonbeams round the sparkling coast, And strews with livid hands eternal frost. There, nymphs, alight, array your dazzling powers, With sudden march alarm the torpid hours, On ice-built isles expand a thousand sails, Hinge the strong helms and catch the frozen gales, the winged rocks to feverish climates guide, where fainting zephyrs pant upon the tide. Pass, where to Ciuta Calpe's thunder roars, and answering echoes shake the kindred shores. Pass, where with palmy plumes canary smiles, and in her silver girdle binds her isles. Onward, where Niger's dusky naiad laves a thousand kingdoms with prolific waves, or leads o'er golden sands her threefold train in steamy channels to the fervid main, while swarthy nations crowd the sultry coast, drink the fresh breeze and hail the floating frost. 
nymphs, veiled in mist the melting treasures steer, and cool with arctic snows the tropic year. So from the burning line by monsoons driven, clouds sail in squadrons o'er the darkened heaven, wide wastes of sand the gelid gales pervade, and ocean cools beneath the moving shade. Note. On ice-built isles, line 529, there are many reasons to believe from the accounts of travelers and navigators that the islands of ice in the higher northern latitudes, as well as the glaciers on the Alps, continue perpetually to increase in bulk. At certain times in the ice mountains of Switzerland there happen cracks which have shown the great thickness of the ice, as some of these cracks have measured three or four hundred ells deep. The great islands of ice in the northern seas near Hudson's Bay have been observed to have been immersed above one hundred fathoms beneath the surface of the sea, and to have risen a fifth or sixth part above the surface, and to have measured between three and four miles in circumference. Philosophical Transactions number 465, section 2. Dr. Lister endeavored to show that the ice of seawater contains some salt and perhaps less air than common ice and that it is therefore much more difficult of solution, whence he accounts for the perpetual and great increase of these floating islands of ice. Philosophical Transactions, number 169. As by a famous experiment of Mr. Boyle's, it appears that ice evaporates very fast in severe frosty weather when the wind blows upon it, and as ice in a thawing state is known to contain six times more cold than water at the same degree of sensible coldness, it is easy to understand that winds blowing over islands and continents of ice, perhaps much below nothing on Fahrenheit's scale, and coming from thence into our latitude must bring great degrees of cold along with them. If we add to this the quantity of cold produced by the evaporation of the water as well as by the solution of the ice, we cannot doubt but that the northern ice is the principal source of the coldness of our winters, and that it is brought hither by the regions of air blowing from the north, which take an apparent easterly direction by their coming to a part of the surface of the earth, which moves faster than the latitude they come from. Hence the increase of the ice in the polar regions by increasing the cold of our climate adds at the same time to the bulk of the glaciers of Italy and Switzerland. If the nations who inhabit this hemisphere of the globe, instead of destroying their seamen and exhausting their wealth in unnecessary wars, could be induced to unite their labors to navigate these immense masses of ice into the more southern oceans, two great advantages would result to mankind. The tropic countries would be much cooled by their solution, and our winters in this latitude would be rendered much milder, for perhaps a century or two, till the masses of ice became again enormous. Mr. Bradley describes the cold winds and wet weather which sometimes happen in May and June to the solution of ice islands accidentally floating from the north. Treatise on Husbandry and Gardening, Volume 2, page 437. And adds that Mr. Barham, about the year 1718, in his voyage from Jamaica to England in the beginning of June, met with ice islands coming from the north, which were surrounded with so great a fog the ship was in danger of striking upon them, and that one of them measured fifty miles in length. We have lately experienced an instance of ice islands brought from the southern polar regions, on which the Guardian struck at the beginning of her passage from the Cape of Good Hope towards Botany Bay on December twenty-second, 1789. These islands were involved in mist, were about one hundred and fifty fathoms long, and about fifty fathoms above the surface of the water. A part from the top of one of them broke off and fell into the sea, causing an extraordinary commotion in the water and a thick smoke all round it. End note. Note. Threefold Train, line 539. The river Niger, after traversing an immense tract of populous country, is supposed to divide itself into three other great rivers, the Rio Grande, the Gambia, and the Senegal. Gold dust is obtained from the sands of these rivers. End note. Note. Wide Wastes of Sand, line 547. When the sun is in the southern tropic, 36 degrees distant from the zenith, the thermometer is seldom lower than 72 degrees at Gondar in Abyssinia, but it falls to 60 or 53 degrees when the sun is immediately vertical, 
So much does the approach of rain counteract the heat of the sun. Bruce's Travels, Volume 3, page 670. End note. 12. Should solstice, stalking through the sickening bowers, suck the warm dewdrop, lap the falling showers, kneel with parched lip, and bending from its brink, from dripping palm the scanty river drink, nymphs, o'er the soil ten thousand points erect, and high in air the electric flame collect, soon shall dark mists with self-attraction shroud the blazing day, and sail in wilds of cloud. Each silvery flower the stream's aerial quaff, bow her sweet head, and infant harvest laugh. Note, 10,000 points erect, line 553. The solution of water in air, or in caloric, seems to acquire electric matter at the same time, as appears from an experiment of Mr. Bennett. He put some live coals into an insulated funnel of metal, and throwing them on a little water, observed that the ascending steam was electrized plus, and the water which descended through the funnel was electrized minus. Hence it appears that though clouds by their change of form may sometimes become electrized minus, yet they have in general an accumulation of electricity. This accumulation of electric matter also evidently contributes to support the atmospheric vapor when it is condensed into the form of clouds, because it is seen to descend rapidly after the flashes of lightning have diminished its quantity, whence there is reason to conclude that very numerous metallic rods with fine points erected high in the air might induce it at any time to part with some of its water. If we may trust the theory of Mr. Lavoisier concerning the composition and decomposition of water, there would seem another source of thunder showers, and that is that the two gases termed oxygen gas or vital air and hydrogen gas or inflammable air may exist in the summer atmosphere in a state of mixture but not of combination, and that the electric spark or flash of lightning may combine them and produce water instantaneously. End note. Thus when Elijah marked from Carmel's brow in bright expanse the briny flood below, rolled his red eyes amid the scorching air, smote his firm breast and breathed his ardent prayer. High in the midst a massy altar stood, and slaughtered offerings pressed the piles of wood, while Israel's chiefs the sacred hill surround, and famished armies crowd the dusty ground, while proud idolatry was leagued with dearth, and withered famine swept the desert earth. O mighty Lord, thy woe-worn servant here, who calls thy name in agony of prayer, thy fanes dishonored and thy prophets slain, lo, I alone survive of all thy train. O send from heaven thy sacred fire, and pour o'er the parched land the salutary shower. So shall thy priest thy erring flock recall, and speak in thunder, Thou art Lord of all, he cried, and kneeling on the mountain sands, stretched high in air his supplicating hands. Descending flames the dusky shrine illume, fire the wet wood the sacred bull consume. Winged from the sea the gathering mists arise, and floating waters darken all the skies. The king with shifted reins his chariot bends, and wide o'er earth the airy flood descends. With mingling cries dispersing hosts applaud, And shouting nations own the living God. The goddess ceased, the exulting tribes obey, Start from the soil and win their airy way. The vaulted skies with streams of transient rays Shine as they pass, and earth and ocean blaze. So from fierce wars when lawless monarchs cease, Of liberty returns with laurelled peace, Bright fly the sparks, the colored lusters burn, Flash follows flash, and flame-ringed circles turn, Blue serpents sweep along the dusky air, Imped by long trains of scintillating hair, Red rockets rise, loud cracks are heard on high, And showers of stars rush headlong from the sky, Burst as in silver lines they hiss along, And the quick flash unfolds the gazing throng. End of section 5.
Section 6 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 2, Lines 1 through 124. And now the goddess with attention sweet turns to the gnomes that circle round her feet. Orb with an orb approach the marshaled trains, and pygmy legions darken all the plains. Thrice shout with silver tones the applauding bands, bow ere she speaks, and clap their fairy hands. So the tall grass, when noontide zephyr blows, bends its green blades in undulating rows. Wide o'er the fields the billowy tumult spreads, and rustling harvests bow their golden heads. 1. Gnomes, your bright forms, presiding at her birth, clung in fond squadrons round the newborn earth, when high in ether, with explosion dire, from the deep craters of his realms of fire, the whirling sun this ponderous planet hurled, and gave the astonished void another world, when from its vaporous air, condensed by cold, descending torrents into oceans rolled, and fierce attraction with relentless force bent the reluctant wanderer to its course. Note. From the Deep Craters, line 14. The existence of solar volcanoes is countenanced by their analogy to terrestrial and lunar volcanoes, and by the spots on the sun's disk, which have been shown by Dr. Wilson to be excavations through its luminous surface, and may be supposed to be the cavities from whence the planets and comets were ejected by explosions. See additional notes, number 15, on solar volcanoes. End note. Note. When from its vaporous air, line 17. If the nucleus of the earth was thrown out from the sun by an explosion along with as large a quantity of surrounding hot vapor as its attraction would occasion to accompany it, the ponderous semi-fluid nucleus would take a spherical form from the attraction of its own parts, which would become an oblate spheroid from its diurnal revolution. As the vapor cooled, the water would be precipitated, and an ocean would surround the spherical nucleus with a superincumbent atmosphere. The nucleus of solar lava would likewise become harder as it became cooler. To understand how the strata of the earth were afterwards formed from the sediments of this circumfluent ocean, the reader is referred to an ingenious treatise on the theory of the earth by Mr. Whitehurst, who was many years a watchmaker and engineer at Derby, but whose ingenuity, integrity, and humanity were rarely equaled in any station of life. End note. Where yet the bull with diamond eye adorns the spring's fair forehead and with golden horns, where yet the lion climbs the ethereal plain and shakes the summer from his radiant mane, where Libra lifts her airy arm and weighs, poised in her silver balance, night and days, with paler lustres where Aquarius burns and showers the still snow from his hoary urns, your ardent troops pursued the flying sphere, circling the starry girdle of the year, while sweet vicissitudes of day and clime marked the new annals of a nascent time. 2. You trod with printless step earth's tender globe, while ocean wrapped it in his azure robe. Beneath his waves her hardening strata spread, raised her primeval islands from his bed stretched her wide lawns and sunk her winding dells and decked her shores with corals pearls and shells note while ocean wrapped line thirty four see additional notes number sixteen on the production of calcareous earth end note note her hardening strata spread line thirty five the granite or moorstone or porphyry constitute the oldest part of the globe since the limestone shells Coralloids and other sea productions rest upon them, and upon these sea productions are found clay, iron, coal, salt, and siliceous sand or grit stone. Thus there seem to be three divisions of the globe distinctly marked, the first, I suppose, to have been the original nucleus of the earth, or lava projected from the sun. 2. Over this lie the recrements of animal and vegetable matter produced in the ocean, and 3. Over these the recrements of animal and vegetable matter produced upon the land. 
Beside these, there are bodies which owe their origin to a combination of those already mentioned, as siliceous sand, flour, alabaster, which seem to have derived their acids originally from the vegetable kingdom, and their earthly bases from sea productions. See additional notes, number 16 on calcareous earth. End note. Note. Raised her primeval islands, line 36, the nucleus of the earth, still covered with water, received perpetual increase by the immense quantities of shells and coralloids either annually produced and relinquished or left after the death of the animals. These would gradually, by their different degrees of cohesion, be some of them more and others less removable by the influence of solar tides and gentle tropical breezes, which then must have probably extended from one pole to the other, for it is supposed the moon was not yet produced, and that no storms or unequal winds had yet existence. Hence, then, the primeval islands had their gradual origin, were raised but a few feet above the level of the sea, and were not exposed to the great or sudden variations of heat and cold, as is so well explained in Mr. Whitehurst's Theory of the Earth, Chapter 16, whence the paradise of the sacred writers and the golden age of the profane ones seems to have had a real existence as there can be no rainbow when the heavens are covered with clouds, because the sunbeams are then precluded from falling upon the raindrops opposite to the eye of the spectator, the rainbow is a mark of gentle or partial showers. Mr. Whitehurst has endeavored to show that the primitive islands were only moistened by nocturnal dews and not by showers, as occurs at this day to the delta of Egypt and is hence of opinion that the rainbow had no existence till after the production of mountains and continents, as the salt of the sea has been gradually accumulating, being washed down into it from the recrements of animal and vegetable bodies, the sea must originally have been as fresh as river water, and as it is not yet saturated with salt, must become annually more saline. See note on line 119 of this canto. End note. O'er those blessed isles no ice-crowned mountains towered, no lightnings darted, and no tempests lowered. Soft fell the vesper drops, condensed below, or bent in air the rain-refracted bow. Sweet breathed the zephyrs, just perceived and lost, and brineless billows only kissed the coast. Round the bright zodiac danced the vernal hours, and peace the cherub dwelt in mortal bowers. So young Dione, nursed beneath the waves, and rocked by Nereids in their coral caves, charmed the blue sisterhood with playful wiles, lisped her sweet tones, and tried her tender smiles. Then on her beryl throne by Tritons born, bright rose the goddess like the star of morn, when with soft fires the milky dawn he leads, and wakes to life and love the laughing meads. With rosy fingers, as uncurled they hung, Round her fair brow her golden locks she wrung, O'er the smooth surge on silver sandals flood, And looked enchantment on the dazzled flood. The bright drops, rolling from her lifted arms, And slow meanders wander o'er her charms, Seek round her snowy neck their lucid track, Pearl her white shoulders, gem her ivory back, Round her fine waist and swelling bosom swim, And star with glittering brine each crystal limb. The immortal form enamoured nature hailed, And beauty blazed to heaven and earth unveiled. Note, so young Dione, line 47. There is an ancient gem representing Venus rising out of the ocean supported by two tritons, from the formality of the design, it would appear to be of great antiquity before the introduction of fine taste into the world. It is probable that this beautiful allegory was originally an hieroglyphic picture before the invention of letters, descriptive of the formation of the earth from the ocean, which seems to have been an opinion of many of the most ancient philosophers. End note. 3. You, who then, kindling after many an age, saw with new fires the first volcano rage, or smouldering heaps of livid sulphur swell at earth's firm center, and distend her shell, saw at each opening cleft the furnace glow, and seas rush headlong on the gulfs below. Gnomes, how you shrieked, 
when through the troubled air roared the fierce din of elemental war, when rose the continents and sunk the main, and earth's huge sphere exploding burst in twain. Gnomes, how you gazed, when from her wounded side, where now the south sea heaves its waste of tide, rose on swift wheels the moon's refulgent car, circling the solar orb, a sister star, dimpled with veils with shining hills embossed and rolled round earth her airless realms of frost note the first volcano line sixty eight as the earth before the existence of earthquakes was nearly level and the greatest part of it covered with sea when the first great fires began deep in the internal parts of it those parts would become much expanded this expansion would be gradually extended as the heat increased through the whole terraqueous globe of seven thousand miles diameter. The crust would thence in many places open into fissures, which, by admitting the sea to flow in upon the fire, would produce not only a quantity of steam beyond calculation by its expansion, but would also by its decomposition produce inflammable air and vital air in quantities beyond conception, sufficient to effect those violent explosions the vestiges of which all over the world excite our admiration and our study the difficulty of understanding how subterraneous fires could exist without the presence of air has disappeared since dr priestley's discoveries of such great quantities of pure air which constitute all the acids and consequently exist in all saline bodies as sea salt nitre limestone and in all calciform ores, as manganese, calamy, ochre, and other mineral substances. See an ingenious treatise by Mr. Michel on earthquakes in the philosophical transactions. In these first tremendous ignitions of the globe, as the continents were heaved up, the valleys, which now hold the sea, were formed by the earth subsiding into the cavities made by the rising mountains, as the steam which raised them condensed which would thence not have any caverns of great extent remain beneath them, as some philosophers have imagined. The earthquakes of modern days are of very small extent indeed compared to those of ancient times, and are ingeniously compared by M. de Luc to the operations of a molehill, where from a small cavity are raised from time to time small quantities of lava or pumice stone. Monthly Review, June 1790. End note. Note. The Moon's Refulgent Car, line 79. See additional notes, number 15, on solar volcanoes. End note. Note. Her airless realms of frost, line 82. If the Moon had no atmosphere at the time of its elevation from the Earth, or if its atmosphere was afterwards stolen from it by the Earth's attraction, the water on the Moon would rise quickly into vapor, and the cold produced by a certain quantity of this evaporation would congeal the remainder of it. Hence it is not probable that the moon is at present inhabited, but as it seems to have suffered, and to continue to suffer, much by volcanoes, a sufficient quantity of air may in process of time be generated to produce an atmosphere, which may prevent its heat from so easily escaping, and its water from so easily evaporating, and thence become fit for the production of vegetables and animals." That the moon possesses little or no atmosphere is deduced from the undiminished luster of the stars at the instant when they emerge from behind her disk. That the ocean of the moon is frozen is confirmed from there being no appearance of lunar tides, which, if they existed, would cover the part of her disk nearest the earth. See note on Canto 3, line 61. End note. Gnomes, how you trembled! with a dreadful force, when earth recoiling staggered from her course, when, as her line in slower circles spun, and her shocked axis nodded from the sun, with dreadful march the accumulated main swept her vast wrecks of mountain, vale, and plain, and, while new tides their shouting floods unite, and hail their queen, fair regent of the night, Chained to one center world the kindred spheres, and marked with lunar cycles solar years. Note, when earth recoiling, line 84, on supposition that the moon was thrown from the earth by the explosion of water or the generation of other vapors of greater power, the remaining part of the globe would recede from its orbit in one direction as the moon receded in another, and that in proportion to the respective momentum of each, 
and would afterwards revolve round their common centre of gravity. If the moon rose from any part of the earth except exactly at the line or poles, the shock would tend to turn the axis of the earth out of its previous direction, and as a mass of matter rising from deep parts of the globe would have previously acquired less diurnal velocity than the earth's surface from whence it rose, it would receive during the time of its rising additional velocity from the earth's surface, and would consequently so much retard the motion of the earth round its axis. When the earth thus receded, the shock would overturn all its buildings and forests, and the water would rush with inconceivable violence over its surface towards the new satellite, from two causes, both by its not at first acquiring the velocity with which the earth receded, and by the attraction of the new moon, as it leaves the earth. On these accounts, at first, there would be but one tide till the moon receded to a greater distance, and the earth moving round a common centre of gravity between them, the water on the side furthest from the moon would acquire a centrifugal force, in respect to its common centre between itself and the moon. End note. 4. Gnomes. You then bade dissolving shells distill from the loose summits of each shattered hill, to each fine pore and dark interstice flow, and fill with liquid chalk the mass below, whence sparry forms in dusky caverns gleam with borrowed light and twice refract the beam, while in white beds congealing rocks beneath court the nice chisel and desire to breathe. Footnote. Dissolving shells distill, line 93. The limestone rocks have had their origin from shells formed beneath the seas, the softer strata gradually dissolving and filling up the interstices of the harder ones. Afterwards, when these accumulations of shells were elevated above the waters, the upper strata became dissolved by the actions of the air and dews and filled up the interstices beneath, producing solid rocks of different kinds, from the coarse limestones to the finest marbles. When those limestones have been in such a situation they could form perfect crystals, they are called spars, some of which possess a double refraction, as observed by Sir Isaac Newton. When these crystals are jumbled together or mixed with some colouring impurities, it is called marble, if its texture be equable and firm. If its texture be coarse and porous yet hard, it is called limestone. If its texture be very loose and porous, it is termed chalk. In some rocks, the shells remain almost unchanged and only covered, or bedded with limestone, which seems to have been dissolved and sunk down amongst them. In others, the softer shells and bones are dissolved, and only shark's teeth or harder echini have preserved their form enveloped in the chalk or limestone. In some marbles, the solution has been complete, and no vestiges of shell appear, as in the white kind called statuary by the workman. See additional notes number 16. End note. Hence wearied Hercules in marble rears his languid limbs and rests a thousand years. Still, as he leans, shall young Antonius please with careless grace and unaffected ease. Onward with loftier step Apollo spring, and launch the unerring arrow from the string. In beauty's bashful form, the veil unfurled, ideal Venus win the gazing world. Hence on Rubilac's tomb shall fame sublime wave her triumphant wings and conquer time. Long with soft touch shall Dummer's chisel charm, with grace delight us and with beauty warm. Foster's fine form shall hearts unborn engage, and Melbourne's smile enchant another age. Note. Hence wearied Hercules, line 101, alluding to the celebrated Hercules of Glyco resting after his labors, and to the easy attitude of Antonius, the lofty step of the Apollo of Belvedere, and the retreating modesty of the Venus de Medici. Many of the designs by Rubilac in Westminster Abbey are uncommonly poetical, an allegory of time and fame contending for the trophy of General Wade, which is here alluded to, is beautifully told. The wings of fame are still expanded, and her hair still floating in the air, which not only shows that she has that moment arrived, but also that her force is not yet expended at the same time that the old figure of time with his disordered wings is rather leaning backwards and yielding to her impulse, 
and must apparently in another instant be driven from his attack upon the trophy. End note. Note. Foster's fine form, line 113, alluding to the beautiful statues of Lady Elizabeth Foster and of Lady Melbourne executed by the ingenious Mrs. Dahmer. End note. 5. Gnomes, you then taught transuding dews to pass through time's fallen woods and root in wove morass, age after age, and with filtration fine dispart from earths and sulphurs the saline. Note, root and wove morass, line 116. The great mass of matter which rests upon the limestone strata of the earth, or upon the granite where the limestone stratum has been removed by earthquake or covered by lava, has had its origin from the recrements of vegetables and of air-breathing animals, as the limestone had its origin from sea animals. The whole habitable world was originally covered with woods, till mankind formed themselves into societies, and subdued them by fire and by steel. Hence woods in uncultivated countries have grown and fallen through many ages, whence morasses of immense extent, and from these, as the more soluble parts were washed away first, were produced sea salt, nitre, iron, and variety of acids, which combining with calcareous matter were productive of many fossil bodies, as flint, sea sand, selenite, with the precious stones, and perhaps the diamond. See additional notes, number 17. End note. 1. Hence with diffusive salt, old ocean steeps his emerald shallows and his sapphire deeps. Oft in wide lakes, around their warmer brim, in hollow pyramids the crystals swim, or, fused by earth-born fires, in cubic blocks shoot their white forms, and harden into rocks. Note. Hence with diffusive salt, line 119. Salts of various kinds are produced from the recurrence of animal and vegetable bodies, such as phosphoric, ammoniacal, marine salt, and others. These are washed from the earth by rains, and carried down our rivers into the sea. They seem all here to decompose each other except the marine salt, which has therefore from the beginning of the habitable world been perpetually accumulating. There is a town in the immense salt mines of Krakow in Poland, with a marketplace, a river, a church, and a famous statue, here supposed to be of Lot's wife, by the moist or dry appearance of which the subterranean inhabitants are said to know when the weather is fair above ground. The galleries in these mines are so numerous and so intricate that workmen have frequently lost their way, their lights having been burnt out, and have perished before they could be found. Essays, etc., par Monsieur Macquart. And though the arches of these different stories of galleries are boldly executed, yet they are not dangerous, as they are held together or supported by large masses of timber of a foot square, and these vast timbers remain perfectly sound for many centuries, while all other pillars, whether of brick, cement, or salt, soon dissolve or moulder away. Ibid. Could the timbers over watermill wheels or cellars be thus preserved by occasionally soaking them with brine? These immense masses of rock salt seem to have been produced by the evaporation of sea water in the early periods of the world by subterranean fires. Dr. Hutton's Theory of the Earth. See also Theory des Sources Salées par... Mr. Struve, History des Sciences de Lucerne, Toma 2. This idea of Dr. Hutton's is confirmed by a fact mentioned in Monsieur Macquart's Essay sur Mineralogie, who found a great quantity of fossil shells, principally bivalves and madrepores, in the salt mines of Wyalixka in Krakow. During the evaporation of the lakes of salt water, as in artificial salt works, the salt begins to crystallize near the edges where the water is shallowest, forming hollow inverted pyramids, which, when they become of a certain size, subside by their gravity. If urged by a stronger fire, the salt fuses or forms large cubes, whence the salt shaped in hollow pyramids, called flake salt, is better tasted and preserves flesh better than the basket or powder salt, because it is made by less heat and thence contains more of the marine acid. The seawater about our island contains from about one twenty-eighth to one thirtieth part of sea salt, and about one eightieth of magnesium salt. See Brown Rig on Salt, 
See note on Osimum, Volume 2 of this work. End note. End of section 6. Section 7 of The Botanic Garden, a poem in two parts. Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 2, lines 125 through 276. Thus, caverned round in Krakow's mighty mines, with crystal walls a gorgeous city shines. Scooped in the briny rock, long streets extend their hoary course, and glittering domes ascend. Down the bright steeps, emerging into day, impetuous fountains burst their headlong way. O'er milk-white veils and ivory channels spread, and wandering seek their subterraneous bed. Formed in pellucid salt with chisel nice, the pale lamp glimmering through the sculptured ice, with wild reverted eyes fair Lotta stands, and spreads to heaven in vain her glassy hands. Cold dews condense upon her pearly breast, and the big tear rolls lucid down her vest. Far gleaming o'er the town, transparent fanes rear their white towers and wave their golden veins. Long lines of lustres pour their trembling rays, and the bright vault returns the mingled blaze. 2. Hence Orient Nitre owns its sparkling birth, and with prismatic crystals gems the earth. O'er tottering domes and filmy foliage crawls, or frosts with branching plumes the mouldering walls, as woos exotic gas the virgin air, and veils in crimson clouds the yielding fair. Indignant fire the treacherous courtship flies, waves his light wing, and mingles with the skies. Note, hence Orient Nitre, line 143. Nitre is found in Bengal, naturally crystallized, and is swept by brooms from earths and stones, and thence called sweepings of nitre. It has lately been found in large quantities in a natural basin of calcareous earth at Molfetta in Italy, both in thin strata between the calcareous beds and in efflorescences of various beautiful leafy and hairy forms. An account of this nitre bed is given by Mr. Zimmerman and abridged in Rosier's Journal de Physique, Février, 1790. This acid appears to be produced in all situations where animal and vegetable matters are completely decomposed and which are exposed to the action of the air as on the walls of stables and slaughterhouses. The crystals are prisms furrowed by longitudinal grooves. Dr. Priestley discovered that nitrous air or gas, which he obtained by dissolving metals in nitrous acid, would combine rapidly with vital air and produce with it a true nitrous acid, forming red clouds during the combination. The two airs occupy only the space before occupied by one of them, and at the same time heat is given out from the new combination. This diminution of the bulk of a mixture of nitrous gas and vital air, Dr. Priestley ingeniously used as a test of the purity of the latter, a discovery of the greatest importance in the analysis of airs. Mr. Cavendish has since demonstrated that two parts of vital air, or oxygen, and one part of phlogistic air, or azote, being long exposed to electric shocks, unite and produce nitrous acid. Philosophical Transactions, Volumes 75 and 78. Azote is one of the most abundant elements in nature, and combined with caloric, or heat, forms azotic gas, or phlogistic air, and composes two-thirds of the atmosphere, and is one of the principal components of animal bodies, and when united to vital air, or oxygen, produces the nitrous acid. Mr. Lavoisier found that 21 and a half parts by weight of azote and 43 and a half parts of oxygen produced 64 parts of nitrous gas, and by the further addition of 36 parts of oxygen, nitrous acid was produced. Traité de chimie. When two airs become united so as to produce an unelastic liquid, much caloric or heat is of necessity expelled from the new combination though perhaps nitrous acid and oxygenated marine acid admit more heat into their combinations than other acids. End note.
So beauty's goddess, warm with new desire, left on her silver wheels the god of fire. Her faithless charms to fiercer Mars resigned, met with fond lips, with wanton arms entwined. Indignant Vulcan eyed the parting fair, and watched with jealous step the guilty pair. O'er his broad neck a wiry net he flung, quick as he strode, the tinkling meshes rung. Fine as the spider's flimsy thread he wove the immortal toil to lime illicit love. Steel were the knots, and steel the twisted thong, ring linked in ring, indissolubly strong. On viewless hooks along the fretted roof he hung unseen the inextricable woof. Quick start the springs, the webs pellucid spread, and lock the embracing lovers on their bed. Fierce with loud taunts vindictive Vulcan springs, tries all the bolts and tightens all the strings, shakes with incessant shouts the bright abodes, claps his rude hands and calls the festive gods. With spreading palms the alarmed goddess tries to veil her beauties from celestial eyes, writhes her fair limbs, the slender ringlet strains, and bids her love untie the obdurate chains. Soft swells her panting bosom as she turns, and her flushed cheek with brighter blushes burns. Majestic grief the queen of heaven avows, and chaste Minerva hides her helmed brows. Attendant nymphs with bashful eyes askance steal of entangled Mars a transient glance. Surrounding gods the circling nectar quaff, gaze on the fair, and envy as they laugh. 3. Hence dusky iron sleeps in dark abodes, and ferny foliage nestles in the nodes, till with wide lungs the panting bellows blow, and waked by fire the glittering torrents flow. Quick whirls the wheel, the ponderous hammer falls, loud anvils ring amid the trembling walls. Strokes follow strokes, the sparkling ingot shines, flows the red slag, the lengthening bar refines. Cold waves immersed, the glowing mass congeal, and turn to adamant, the hissing steel. Note, hence dusky iron, line 183. The production of iron from the decomposition of vegetable bodies is perpetually presented to our view. The waters oozing from all morasses are calibiate, and deposit their ochre on being exposed to the air the iron acquiring a calciform state from its union with oxygen or vital air. Where thin morasses lie on beds of gravel, the latter are generally stained by the filtration of some of the calibiate water through them. This formation of iron from vegetable recrements is further evidenced by the fern leaves and other parts of vegetables, so frequently found in the center of the knobs or nodules of some iron ores. In some of these nodules there is a nucleus of whiter iron earth surrounded by many concentric strata of darker and lighter iron earth alternately. In one, which now lies before me, the nucleus is a prism of triangular form with blunted angles, and about half an inch high, and an inch and a half broad. On every side of this are concentric strata of similar iron earth, alternately browner and less brown, each stratum is about a tenth of an inch in thickness, and there are ten of them in number. To what known cause can this exactly regular distribution of so many earthly strata of different colors surrounding the nucleus be ascribed? I don't know that any mineralogists have attempted an explanation of this wonderful phenomenon. I suspect it is owing to the polarity of the central nucleus. If iron filings be regularly laid on paper by means of a small sieve, and a magnet be placed underneath, the filings will dispose themselves in concentric curves, with vacant intervals between them. Now, if these iron filings are conceived to be suspended in a fluid, whose specific gravity is similar to their own, and a magnetic bar was introduced as an axis into this fluid, it is easy to foresee that the iron filings would dispose themselves into concentric spheres, with intervals of the circumnatant fluid between them, exactly as is seen in these nodules of iron earth. As all the lavas consist of one-fourth of iron, Kirvin's mineral, and almost all other known bodies, whether of animal or vegetable origin, possess more or less of this property, 
May not the distribution of a great portion of the globe of the earth into strata of greater or less regularity be owing to the polarity of the whole? End note. Note, and turn to adamant, line 192. The circumstances which render iron more valuable to mankind than any other metal are, one, its property of being rendered hard to so great a degree and thus constituting such excellent tools it was the discovery of this property of iron mr locke thinks that gave such preeminence to the european world over the american one two its power of being welded that is when two pieces are made very hot and applied together by hammering they unite completely unless any scale of iron intervenes and to prevent this it is usual for smiths to dip the very hot bar in sand a little of which fuses into fluid glass with the scale and is squeezed out from between the uniting parts by the force of hammering three its power of acquiring magnetism it is however to be wished that gold or silver were discovered in as great a quantity as iron since these metals being indestructible by exposure to air water fire or any common acids would supply wholesome vessels for cookery so much to be desired and so difficult to obtain and would form the most light and durable coverings for houses as well as indestructible fire grates ovens and boiling vessels see additional notes number eighteen on steel End note last mitchell's hands with touch of potent charm the polished rods with powers magnetic arm with points directed to the polar stars in one long line extend the tempered bars then thrice and thrice with steady eye he guides and o'er the adhesive train the magnet slides the obedient steel with living instinct moves and veers for ever to the pole it loves Note last michel's hands line one hundred ninety three the discovery of the magnet seems to have been in very early times it is mentioned by plato lucretius pliny and galen and is said to have taken its name of magnes from magnesia a seaport of ancient libya as every piece of iron which was made magnetical by the touch of a magnet became itself a magnet many attempts were made to improve these artificial magnets but without much success till servingdon savory esq made them of hardened steel bars which were so powerful that one of them weighing three pounds of verdupois would lift another of the same weight philosophical transactions after this dr knight made very successful experiments on this subject which though he kept his method secret seems to have excited others to turn their attention to magnetism at this time the rev mr michel invented an equally efficacious and more expeditious way of making strong artificial magnets which he published in the end of the year seventeen fifty in which he explained his method of what he called the double touch and which since mr knight's method has been known appears to be somewhat different from it this method of rendering bars of hardened steel magnetical consists in holding vertically two or more magnetic bars nearly parallel to each other with their opposite poles very near each other but nevertheless separated to a small distance these are to be slided over a line of bars laid horizontally a few times backward and forward see michel on magnetism also a detailed account in chambers dictionary what mr michel proposed by this method was to include a very small portion of the horizontal bars intended to be made magnetical between the joint forces of two or more bars already magnetical and by sliding them from end to end every part of the line of bars became successively included and thus bars possessed of a very small degree of magnetism to begin with would in a few times sliding backwards and forwards make the other ones much more magnetical than themselves which are then to be taken up and used to touch the former which are in succession to be laid down horizontally in a line there is still a great field remains for future discoveries in magnetism both in respect to experiment and theory the latter consists of vague conjectures the more probable of which are perhaps those of elpinus as they assimilate it to electricity one conjecture i shall add viz that the polarity of magnetism may be owing to the earth's rotatory motion if heat electricity and magnetism are supposed to be fluids of different gravities heat being the heaviest of them 
electricity the next heavy, and magnetism the lightest, it is evident that by the quick revolution of the earth the heat will be accumulated most over the line, electricity next beneath this, and that the magnetism will be detruded to the poles and axis of the earth, like the atmospheres of common air and of inflammable gas, as explained in the note on Canto 1, line 123. Electricity and heat will both of them displace magnetism, and this shows that they may gravitate on each other, and hence when too great a quantity of the electric fluid becomes accumulated at the poles by descending snows or other unknown causes, it may have a tendency to rise towards the tropics by its centrifugal force and produce the northern lights. See additional notes number one. End note. Hail adamantine steel, magnetic lord, king of the prow, the plowshare, and the sword, true to the pole, by thee the pilot guides his steady helm amid the struggling tides, braves with broad sail the immeasurable sea, cleaves the dark air, and asks no star but thee. By thee the plowshare rends the matted plain, inhumes in level rows the living grain, intrusive forests quit the cultured ground, and Ceres laughs with golden fillets crowned. O'er restless realms when scowling discord flings her snakes, and loud the din of battle rings. Expiring strength and vanquished courage feel thy arm resistless, adamantine steel. 4. Hence in fine streams diffusive acids flow, or winged with fire o'er earth's fair bosom blow. Transmute to glittering flints her chalky lands, or sink on ocean's bed and countless sands. Hence silvery selenite her crystal molds, and soft asbestos smooths his silky folds. His cubic forms phosphoric fluor prints, or rays in spheres his amethystine tints. Soft cobweb clouds transparent onyx spreads and playful agates weave their colored threads. Gay pictured mochos glow with landscape dyes, and changeful opals roll their lucid eyes. Blue lambent light around the sapphire plays, bright rubies blush, and living diamonds blaze. Note. Diffusive acids flow, line 215. The production of marine acid from decomposing vegetable and animal matters with vital air, and of nitrous acid from azote and vital air, the former of which is united to its basis by means of the exhalations from vegetable and animal matters, constitute an analogy which induces us to believe that many other acids have either their bases or are united to vital air by means of some part of decomposing vegetable and animal matters. The great quantities of flint sand, whether formed in mountains or in the sea, would appear to derive its acid from the New World, as it is found above the strata of limestone and granite which constitute the Old World, and as the earthly basis of flint is probably calcareous, a great part of it seems to be produced by a conjunction of the New and Old World. The recrements of air-breathing animals and vegetables probably afford the acid and the shells of marine animals the earthly basis, while another part may have derived its calcareous part also from the decomposition of vegetable and animal bodies. The same mode of reasoning seems applicable to the siliceous stones under various names as amethyst, onyx, agate, moco, opal, etc., which do not seem to have undergone any process from volcanic fires, and as these stones only differ from flint by a greater or less admixture of argillaceous and calcareous earths, the different proportions of which in each kind of stone may be seen in Mr. Kerwin's valuable Elements of Mineralogy. See additional notes, 19. End note. Note. Living Diamonds Blaze, line 228. Sir Isaac Newton, having observed the great power of refracting light, which the diamond possesses above all other crystallized or vitreous matter, conjectured that it was an inflammable body, in some manner congealed, insomuch that all the light is reflected which falls on any of its interior surfaces at a greater angle of incidence than twenty-four and a half degrees, whereas an artificial gem of glass does not reflect any light from its hinder surface, 
unless that surface is inclined in an angle of 41 degrees. Hence, the diamond reflects half as much more light as a factitious gem in similar circumstances, to which must be added great transparency and the excellent polish it is capable of. The diamond had nevertheless been placed at the head of crystals or precious stones by the mineralogists, till Bergman ranged it of late in the combustible class of bodies, because by the focus of Villette's burning mirror it was evaporated by a heat not much greater than will melt silver, and gave out light. Mr. Hopfner, however, thinks the dispersion of the diamond by this great heat should be called a phosphorescent evaporation of it, rather than a combustion, and from its other analogies of crystallization, hardness, transparency, and place of its nativity, wishes again to replace it among the precious stones. Observations sur la physique, par Rosier, Thomas, 35, page 448, see the new edition of the translation of Cronsted by de Costa, end note. Thus, for attractive earth, in constant Jove, masked in new shapes, forsook his realms above. First her sweet eyes his eagle form beguiles, and Hebe feeds him with ambrosial smiles. Next the changed god a signet's down assumes, and playful Leda smooths his glossy plumes. Then glides a silver serpent, treacherous guest, and fair Olympia folds him in her breast. Now loves a milk-white bull on Afric's strand, And crops with dancing head the daisied land. With rosy wreaths Europa's hand adorns His fringed forehead and his pearly horns. Light on his back the sportive damsel bounds, And pleased he moves along the flowery grounds. Bears with slow step his beauteous prize aloof, Dips in the lucid flood his ivory hoof, then wets his velvet knees, and wading laves his silky sides amid the dimpling waves, while her fond train with beckoning hands deplore, strain their blue eyes, and shriek along the shore. Beneath her robe she draws her snowy feet, and, half reclining on her ermine seat, round his raised neck her radiant arms she throws, and rests her fair cheek on his curled brows. Her yellow tresses wave on wanton gales, and high in air her azure mantle sails. Onward he moves, applauding Cupid's guide, and skim on shooting wing the shining tide. Emerging tritons leave their coral caves, sound their loud conchs, and smooth the circling waves. Surround the timorous beauty as she swims, and gaze enamored on her silver limbs. Now Europe's shadowy shores with loud acclaim Hail the fair fugitive and shout her name. Soft echoes warble, whispering forests nod, And conscious nature owns the present god. Changed from the bowl, the rapturous god assumes Immortal youth with glow celestial blooms. With lenient words her virgin fears disarms And clasps the yielding beauty in his arms whence kings and heroes own illustrious birth, guards of mankind, and demigods on earth. Note. In Constant Jove, line 229, the purer air or ether in the ancient mythology was represented by Jupiter, and the inferior air by Juno, and the conjunction of these deities was said to produce the vernal showers, and procreate all things, as is further spoken of in Canto 3, line 204. It is now discovered that pure air, or oxygen, uniting with variety of bases, forms the various kinds of acids, and the vitriolic acid from pure air and sulfur, the nitrous acid from pure air and phlogistic air, or azote, and carbonic acid, or fixed air, from the pure air and charcoal. Some of these affinities were perhaps portrayed by the Magi of Egypt, who were probably learned in chemistry, in their hieroglyphic pictures before the invention of letters, by the loves of Jupiter with terrestrial ladies. And thus, physically as well as metaphysically, might be said, Jovis omnia plena. End note. 6. Gnomes, as you passed beneath the laboring soil, the guards and guides of nature's chemic toil, you saw, deep sepulchred in dusky realms, 
which earth's rock-ribbed ponderous vault o'erwhelms with self-born fires the mass fermenting glow and flame-winged sulphurs quit the earth's below note with self-born fires line 275 after the accumulation of plains and mountains on the calcareous rocks or granite which had been previously raised by volcanic fires a second set of volcanic fires were produced by the fermentation of this new mass by which after the salts or acids and iron had been washed away in part by elutriation dissipated the sulphurous parts which were insoluble in water whence argillaceous and siliceous earths were left in some places in others bitumen became sublimed to the upper part of the stream producing coals of various degrees of purity End note. End of section 7. Section 8 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 2, lines 277 through 498. Hence ductile clays in wide expansion spread, soft as the signets down their snow-white bed, with yielding flakes successive forms reveal, and change obedient to the whirling wheel. First China's sons, with early art elate, formed the gay teapot and the pictured plate, saw with illumined brow and dazzled eyes in the red stove vitrescent colors rise, Specked her tall beakers with enameled stars, her monster josses and gigantic jars, smeared her huge dragons with metallic hues, with golden purples and cobaltic blues, bade on wide hills her porcelain castles glare, and glazed pagodas tremble in the air. Note, hence ductile clays, line 277, see additional notes, number 20, end note. Note. Saw with illumined brow, line 283. No color is distinguishable in the red-hot kiln but the red itself, till the workman introduces a small piece of dry wood, which by producing a white flame renders all the other colors visible in a moment. End note. Note. With golden purples, line 288. See additional notes, number 21. End note. Etruria. Next beneath thy magic hands glides the quick wheel, the plastic clay expands. Nerved with fine touch, thy fingers, as it turns, mark the nice bounds of vases, ewers, and urns. Round each fair form in lines immortal trace, uncopied beauty and ideal grace. Note. Etruria. Next. Line 291. Etruria may perhaps vie with China itself in the antiquity of the arts. The time of its greatest splendor were prior to the foundations of Rome, and the reign of one of its best princes, Janus, was the oldest epoch the Romans knew. The earliest historians speak of the Etruscans as being then of high antiquity, most probably a colony from Phoenicia, to which a Pelasgian colony acceded, and was united soon after Deucalion's flood. The peculiar character of their earthen vases consists in the admirable beauty, simplicity, and diversity of forms, which continue the best models of taste to the artists of the present times, and in a species of non-vitreous and caustic painting, which was reckoned, even in the time of Pliny, among the lost arts of antiquity, but which has lately been recovered by the ingenuity and industry of Mr. Wedgwood. It is supposed that the principal manufactories were about Nola, at the foot of Vesuvius, for it is in that neighborhood that the greatest quantities of antique vases have been found, and it is said that the general taste of the inhabitants is apparently influenced by them, insomuch that strangers coming to Naples are commonly struck with the diversity and elegance even of the most ordinary vases for common uses. See de Hancarville's Preliminary Discourses to the Magnificent Collection of Etruscan Vases, published by Sir William Hamilton. End note. Gnomes, as you now dissect with hammers fine the granite rock, the noduled flint calcine, grind with strong arm the circling chirts betwixt, 
your pure Kaolins and Petunzis mixed, or each red Sagar's burning cave preside, the keen-eyed fire nymphs blazing by your side, and pleased on Wedgwood ray your partial smile, a new Etruria decks Britannia's isle. Charmed by your touch, the flint liquescent pours through finer sieves and falls in whiter showers. Charmed by your touch, the kneaded clay refines, the biscuit hardens, the enamel shines. Each nicer mold a softer feature drinks, the bold cameo speaks, the soft intaglio thinks. Note. Illustration. H. Weber. In it, J. Holloway sculpt copied from Captain Phillips' voyage to Botany Bay by permission of the proprietor. End note. Transcriber's note. Names of painter and engraver are only guesswork. End note. Note. Illustration. Am I not a man and a brother? End note. To call the pearly drops from pity's eye, or stay despair's disanimating sigh, whether, O friend of art, the gem you mold, rich with new taste, with ancient virtue bold, from the poor fettered slave on bended knee, from Britain's sons imploring to be free, or with fair hope the brightening scenes improve, and cheer the dreary wastes at Sydney Cove, or bid mortality rejoice and mourn, or the fine forms on Portland's mystic urn. Note. Form the Poor Fettered Slave, line 315, alluding to two cameos of Mr. Wedgwood's manufacture, one a slave in chains, of which he distributed many hundreds, to excite the humane, to attend to, and to assist in the abolition of the detestable traffic in human creatures, and the other a cameo of hope, attended by peace and art and labor, which was made of clay from Botany Bay, to which place he sent many of them to show the inhabitants what their materials would do, and to encourage their industry. A print of this latter medallion is prefixed to Mr. Stockdale's edition of Philip's expedition to Botany Bay. End note. Note. Portland's Mystic Urn, line 320. See additional notes, number 22. End note. Here, by fallen columns and disjoined arcades, on mouldering stones beneath deciduous shades, sits humankind in hieroglyphic state, serious and pondering on their changeful state, while with inverted torch and swimming eyes sinks the fair shade of mortal life and dies. There the pale ghost through death's wide portal bends, his timid feet the dusky steep descends, with smiles assuasive love divine invites, Guides on broad wing, with torch uplifted lights. Immortal life, her hand extending, courts the lingering form his tottering step supports. Leads on to Pluto's realms the dreary way, and gives him trembling to Elysian day. Beneath, in sacred robes, the priest is dressed, the coif close hooded, and the fluttering vest. With pointing finger guides the initiate youth, Unweaves the many-colored veil of truth, Drives the profane from mystery's bolted door, And silence guards the Eleusinian lore. Note. Illustration. The Portland Vase. End note. Note. Illustration. The First Compartment. London. Published December 1st, 1791. By J. Johnson. St. Paul's Churchyard. End note. Transcriber's Note. Second line with date very small and nearly illegible. End note. Note. Illustration. The second compartment. End note. Note. Illustration. The handles and bottom of the vase. London published December 1st, 1791 by J. Johnson, St. Paul's Churchyard. End note. Whether, O friend of art, your gems derive, fine forms from Greece, and fabled gods revive, or bid from modern life the portrait breathe, and bind round honor's brow the laurel wreath. Buoyant shall sail, with fame's historic page, each fair medallion o'er the wrecks of age. Nor time shall mar, nor steel, nor fire, nor rust, touch the hard polish of the immortal bust. Note. Fine forms from Greece, line 342. 
In real stones, or in paste or soft-colored glass, many pieces of exquisite workmanship were produced by the ancients. Basso relievos of various sizes were made in coarse brown earth of one color, but of the improved kind of two or more colors, and of a true porcelain texture, none were made by the ancients, nor attempted, I believe, by the moderns, before those of Mr. Wedgwood's manufactory. End note. 2. Hence sable coal his massy couch extends, and stars of gold the sparkling pyrite blends. Hence dull-eyed naphtha pours his pitchy streams, and jet uncolored drinks the solar beams. Bright amber shines on his electric throne, and adds ethereal lustres to his own. Led by the phosphor light, with daring tread, immortal Franklin sought the fiery bed, where, nursed in night, incumbent tempest shrouds the seeds of thunder in circumfluent clouds. Besieged with iron points his airy cell, and pierced the monster slumbering in the shell. Note. Hence Sable Coal, line 349. See additional notes, number 23, on coal. End note. Note. Bright Amber Shines, line 353. Coal has probably all been sublimed more or less from the clay, with which it was at first formed in decomposing morasses. The petroleum seems to have been separated and condensed again in superior strata, and a still finer kind of oil, as naphtha, has probably had the same origin. Some of these liquid oils have again lost their more volatile parts, and become cannel coal, asphaltum, jet, and amber, according to the purity of the original fossil oil. Dr. Priestley has shown that essential oils long exposed to the atmosphere absorb both the vital and phlogistic part of it, whence it is probable their becoming solid may in great measure depend, as well as by the exhalation of their more volatile parts. On distillation with volatile alkali, all these fossil oils are shown to contain the acid of amber, which evinces the identity of their origin. If a piece of amber be rubbed, it attracts straw and hairs, whence the discovery of electricity, and whence his name, from electron, the Greek word for amber. End note. Note. Immortal Franklin. Line 356. See note on Canto 1, line 383. End note. So, born on sounding pinions to the west, when tyrant power had built his eagle nest, while from his eyrie shrieked the famished brood, clenched their sharp claws and champed their beaks for blood. Immortal Franklin watched the callow crew and stabbed the struggling vampires ere they flew. The patriot flame with quick contagion ran, hill lighted hill and man electrized man. Her heroes slain a while, Columbia mourned, and crowned with laurels, liberty returned. The warrior, Liberty, with bending sails, helmed his bold course to fair Hibernia's vales. Firm as he steps, along the shouting lands, lo, truth and virtue range their radiant bands. Sad superstition wails her empire torn, art plies his oar, and commerce pours her horn. Long had the giant form, on Gallia's plains, inglorious slept, unconscious of his chains. Round his large limbs were wound a thousand strings by the weak hands of confessors and kings. O'er his closed eye a triple veil was bound, and steely rivets locked him to the ground. While stern Bastille with iron cage enthralls his folded limbs and hems in marble walls. Touched by the patriot flame, he rent amazed the flimsy bonds, and round and round him gazed. Starts up from earth, above the admiring throng, lifts his colossal form, and towers along. High o'er his foes, his hundred arms he rears, plowshares his swords, and pruning hooks his spears. Calls to the good and brave, with voice that rolls like heaven's own thunder round the echoing poles. Gives to the winds his banner broad unfurled, and gathers in its shade the living world. Note. 
while stern bastille line 383 quote, we descended with great difficulty into the dungeons which were made too low for our standing upright and were so dark that we were obliged at noonday to visit them by the light of a candle we saw the hooks of those chains by which the prisoners were fastened by their necks to the walls of their cells many of which being below the level of the water were in a constant state of humidity from which issued a noxious vapour which more than once extinguished the candles since the destruction of the building many subterraneous cells have been discovered under a piece of ground which seemed only a bank of solid earth before the horrid secrets of this prison-house were disclosed some skeletons were found in these recesses with irons still fastened to their decayed bones Unquote. letters from france by h m williams page twenty four End note. seven gnomes you then taught volcanic airs to force through bubbling lavas their resistless course o'er the broad walls of rifted granite climb and pierce the rent roof of incumbent lime round sparry caves metallic lustres fling and bear phlogiston on their tepid wing note and pierce the rent roof line three hundred ninety eight the granite rocks and the limestone rocks have been cracked to very great depths at the time they were raised up by subterranean fires in these cracks are found most of the metallic ores except iron and perhaps manganese the former of which is generally found in horizontal strata and the latter generally near the surface of the earth philosophers possessing so convenient a test for the discovery of iron by the magnet have long since found it in all vegetable and animal matters and of late mr scheele has discovered the existence of manganese in vegetable ashes scheele fifty six mem stock seventeen seventy four kerwin min three hundred fifty three which accounts for the production of it near the surface of the earth and thence for its calciform appearance or union with vital air bergman has likewise shown that the limestones which become bluish or dark coloured when calcined possess a mixture of manganese and are thence preferable as a cement to other kinds of lime to bergman two hundred twenty nine which impregnation with manganese has probably been received from the decomposition of superincumbent vegetable matters these cracks or perpendicular caverns in the granite or limestone pass to unknown depths and it is up these channels that i have endeavoured to show that the steam rises which becomes afterwards condensed and produces the warm springs of this island and other parts of the world see note on fucus volume two and up these cracks i suppose certain vapours arise which either alone or by meeting with something descending into them from above have produced most of the metals and several of the materials in which they are bedded thus the ponderous earth berites of derbyshire is found in these cracks and is stratified frequently with lead ore and frequently surrounds it this ponderous earth has been found by dr hupfner in a granite in switzerland and may have thus been sublimed from immense depths by great heat and have obtained its carbonic or vitriolic acid from above annals de chimie there is also reason to conclude that something from above is necessary to the formation of many of the metals at hawkstone in shropshire the seat of sir richard hill there is an elevated rock of siliceous sand which is coloured green with copper in many places high in the air and i have in my possession a specimen of lead formed in the cavity of an iron nodule and another of lead amid spar from a crack of a coal stratum all which countenance the modern production of these metals from descending materials to which should be added that the highest mountains of granite which have therefore probably never been covered with marine productions on account of their early elevation nor with vegetable or animal matters on account of their great coldness contain no metallic ores whilst the lower ones contain copper and tin in their cracks or veins both in saxony silesia and cornwall kerwin's mineral page three hundred seventy four 
The transmutation of one metal into another, though hitherto undiscovered by the alchemists, does not appear impossible. Such transmutations have been supposed to exist in nature. Thus lapis calamniaris may have been produced from the destruction of lead ore, as it is generally found on the top of the veins of lead, where it has been calcined or united with air. And because masses of lead ore are often found entirely enclosed in it, so silver is found mixed in almost all lead ores, and sometimes in separate filaments within the cavities of lead ore, as I am informed by Mr. Michel, and is thence probably a partial transmutation of the lead into silver, the rapid progress of modern chemistry having shown the analogy between metallic calces and acids may lead to the power of transmuting their bases, a discovery much to be wished. End note. Hence glows refulgent tin, thy crystal grains, and tawny copper shoots her azure veins. Zinc lines his fretted vault with sable ore, and dull galena tessellates the floor. On vermil beds in Idria's mighty caves, the living silver rolls its ponderous waves. With gay refractions bright, platina shines, and studs with squandered stars his dusky mines. Long threads of netted gold and silvery darts inlay the lazuli and pierce the quartz. Whence roofed with silver beamed Peru of old, and hapless Mexico was paved with gold. Heavens, on my sight what sanguine colors blaze, Spain's deathless shame, the crimes of modern days. When avarice, shrouded in religion's robe, sailed to the west and slaughtered half the globe, while superstition, stalking by his side, mocked the loud groans and lapped the bloody tide. For sacred truths announced her frenzied dreams and turned to night the sun's meridian beams. Here, O Britannia, potent queen of isles, on whom fair art and meek religion smiles, now Afric's coast thy craftier sons invade with murder, rapine, theft, and call it trade. The slave, in chains, on supplicating knee, spreads his wide arms and lifts his eyes to thee. With hunger pale, with wounds and toil oppressed, are we not brethren? Sorrow chokes the rest. Air, bear to heaven upon thy azure flood their innocent cries, earth, cover not their blood. 8. When heaven's dread justice smites in crimes o'ergrown, the blood-nursed tyrant on his purple throne, gnomes, your bold forms on numbered arms outstretch, and urge the vengeance o'er the guilty wretch. Thus when Cambyses led his barbarous hosts from Persia's rocks to Egypt's trembling coasts, defiled each hallowed fane and sacred wood, and, drunk with fury, swelled the Nile with blood, waved his proud banner o'er the Theban states, and poured destruction through her hundred gates. In dread divisions marched the marshaled bands, and swarming armies blackened all the lands. By Memphis these to Ethiop's sultry plains, and those to Hammon's sand-encircled fanes. Slow as they passed, the indignant temples frowned, low curses muttering from the vaulted ground. Long aisles of cypress waved their deepened glooms, and quivering specters grinned amid the tombs. Prophetic whispers breathed from Sphinx's tongue, and Memnon's lyre with hollow murmurs rung, burst from each pyramid expiring groans, and darker shadows stretched their lengthened cones. Day after day their dreadful rout they steer, lust in the van and rapine in the rear. Note. Thus when Cambyses, line 435, Cambyses marched one army from Thebes, after having overturned the temples, ravaged the country, and deluged it with blood, to subdue Ethiopia. This army almost perished by famine, insomuch that they repeatedly slew every tenth man to supply the remainder with food. 
he sent another army to plunder the temple of Jupiter Ammon, which perished overwhelmed with sand. End note. Note. Expiring Groans, line 451. Mr. Savory, or Mr. Volney, in their travels through Egypt, has given a curious description of one of the pyramids, with the operos method of closing them and immuring the body, as they supposed, for six thousand years, and has endeavored from thence to show that, when a monarch died, several of his favorite courtiers were enclosed alive with the mummy in these great masses of stonework, and had food and water conveyed to them as long as they lived, proper apertures being left for this purpose and for the admission of air, and for the exclusion of anything offensive. End note. Gnomes, as they marched, you hid the gathered fruits, the bladed grass, sweet grains, and mealy roots, scared the tired quails that journeyed o'er their heads, retained the locusts in their earthy beds, bade on your sands no night-born dews distill, stayed with vindictive hands the scanty rill, loud o'er the camp the fiend of famine shrieks, calls all her brood and champs her hundred beaks, o'er ten square leagues her pennons broad expand, and twilight swims upon the shuddering sand. Perched on her crest the griffin discord clings, and giant murder rides between her wings. Blood from each clotted hair and horny quill, and showers of tears in blended streams distill. High poised in air her spiry neck she bends, rolls her keen eye, her dragon claws extends, darts from above, and tears at each fell swoop with iron fangs the decimated troop. Now o'er their head the whizzing whirlwinds breathe, and the live desert pants, and heaves beneath. Tinged by the crimson sun, vast columns rise of eddying sands and war amid the skies. In red arcades the billowy plains surround, and stalking turrets dance upon the ground. Long ranks in vain their shining blades extend, to demon gods their knees unhallowed bend. Wheel in wide circle, form in hollow square, and now they front, and now they fly the war. Pierce the deaf tempest with lamenting cries, press their parched lips, and close their bloodshot eyes. Gnomes, o'er the waste you led your myriad powers, climbed on the whirls and aimed the flinty showers. Onward resistless rolls the infuriate surge, clouds follow clouds, and mountains mountains urge. Wave over wave the driving desert swims, bursts o'er their heads, inhumes their struggling limbs. Man mounts on man, on camels camels rush, hosts march o'er hosts, and nations nations crush. Wheeling in air the winged islands fall, and one great earthy ocean covers all. Then ceased the storm. Night bowed his Ethiop brow to earth and listen to the groans below. Grim horror shook, a while the living hill heaved with convulsive throes, and all was still. Note, and stalking turrets, line 478. Quote, At one o'clock we alighted among some acacia trees at Wadi El Habub, having gone twenty-one miles. We were here at once surprised and terrified by a sight surely one of the most magnificent in the world. In that vast expanse of desert, from west to northwest of us, we saw a number of prodigious pillars of sand at different distances, at times moving with great celerity, at others stalking on with majestic slowness. At intervals we thought they were coming in a very few minutes to overwhelm us, and small quantities of sand did actually more than once reach us. Again they would retreat so as to be almost out of sight, their tops reaching to the very clouds. There the tops often separated from the bodies, and to these, once disjoined, dispersed in the air, and did not appear more. Sometimes they were broken in the middle, as if struck with large cannon shot. 
About noon they began to advance with considerable swiftness upon us, the wind being very strong at north. Eleven of them ranged alongside of us about the distance of three miles. The greatest diameter of the largest appeared to me at that distance as if it would measure ten feet. They retired from us with a wind at southeast, leaving an impression upon my mind to which I can give no name, though surely one ingredient in it was fear, with a considerable deal of wonder and astonishment. It was in vain to think of flying. The swiftest horse or fastest sailing ship could be of no use to carry us out of this danger, and the full persuasion of this riveted me as if to the spot where I stood. The same appearance of moving pillars of sand presented themselves to us this day in form and disposition like those we had seen at Wadi Halbub, only they seemed to be more in number and less in size. They came several times in a direction close upon us, that is, I believe, within less than two miles. They began immediately after the sunrise, like a thick wood, and almost darkened the sun. His rays shining through them for near an hour gave them an appearance of pillars of fire. Our people now become desperate. The Greeks shrieked out and said it was the day of judgment. Ismael pronounced it to be hell, and the Turkorkoris, that the world was on fire. Unquote. Bruce's Travels, Volume 4, page 553 to 555. From this account it would appear that the eddies of wind were owing to the long range of broken rocks, which bounded one side of the sandy desert, and bent the currents of air which struck against their sides, and were thus like the eddies in a stream of water which falls against oblique obstacles. This explanation is probably the true one, as these whirlwinds were not attended with rain or lightning like the tornadoes of the West Indies. End note. End of section 8. Section 9 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 2, lines 499 through 610. 9. Gnomes, whose fine forms, impassive as the air, shrink with soft sympathy for human care, who glide unseen, on printless slippers borne, beneath the waving grass and nodding corn, or lay your tiny limbs when noontide warms, where shadowy cowslips stretch their golden arms, so marked on orreries in lucid signs, starred with bright points the mimic zodiac shines, Born on fine wires amid the pictured skies, With ivory orbs the planets set and rise. Round the dwarf earth the pearly moon is rolled, And the sun twinkling whirls his rays of gold. Call your bright myriads, march your mailed hosts, With spears and helmets glittering round the coasts, Thick as the hairs which rear the lion's mane, or fringe the boar that bays the hunter train. Watch where proud surges break their treacherous mounds, and sweep resistless o'er the cultured grounds, such as erewhile impelled o'er Belgia's plain, rolled her rich ruins to the insatiate main. With piles and piers the ruffian waves engage, and bid indignant ocean stay his rage. Note, so marked on orreries, line 505. The first orrery was constructed by a Mr. Rowley, a mathematician born at Lichfield, and so named from his patron the Earl of Orrery. Johnson's Dictionary. End note. Where, girt with clouds, the rifted mountain yawns, and chills with length of shade the gelid lawns, Climb the rude steeps, the granite cliffs surround, Pierce with steel points, with wooden wedges wound, Break into clays the soft volcanic slags, Or melt with acid airs the marble crags, Crown the green summits with adventurous flocks, 
and charm with novel flowers the wandering rocks. So when proud Rome the Afric warrior braved, and high on Alps his crimson banner waved, while rocks on rocks their beetling brows oppose with piny forests and unfathomed snows. Onward he marched, to Latium's velvet ground, with fires and acids burst the obdurate bound. Wide o'er her weeping veils destruction hurled, and shook the rising empire of the world. Note. The Granite Cliffs, line 523. On long exposure to air, the granites, or porphyries, of this country exhibit a ferruginous crust, the iron being calcined by the air first becomes visible, and is then washed away from the external surface, which becomes white or gray, and thus in time seems to decompose. The marbles seem to decompose by losing their carbonic acid, as the outside, which has been long exposed to the air, does not seem to effervesce so hastily with acids as the parts more recently broken. The immense quantity of carbonic acid which exists in the many provinces of limestone, if it was extricated and decomposed, would afford charcoal enough for fuel for ages, or for the production of new vegetable or animal bodies. The volcanic slags on Mount Vesuvius are said by Monsieur Ferber to be changed into clay by means of the sulfur acid, and even pots made of clay and burnt or vitrified are said by him to be again reducible to ductile clay by the volcanic steams. Ferber's Travel Through Italy, page 166. End note. Note. Wooden wedges wound. Line 524. It is usual in separating large millstones from the siliceous sand rocks in some parts of Derbyshire to bore horizontal holes under them in a circle, and fill these with pegs made of dry wood, which gradually swell by the moisture of the earth, and in a day or two lift up the millstone without breaking it. End note. Note. With fires and acids, line 534. Hannibal was said to erode his way over the Alps by fire and vinegar. The latter is supposed to allude to the vinegar and water which was the beverage of his army. In respect to the former, it is not improbable, but where wood was to be had in great abundance, that fires made round limestone precipices would calcine them to a considerable depth. The night dews or mountain mists would penetrate these calcined parts and pulverize them by the force of the steam which the generated heat would produce. The winds would disperse this lime powder, and thus by repeated fires a precipice of limestone might be destroyed and a passage opened. It should be added that, according to Ferber's observations, these Alps consist of limestone. Letters from Italy. End note. 10. Go, gentle gnomes, resume your vernal toil. Seek my chill tribes, which sleep beneath the soil. On grey moss banks, green meads, or furrowed lands, spread the dark mould, white lime, and crumbling sands. Each bursting bud with healthier juices feed, emerging scion, or awakened seed. So, in descending streams, the silver chile streaks with white clouds the golden floods of bile. Through each nice valve the mingling currents glide, join their fine rills, and swell the sanguine tide. Each countless cell and viewless fibre seek, nerve the strong arm and tinge the blushing cheek. O oh, watch, where bosomed in the teeming earth Green swells the germ, impatient for its birth. Guard from rapacious worms its tender shoots, And drive the mining beetle from its roots. With ceaseless efforts rend the obdurate clay, And give my vegetable babes to day. Thus, when an angel form, in light arrayed, Like Howard pierced the prison's noisome shade, Where, chained to earth, with eyes to heaven upturned, the kneeling saint in holy anguish mourned, rayed from his lucid vest and haloed brow, o'er the dark roof celestial lustres glow. Peter, arise, 
with cheering voice he calls, and sounds seraphic echo round the walls. Locks, bolts, and chains his potent touch obey, and pleased he leads the dazzled sage to day. 11. You, whose fine fingers fill the organic cells with virgin earth of woods and bones and shells, mold with retractile glue their spongy beds, and stretch and strengthen all their fiber threads. Late when the mass obeys its changeful doom, and sinks to earth its cradle and its tomb, gnomes, with nice eye the slow solution watch, with fostering hand the parting atoms catch, join in new forms, combine with life and sense, and guide and guard the transmigrating ends. Note. Mold with retractile glue, line 567. The constituent parts of animal fibers are believed to be earth and gluten. These do not separate except by long putrefaction or by fire. The earth then effervesces with acids and can only be converted into glass by the greatest force of fire. The gluten has continued united with the earth of the bones above 2,000 years in Egyptian mummies, but by long exposure to air or moisture it dissolves and leaves only the earth. Hence bones long buried, when exposed to the air, absorb moisture and crumble into powder. Philosophical Transactions, number 475. The retractability or elasticity of the animal fiber depends on the gluten, and of these fibers are composed the membranes, muscles, and bones. Holler, Physiology, Toma 1, page 2. For the chemical decomposition of animal and vegetable bodies, see the ingenious work of Lavoisier, Traité de Chimie, Toma 1, page 132, who resolves all their component parts into oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and azote, the three former of which belong principally to vegetable and the last to animal matter. End note. Note, the transmigrating ends, line 574. The perpetual circulation of matter in the growth and dissolution of vegetable and animal bodies seems to have given Pythagoras his idea of the metempsychosis, or transmigration of spirit, which was afterwards dressed out or ridiculed in variety of amusing fables. Other philosophers have supposed that there are two different materials or essences which fill the universe. One of these, which has the power of commencing or producing motion, is called spirit. The other, which has the power of receiving and communicating motion, but not of beginning it, is called matter. The former of these is supposed to be diffused through all space, filling up the interstices of the suns and planets and constituting the gravitations of the sidereal bodies, the attractions of chemistry with the spirit of vegetation and of animation. The latter occupies comparatively but small space, constituting the solid parts of the sun and planets and their atmospheres. Hence these philosophers have supposed that both matter and spirit are equally immortal and unperishable, and that on the dissolution of vegetable or animal organization, the matter returns to the general mass of matter and the spirit to the general mass of spirit, to enter again into new combinations, according to the original idea of Pythagoras. The small apparent quantity of matter that exists in the universe compared to that of spirit and the short time in which the recrements of animal or vegetable bodies become again vivified in the forms of vegetable mucor or microscopic insects, seems to have given rise to another curious fable of antiquity, that Jupiter threw down a large handful of souls upon the earth and left them to scramble for the few bodies which were to be had. End note. So when on Lebanon's sequestered height the fair Adonis left the realms of light, bowed his bright locks, and, fated from his birth to change eternal, mingled with the earth, with darker horror shook the conscious wood, groaned the sad gales, and rivers blushed with blood. On cypress boughs the loves their quivers hung, their arrows scattered, and their bows unstrung. And beauty's goddess, bending o'er his bier, breathed the soft sigh and poured the tender tear. Admiring Proserpine, through dusky glades, led the fair phantom to Elysian shades, 
clad with new form, with finer sense combined, and lit with purer flame the ethereal mind. Erewhile, emerging from infernal night, the bright assurgent rises into light, leaves the drear chambers of the insatiate tomb, and shines and charms with renovated bloom, while wondering loves the bursting grave surround, and edge with meeting wings the yawning ground. Stretch their fair necks, and leaning o'er the brink, view the pale regions of the dead, and shrink. Long with broad eyes ecstatic beauty stands, heaves her white bosom, spreads her waxen hands. Then with loud shriek the panting youth alarms, My life, my love, and springs into his arms. Note, Adonis, line 576. The very ancient story of the beautiful Adonis passing one half of the year with Venus and the other with Proserpine alternately has had variety of interpretations. Some have supposed that it allegorized the summer and winter solstice, but this seems too obvious a fact to have needed an hieroglyphic emblem. Others have believed it to represent the corn, which was supposed to sleep in the earth during the winter months, and rise out of it in summer. This does not accord with the climate of Egypt, where the harvest soon follows the seed time. It seems more probably to have been a story explaining some hieroglyphic figures representing the decomposition and resuscitation of animal matter, a sublime and interesting subject, and which seems to have given origin to the doctrine of the transmigration, which had probably its birth also from the hieroglyphic treasures of Egypt. It is remarkable that the cypress groves in the ancient Greek writers, as in Theocritus, were dedicated to Venus, and afterwards became funereal emblems, which was probably occasioned by the cypress being an accompaniment of Venus in the annual processions in which she was supposed to lament over the funeral of Adonis, a ceremony which obtained over all the eastern world from great antiquity, and is supposed to be referred to by Ezekiel, who accuses the idolatrous woman of weeping for Thamus. End note. The goddess ceased, the delegating throng o'er the wide plains delighted to rush along, in dusky squadrons and in shining groups, hosts follow hosts and troops succeed to troops, scarce bears the bending grass the moving freight, and nodding florets bow beneath their weight, so when light clouds on airy pinions sail, flit the soft shadows o'er the waving veil. Shade follows shade as laughing zephyrs drive, and all the checkered landscape seems alive. Note. Zephyrs drive, line 609. These lines were originally written thus. Shade follows shade by laughing zephyrs drove, and all the checkered landscape seems to move. But were altered on account of the supposed false grammar in using the word drove for driven, according to the opinion of Dr. Loth. At the same time, it may be observed, one, that this is in many cases only an ellipsis of the letter N at the end of the word, as froze for frozen, wove for woven, spoke for spoken, and that then the participle accidentally becomes similar to the past tense. Two, that the language seems gradually tending to omit the letter N in other kind of words for the sake of euphony, as hausen is become houses, ein, eyes, thine, thy, etc., and in common conversation the words forgot, spoke, froze, rode, are frequently used for forgotten, spoken, frozen, ridden. 3. It does not appear that any confusion would follow the indiscriminate use of the same word for the past tense and the participle passive, since the auxiliary verb have or the preceding noun or pronoun always clearly distinguishes them, and lastly, rhyme poetry must lose the use of many elegant words without this license. End note. End of section 9. Section 10 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 3, lines 1 through 128. 
Again the goddess speaks. Glad echo swells the tuneful tones along her shadowy dells. Her wrinkling founts with soft vibration shakes, curls her deep wells, and rimples all her lakes. Thrills each wide stream, Britannia's isle that laves, her headlong cataracts and circumfluent waves. Thick as the dews which deck the morning flowers, or raindrops twinkling in the sun-bright showers, fair nymphs, emerging in pellucid bands, rise as she turns and whiten all the lands. Your buoyant troops on dimpling ocean tread, wafting the moist air from his oozy bed. Aquatic nymphs, you lead with viewless march the winged vapors up the aerial arch. On each broad cloud a thousand sails expand, and steer the shadowy treasure o'er the land. Through vernal skies the gathering drops diffuse, plunge in soft rains, or sink in silver dews. Your lucid bands condense with fingers chill the blue mist hovering round the gelid hill. In clay-formed beds the trickling streams collect, strain through white sands, through pebbly veins direct, or point in rifted rocks their dubious way, and in each bubbling fountain rise to day. Note. The Winged Vapors, line 14. See additional note, number 25, on evaporation. End note. Note. On each broad cloud, line 15. The clouds consist of condensed vapor, the particles of which are too small separately to overcome the tenacity of the air, and which therefore do not descend. They are in such small spheres as to repel each other. That is, they are applied to each other by such very small surfaces that the attraction of the particles of each drop to its own center is greater than its attraction to the surface of the drop in its vicinity. Every one has observed with what difficulty small spherules of quicksilver can be made to unite owing to the same cause, and it is common to see on riding through shallow water on a clear day numbers of very small spheres of water as they are thrown from the horse's feet run along the surface for many yards before they again unite with it in many cases these spherules of water which compose clouds are kept from uniting by a surplus of electric fluid and fall in violent showers as soon as that is withdrawn from them as in thunderstorms see note on canto one line five hundred fifty three if in this state a cloud becomes frozen, it is torn to pieces in its descent by the friction of the air, and falls in white flakes of snow, or these flakes are rounded by being rubbed together by the winds, and by having their angles thawed off by the warmer air beneath as they descend, and part of the water produced by these angles thus dissolved is absorbed into the body of the hailstone, as may be seen by holding a lump of snow over a candle and there becomes frozen into ice by the quantity of cold which the hailstone possesses beneath the freezing point, or which is produced by its quick evaporation in falling, and thus hailstones are often found of greater or less density according as they consist of a greater portion of snow or ice. If hailstones consisted of the large drops of showers frozen in their descent, they would consist of pure transparent ice." As hail is only produced in summer, and is always attended with storms, some philosophers have believed that the sudden departure of electricity from a cloud may effect something yet unknown in this phenomenon. But it may happen in summer independent of electricity, because the aqueous vapor is then raised higher in the atmosphere, whence it has further to fall, and there is warmer air below for it to fall through. End note. Note or sink in silver dews, line 18. During the coldness of the night, the moisture before dissolved in the air is gradually precipitated, and as it subsides, adheres to the bodies it falls upon. Where the attraction of the body to the particles of water is greater than the attractions of those particles to each other, it becomes spread upon their surface, or slides down them in actual contact, as on the broad parts of the blades of moist grass where the attraction of the surface to the water is less than the attraction of the particles of water to each other, the dew stands in drops, 
as on the points and edges of grass or gorse, where the surface presented to the drop being small, it attracts it so little as but just to support it without much changing its globular form, where there is no attraction between the vegetable surface and the dewdrops, as on cabbage leaves, the drop does not come into contact with the leaf, but hangs over it repelled, and retains its natural form, composed of the attraction and pressure of its own parts, and thence looks like quicksilver, reflecting light from both its surfaces. Nor is this owing to any oiliness of the leaf, but simply to the polish of its surface, as a light needle may be laid on water in the same manner without touching it, for as the attractive powers of polished surfaces are greater when in actual contact, so the repulsive power is greater before contact. End note. Note. The blue mist, line 20. Mists are clouds resting on the ground. They generally come on at the beginning of night, and either fill the moist valleys or hang on the summits of hills, according to the degree of moisture previously dissolved and the eduction of heat from them. The air over rivers during the warmth of the day suspends much moisture, and as the changeful surface of rivers occasions them to cool sooner than the land at the approach of evening, mists are most frequently seen to begin over rivers, and to spread themselves over moist grounds, and fill the valleys, while the mists on the tops of mountains are more properly clouds, condensed by the coldness of their situation. On ascending up the side of a hill from a misty valley, I have observed a beautiful colored halo round the moon when a certain thickness of mist was over me, which ceased to be visible as soon as I emerged out of it, and well remember admiring with other spectators the shadow of the three spires of the cathedral church at Litchfield, the moon rising behind it, apparently broken off, and lying distinctly over our heads as if horizontally on the surface of the mist which rose about as high as the roof of the church. There are some curious remarks on shadows or reflections seen on the surface of mists from high mountains in Uloa's voyages. The dry mist of summer 1783 was probably occasioned by volcanic eruption, as mentioned in note on Chunda, Volume 2, and therefore more like the atmosphere of smoke which hangs on still days over great cities. There is a dry mist, or rather a diminished transparency of the air, which, according to Mr. Saussure, accompanies fair weather, while great transparency of air indicates rain. Thus, when large rivers two miles broad, such as at Liverpool, appear narrow, it is said to prognosticate rain, and when wide, fair weather. This want of transparency of the air in dry weather may be owing to new combinations or decompositions of the vapors dissolved in it, but wants further investigation. Essays sur le high grommet, page 357. End note. Note. Round the gelid hill, line 20. See additional notes, number 26, on the origin of springs. End note. Nymphs, you then guide, attended from their source, the associate rills along their sinuous course, float in bright squadrons by the willowy brink, or circling slow in limpid eddies sink. Call from her crystal cave the naiad nymph, who hides her fine form in the passing lymph. And as below she braids her hyaline hair, eyes her soft smiles reflected in the air, or sport in groups with river boys that lave their silken limbs amid the dashing wave, pluck the pale primrose bending from its edge, or tittering dance amid the whispering sedge. Onward you pass, the pine-capped hills divide, or feed the golden harvests on their side. The wide-ribbed arch with hurrying torrents fill, shove the slow barge, or whirl the foaming mill, or lead with beckoning hand the sparkling train of refluent water to its parent main, and pleased revisit in their sea-moss veils blue nereid forms arrayed in shining scales, shapes whose broad oar the torpid wave impels, and tritons bellowing through their twisted shells. So from the heart the sanguine stream distills, 
or beauty's radiant shrine in vermil rills feeds each fine nerve each slender hair pervades the skin's bright snow with living purple shades each dimpling cheek with warmer blushes dies laughs on the lips and lightens in the eyes erewhile absorbed the vagrant globules swim from each fair feature and proportioned limb joined in one trunk with deeper tint return to the warm concave of the vital urn two one aquatic maids you sway the mighty realms of scale and shell which ocean overwhelms as night's pale queen her rising orb reveals and climbs the zenith with refulgent wheels carried on the foam your glimmering legion rides your little tridents heave the dashing tides urge on the sounding shores their crystal course restrain their fury or direct their force note carried on the form line sixty one the phenomena of the tides have been well investigated and satisfactorily explained by sir isaac newton and dr haley from the reciprocal gravitations of the earth moon and sun as the earth and moon move round a centre of motion near the earth's surface at the same time that they are proceeding in their annual orbit round the sun it follows that the water on the side of the earth nearest the centre of motion between the earth and moon will be more attracted by the moon and the waters on the opposite side of the earth will be less attracted by the moon than the central parts of the earth add to this that the centrifugal force of the water on the side of the earth furthest from the centre of the motion round which the earth and moon move which as was said before is near the surface of the earth is greater than on the opposite side of the earth from both of these causes it is easy to comprehend that the water will rise on two sides of the earth viz on that nearest to the moon and its opposite side and that it will be flattened in consequence at the quadratures and thus produce two tides in every lunar day which consists of about twenty-four hours and forty-eight minutes these tides will be also affected by the solar attraction when it coincides with the lunar one or opposes it as at new and full moon and will also be much influenced by the opposing shores in every part of the earth now as the moon in moving round the centre of gravity between itself and the earth describes a much larger orbit than the earth describes around the same centre it follows that the centrifugal motion on the side of the moon opposite to the earth must be much greater than the centrifugal motion of the side of the earth opposite to the moon round the same centre and secondly as the attraction of the earth exerted on the moon's surface next to the earth is much greater than the attraction of the moon exerted on the earth's surface the tides on the lunar sea if such there be should be much greater than those of our ocean add to this that as the same face of the moon always is turned to the earth the lunar tides must be permanent and if the solid parts of the moon be spherical must always cover the faces next to us but as there are evidently hills and vales and volcanoes on this side of the moon the consequence is that the moon has no ocean or that it is frozen End note. Two. nymphs you adorn in glossy volumes rolled the gaudy conch with azure green and gold you round echinus ray his arrowy mail give the keeled nautilus his oar and sail firm to his rock with silver cords suspend the anchored pinna and his cancer friend with worm-like beard his toothless lips array and teach the unwieldy sturgeon to betray ambushed in weeds or sepulchred in sands in dread repose he waits the scaly bands waves in red spires the living lures and draws the unwary plunderers to his circling jaws eyes with grim joy the twinkling shoals beset and clasps the quick inextricable net you chase the warrior shark and cumbrous whale and guard the mermaid in her briny veil feed the live petals of her insect flowers her shell-rack gardens and her sea-fan bowers with oars and gems adorn her coral cell 
and drop a pearl in every gaping shell. Note, the gaudy conch, line 66. The spiral form of many shells seem to have afforded a more frugal manner of covering the long tail of the fish with calcareous armor, since a single thin partition between the adjoining circles of the fish was sufficient to defend both surfaces, and thus much cretaceous matter is saved and it is probable that from this spiral form they are better enabled to feel the vibrations of the element in which they exist. See note on Canto 4, line 162. This cretaceous matter is formed by a mucous secretion from the skin of the fish, as is seen in crabfish and others which annually cast their shells, and is at first a soft mucus covering like that of a hen's egg, when it is laid a day or two too soon, and which gradually hardens. This may also be seen in common shell snails. If a part of their shell be broken, it becomes repaired in a similar manner with mucus, which by degrees hardens into shell. It is probable that the calculi, or stones found in other animals, may have a similar origin, as they are formed on mucous membranes, as those of the kidney and bladder chalk stones in the grout and gall stones, and are probably owing to the inflammation of the membrane where they are produced, and vary according to the degree of inflammation of the membrane which forms them, and the kind of mucus which it naturally produces. Thus the shelly matter of different shellfish differs, from the coarser kinds which form the shells of crabs to the finer kinds which produces the mother pearl. The beautiful colors of some shells originate from the thinness of the laminae of which they consist, rather than to any coloring matter, as is seen in Mother of Pearl, which reflects different colors according to the obliquity of the light which falls on it. The beautiful prismatic colors seen on the Labrador stone are owing to a similar cause, viz. the thinness of the laminae of which it consists, and has probably been formed from Mother Pearl shells. It is curious that some of the most common fossil shells are not now known in their recent state, as the Coruna Ammonis, and on the contrary, many shells which are very plentiful in their recent state, as limpets, sea ears, volutes, cowries, are very rarely found fossil. Da Costa's Conchology, page 163. Were all the Ammoniae destroyed when the continents were raised? or do some genera of animals perish by the increasing power of their enemies? Or do they still reside at inaccessible depths in the sea? Or do some animals change their forms, gradually, and become new genera? End note. Note. Echinus nautilus, lines 67-68. See additional notes number 27. End note. Note, Pinna, Cancer, line 70. See additional notes, number 27. End note. Note, with worm-like beard, line 71. See additional notes, number 28. End note. Note, feed the live petals, line 82. There is a sea insect described by Mr. Hughes, whose claws or tentacles being disposed in regular circles and tinged with variety of bright, lively colors, represent the petals of some most elegantly fringed and radiated flowers, as the carnation, marigold, and anemone. Philosophical Transactions Abridged, Volume 9, page 110. The Abbe de Quemar has further elucidated the history of the actina, and observed their manner of taking their prey by enclosing it in these beautiful rays like a net. Philosophical Transactions, Volumes 63 and 65 and 67. End note. Note, and drop a pearl, line 84. Many are the opinions, both of ancient and modern, concerning the production of pearls, Mr. Rayamore thinks they are formed like the hard concretions in many land animals as stones of the bladder, gallstones, and bezoar, and hence concludes them to be a disease of the fish. But there seems to be a stricter analogy between these and the calcareous productions found in crabfish, called crab's eyes, which are formed near the stomach of the animal and constitute a reservoir of calcareous matter against the renovation of the shell. 
at which time they are re-dissolved and deposited for that purpose. As the internal part of the shell of the pearl oyster or mussel consists of mother pearl, which is a similar material to the pearl, and as the animal has annually occasion to enlarge his shell, there is reason to suspect the loose pearls are similar reservoirs of the pearly matter for that purpose. End note. 3. Your myriad trains or stagnant oceans tow, harnessed with gossamer, the loitering prow, or with fine films suspended o'er the deep, of oil effusive lull the waves to sleep. You stay the flying bark concealed beneath, where living rocks of worm-built coral breathe. Meet fell Teredo, as he mines the keel with beaked head, and break his lips of steel. Turn the broad helm, the fluttering canvas urge, from maelstrom's fierce innavigable surge. Mid the lorn isles of Norway's stormy main, as sweeps o'er many a league his eddying train, vast watery walls and rapid circles spin, and deep engulfed the demon dwells within. Springs o'er the fear-froze crew with harpy claws, Down his deep den the whirling vessel draws, Churns with his bloody mouth the dread repast, The booming waters murmuring o'er the mast. Note, or with fine films, line 87. See additional notes, number 29. End note. Note, where living rocks, line 90. The immense and dangerous rocks built by the swarms of coral insects, which rise almost perpendicularly in the southern ocean like walls, are described in Cook's voyages. A point of one of these rocks broke off and stuck in the hole which it had made in the bottom of one of his ships, which would otherwise have perished by the admission of water. The numerous limestone rocks which consist of a congeries of the shells of these animals, and which constitute a great part of the solid earth, show their prodigious multiplication in all ages of the world. Specimens of these rocks are to be seen in the lime works at Linzel near Newport in Shropshire, in Colebrook Dale, and in many parts of the peak of Derbyshire. The insect has been well described by Monsieur Paisonnel. Ellis, and others. Philosophical Transactions, Volumes 47, 50, 52, and 57. End note. Note. Meet Fel Teredo, line 91. See additional notes, number 30. End note. Note. Turn the broad helm, line 93. See additional notes, number 31. End note. 3. Where with chill frown enormous Alps alarms a thousand realms, horizoned in his arms, while cloudless sun's meridian glories shed from skies of silver round his hoary head. Tall rocks of ice refract the colored rays, and frost sits throned amid the lambent blaze. Nymphs, your thin forms pervade his glittering piles, his roofs of crystal, and his glassy isles, wherein cold caves imprisoned naiads sleep, or chained on mossy couches wake and weep, where round dark crags indignant waters bend, through rifted ice in ivory veins descend, seek through unfathomed snows their devious track, heave the vast spars, the ribbed granites crack, rush into day, in foamy torrents shine, and swell the imperial Danube o'er the Rhine, or feed the murmuring Tiber as he laves his realms inglorious with diminished waves, hears his lorn forum sound with eunuch strains, sees dancing slaves insult his martial plains, parts with chill stream the dim religious bower, time-mouldered bastion and dismantled tower, by altered fanes and nameless villas glides, and classic domes that tremble on his sides, sighs o'er each broken urn and yawning tomb, and mourns the fall of liberty and Rome. Note, where round dark crags, line 113, see additional notes, number 32. End note. Note, heave the vast spars, line 116. 
Water in descending down elevated situations, if the outlet for it below is not sufficient for its emission, acts with a force equal to the height of the column, as is seen in an experimental machine called the philosophical bellows, in which a few pints of water are made to raise many hundred pounds. To this cause is to be ascribed many large promontories of ice being occasionally thrown down from the glaciers. Rocks have likewise been thrown from the sides of mountains by the same cause, and large portions of earth have been removed many hundred yards from their situation at the foot of mountains. On inspecting the locomotion of about thirty acres of earth, with a small house near Builder's Bridge in Shropshire, about twenty years ago, from the foot of a mountain towards the river, I well remember it bore all the marks of having been thus lifted up, pushed away, and as it were crumpled into ridges by a column of water contained in the mountain. From water being thus confined in high columns between the strata of mountainous countries, it has often happened that when wells or perforations have been made into the earth, that springs have arisen much above the surface of the new well. When the new bridge was building at Dublin, Mr. G. Semple found a spring in the bed of the river where he meant to lay the foundation of a pier, which, by fixing iron pipes into it, he raised many feet. Treatise on Building in Water by G. Semple From having observed a valley northwest of St. Alkman's well near Derby, at the head of which that spring of water once probably existed, and by its current formed the valley, but which in after times found its way out in its present situation, I suspect that St. Alkman's well might, by building round it, be raised high enough to supply many streets in Derby with spring water which are now only supplied with river water. See an account of an artificial spring of water. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 75, Page 1. In making a well at Sheerness, the water rose three hundred feet above its source in the well. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 74. And at Hartford in Connecticut, there is a well which was dug seventy feet deep before water was found. Then in boring an auger hole through a rock, the water rose so fast as to make it difficult to keep it dry by pumps till they could blow the hole larger by gunpowder, which was no sooner accomplished than it filled and run over and has been a brook for near a century. Travels Through America, London, 1789, Lane. End note. End of section 10. Section 11 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto three, lines one hundred twenty nine through three hundred twenty. Four, sailing in air when dark monsoon enshrouds his tropic mountains in a night of clouds, or drawn by whirlwinds from the line returns and showers o'er Afric all his thousand urns. High o'er his head the beams of Sirius glow, and dog of Nile Anubis barks below. Nymphs, you from cliff to cliff attendant guide in headlong cataracts the impetuous tide, or lead o'er wastes of Abyssinian sands the bright expanse to Egypt's showerless lands. Her long canals the sacred waters fill, and edge with silver every peopled hill. Gigantic sphinx in circling waves admire, and Memnon bending o'er his broken lyre, or furrowed glebes and green savannas sweep, and towns and temples laugh amid the deep. Note. Dark monsoon in shrouds, line 129. When from any peculiar situations of land in respect to the sea, the tropic becomes more heated, when the sun is vertical over it, than the line, the periodical winds called monsoons are produced, and these are attended by rainy seasons. For as the air at the tropic is now more heated than at the line, it ascends by decrease of its specific gravity, and floods of air rush in both from the southwest and northeast, and these being one warmer than the other, the rain is precipitated by their mixture, as observed by Dr. Hutton. See additional notes 
Number 25. All late travelers have ascribed the rise of the Nile to the monsoons which deluged Nubia and Abyssinia with rain. The whirling of the ascending air was even seen by Mr. Bruce in Abyssinia. He says, quote, Every morning a small cloud began to whirl round, and presently after the whole heavens became covered with clouds. Unquote. By this vortex of ascending air, the northeast winds and the southwest winds, which flow in to supply the place of the ascending column, became mixed more rapidly and deposited their rain in greater abundance. Mr. Volney observes that the time of the rising of the Nile commences about the 19th of June, and that Abyssinia and the adjacent parts of Africa are daily used with rain in May, June, and July, and produce a mass of water which is three months in draining off. The Abbe Le Pluche observes that, as Sirius, or the Dog Star, rose at the time of the commencement of the flood, its rising was watched by the astronomers, and notice given of the approach of inundation by hanging the figure of Anubis, which was that of a man with a dog's head, upon all their temples. Histoire de Ciel. End note. Note. Illustration. Fertilization of Egypt. End note. Note, Egypt's showerless lands, line 138. There seem to be two situations which may be conceived to be exempted from rain falling upon them, one where the constant trade winds meet beneath the line, for here two regions of warm air are mixed together, and thence do not seem to have any cause to precipitate their vapor, and the other is, where the winds are brought from colder climates and become warmer by their contact with the earth of a warmer one, Thus Lower Egypt is a flat country, warmed by the sun more than the higher lands of one side of it, and than the Mediterranean on the other, and hence the winds which blow over it acquire greater warmth, whichever way they come, than they possessed before, and in consequence have a tendency to acquire and not to part with their vapor like the northeast winds of this country. There is said to be a narrow spot upon the coast of Peru where rain seldom occurs. At the same time, according to Uloa, on the mountainous regions of the Andes beyond, there is almost perpetual rain, for the wind blows uniformly upon this hot part of the coast of Peru, but no cause of devaporation occurs till it begins to ascend the mountainous Andes, and then its own expansion produces cold sufficient to condense its vapor. End note. 5. 1. High in the frozen north where Hecla glows and melts in torrents his coeval snows, or isles and ocean sheds a sanguine light, or shoots red stars amid the ebon night, when, at his base entombed, with bellowing sound, fell Gisar roared and struggling shook the ground, poured from red nostrils with her scalding breath a boiling deluge o'er the blasted heath and, wide in air, in misty volumes hurled, contagious atoms o'er the alarmed world. Nymphs, your bold myriads broke the infernal spell, and crushed the sorceress in her flinty cell. Note. Felgisar roared. Line 150. The boiling column of water at Gisar in Iceland was nineteen feet in diameter, and sometimes rose to the height of ninety-two feet. On cooling, it deposited a siliceous matter of chalcedony, forming a basin round its base. The heat of this water before it rose out of the earth could not be ascertained, as water loses all its heat above 212, as soon as it is at liberty to expand, by the exhalation of a part, but the flinty basin which is deposited from it shows that water with great degrees of heat will dissolve siliceous matter. Von Troil's Letters on Iceland since the above account, in the year 1780, this part of Iceland has been destroyed by an earthquake or covered with lava, which was probably effected by the force of aqueous steam, a greater quantity of water falling on the subterraneous fires than could escape by the ancient outlets, and generating an increased quantity of vapor. For the dispersion of contagious vapors from volcanoes, see an account of the Harmattan in the notes of Chunda, Volume 2. End note. 2. Where with soft fires in unextinguished urns, cauldroned in rock, innocuous lava burns, 
on the bright lake your gelid hands distill in pearly mowers the parsimonious rill and as aloft the curling vapors rise through the cleft roof ambitious for the skies in vaulted hills condense the tepid steams and pour to health the medicated streams so in green vales amid her mountainous bleak buxtonia smiles the goddess nymph of peak deep in warm waves and pebbly baths she dwells and calls hygeia to her sainted wells note buxtonia smiles line one hundred sixty six some arguments are mentioned in the note on fucus volume two to show that the warm springs of this country do not arise from the decomposition of pyrites near the surface of the earth but that they are produced by steam rising up the fissures of the mountains from great depths owing to water falling on subterraneous fires and that this steam is condensed between the strata of the incumbent mountains and collected into springs for further proofs on this subject the reader is referred to a letter from dr darwin in mr pilkington's view of derbyshire volume one page two hundred fifty six end note hither in sportive bands bright devon leads graces and loves from chatworth's flowery meads charmed round the nymph they climb the rifted rocks and steep in mountain mist their golden locks on venturous step her sparry caves explore and light with radiant eyes her realms of ore oft by her bubbling founts and shadowy domes in gay undress the fairy legion roams their dripping palms in playful malice fill or taste with ruby lip the sparkling rill crowd round her baths and bending o'er the side unclasped their sandals and their zones untied dip with gay fear the shuddering foot undressed and quick retract it to the fringed vest or cleave with brandished arms the lucid stream and sob their blue eyes twinkling in the steam high o'er the checkered vault with transient glow bright lustres dart as dash the waves below and echo's sweet responsive voice prolongs the dulcet tumult of their silver tongues o'er their flushed cheeks uncurling tresses flow and dew-drops glitter on their necks of snow round each fair nymph her dropping mantle clings and loves emerging shake their showery wings note and sob their blue eyes line one hundred eighty four the bath at buxton being of eighty two degrees of heat is called a warm bath and is so compared with common spring water which possesses but forty eight degrees of heat but is nevertheless a cold bath compared to the heat of the body which is ninety eight on going into this bath there is therefore always a chill perceived at the first immersion but after having been in it a minute the chill ceases and a sensation of warmth succeeds though the body continues to be immersed in the water the cause of this curious phenomenon is to be looked for in the laws of animal sensation and not from any properties of heat when a person goes from clear daylight into an obscure room for a while it appears gloomy which gloom however in a little time ceases and the deficiency of light becomes no longer perceived this is not solely owing to the enlargement of the iris of the eye since that is performed in an instant but to this law of sensation that when a less stimulus is applied within certain bounds the sensibility increases thus at going into a bath as much colder than the body as that of buxton the diminution of heat on the skin is at first perceived but in about a minute the sensibility to heat increases and the nerves of the skin are equally excited by the lessened stimulus the sensation of warmth that emerging from a cold bath and the pain called the hot ache after the hands have been immersed in snow depends on the same principle viz the increased sensibility of the skin after having been previously exposed to a stimulus less than usual End note. here oft her lord surveys the rude domain fair arts of greece triumphant in his train lo as he steps the columned pile ascends the blue roof closes o'er the crescent bends new woods aspiring clothe their hills with green smooth slope the lawns the grey rock peeps between 
relenting nature gives her hand to taste, and health and beauty crown the laughing waste. Note, here oft her lord, line 193, alluding to the magnificent and beautiful crescent and superb stables lately erected at Buxton for the accommodation of the company by the Duke of Devonshire, and to the plantations with which he has decorated the surrounding mountains. End note. 6. Nymphs, your bright squadrons watch with chemic eyes the cold elastic vapors as they rise, with playful force arrest them as they pass, and to pure air betroth the flaming gas. Round their translucent forms at once they fling their rapturous arms, with silver bosoms cling. In fleecy clouds their fluttering wings extend, or from the skies in lucid showers descend, whence rills and rivers owe their secret birth, and ocean's hundred arms enfold the earth. Note, and to pure air, line 204, until very lately water was esteemed a simple element, nor are all the most celebrated chemists of Europe yet converts to the new opinion of its decomposition, Mr. Lavoisier and others of the French school have most ingeniously endeavored to show that water consists of pure air, called by them oxygen, and of inflammable air, called hydrogen, with as much of the matter of heat or caloric as is necessary to preserve them in the form of gas. Gas is distinguished from steam by its preserving its elasticity under the pressure of the atmosphere and in the greatest degrees of cold yet known. The history of the progress of this great discovery is detailed in the Memoirs of the Royal Academy for 1781, and the experimental proofs of it are delivered in Lavoisier's Elements of Chemistry, the results of which are that water consists of 85 parts by weight of oxygen and 15 parts by weight of hydrogen, with a sufficient quantity of caloric. Not only numerous chemical phenomena but many atmospherical and vegetable facts receive clear and beautiful elucidation from this important analysis. In the atmosphere, inflammable air is probably perpetually uniting with vital air and producing moisture which descends in dews and showers, while the growth of vegetables by the assistance of light is perpetually again decomposing the water they imbibe from the earth and while they retain the inflammable air for the formation of oils, wax, honey, resin, etc., they give up the vital air to replenish the atmosphere. End note. So, robed by beauty's queen with softer charms, Saturnia wooed the thunderer to her arms, o'er her fair limbs a veil of light she spread, and bound a starry diadem on her head. Long braids of pearl her golden tresses graced, and the charmed cestus sparkled round her waist. Raised o'er the woof by beauty's hand inwrought, breathes the soft sigh and glows the enamoured thought. Vows on light wings succeed, and quivered wiles, assuasive accents and seductive smiles. Slow rolls the Cyprian car in purple pride, and, steered by love, ascends admiring eyed, climbs the green slopes, the nodding woods pervades, burns round the rocks, or gleams amid the shades. Glad Zephyr leads the train, and waves above the barbed darts and blazing torch of love, reverts his smiling face, and pausing flings soft showers of roses from Aurelian wings. Delighted fawns, in wreaths of flowers arrayed, with tiptoe woodboys beat the checkered glade. Alarmed naiads, rising into air, lift o'er their silver urns their leafy hair. Each to her oak the bashful dryads shrink, and azure eyes are seen through every chink. Love culls a flaming shaft of broadest wing, and rests the fork upon the quivering string points his arch eye aloft, with fingers strong draws to his curled ear the silken thong. Loud twangs the steel, the golden arrow flies, trails a long line of luster through the skies. "'Tis done!' he shouts, the mighty monarch feels, and with loud laughter shakes the silver wheels. 
bends o'er the car, and whirling as it moves, his loosened bowstring drives the rising doves. Pierced on his throne, the slarting thunderer turns, melts with soft sighs, with kindling rapture burns, clasps her fair hand, and eyes in fond amaze the bright intruder with enamoured gaze and leaves my goddess like a blooming bride the fanes of argos for the rocks of ide her gorgeous palaces and amaranth bowers for cliff-topped mountains and aerial towers he said and leading from her ivory seat the blushing beauty to his lone retreat curtained with night the couch imperial shrouds and rests the crimson cushions upon clouds earth feels the grateful influence from above sighs the soft air and ocean murmurs love ethereal warmth expands his brooding wing and in still showers descends the genial spring note and steered by love line two hundred twenty two the younger love or cupid the son of venus owes his existence and his attributes to much later times than the eros or divine love mentioned in canto one since the former is nowhere mentioned by homer though so many apt opportunities of introducing him occur in the works of that immortal bard bacon End note. note and in still showers line two hundred sixty the allegorical interpretation of the very ancient mythology which supposes jupiter to represent the superior part of the atmosphere or ether and juno the inferior air and that the conjunction of these two produces vernal showers, as alluded to in Virgil's Georgics, is so analogous to the present important discovery of the production of water from pure air or oxygen, and inflammable air or hydrogen, which from its greater levity probably resides over the former, that one should be tempted to believe that the very ancient chemists of Egypt had discovered the composition of water, and thus represented it in their hieroglyphic figures before the invention of letters in the passage of virgil jupiter is called ether and descends in prolific showers on the bosom of juno whence the spring succeeds and all nature rejoices tum pater omnipotens fecundis imbribus ether conjugus in gremium late descendit et omnis magnus alit magno comixtus corpore fetus virgil georgics liber two line three hundred twenty five and note seven nymphs of aquatic taste whose placid smile breathes sweet enchantment o'er britannia's isle whose sportive touch in showers resplendent flings her lucid cataracts and her bubbling springs through peopled vales the liquid silver guides and swells in bright expanse her freighted tides you with nice ear in tiptoe trains pervade dim walks of morn or evening's silent shade join the lone nightingale her woods among and roll your rills symphonious to her song through fountful dells and wave-worn valleys move and tune their echoing waterfalls to love or catch attentive to the distant roar the pausing murmurs of the dashing shore or as aloud she pours her liquid strain pursue the nereid on the twilight main her playful sea-horse woos her soft commands turns his quick ears his webbed claws expands his watery way with waving volutes winds or listening librates on unmoving fins the nymph emerging mounts her scaly seat hangs o'er his glossy sides her silver feet with snow-white hands her arching veil detains gives to his slimy lips the slackened reins lifts to the star of eve her eyes serene and chants the birth of beauty's radiant queen o'er her fair brow her pearly comb unfurls her beryl locks and parts the waving curls each tangled braid with glistening teeth unbinds and with the floating treasure musks the winds thrilled by the dulcet accents as she sings the rippling wave in widening circles rings 
night's shadowy forms along the margin gleam with pointed ears or dance upon the stream. The moon transported stays her bright career, and maddening stars shoot headlong from the sphere. Note, her playful seahorse, line 277, described from an antique gem. End note. 8. Nymphs, whose fair eyes with vivid lusters glow for human weal and melt at human woe. Late as you floated on your silver shells, sorrowing and slow by Derwent's willowy dells, whereby tall groves his foamy flood he steers through ponderous arches or impetuous wares, by Derby's shadowy towers reflective sweeps, and gothic grandeur chills his dusky deeps. You pearled with pity's drops his velvet sides, sighed in his gales and murmured in his tides, waved o'er his fringed brink a deeper gloom, and bowed his alders o'er Milsena's tomb. Note, o'er Milsena's tomb, line 308, in memory of Mrs. French, a lady who, to many other elegant accomplishments, added a proficiency in botany and natural history. End note. Oft with sweet voice she led her infant train, printing with graceful step his spangled plain, explored his twinkling swarms that swim or fly, and marked his florets with botanic eye. Sweet bud of spring, how frail thy transient bloom! Fine film, she cried, of nature's fairest loom! Soon beauty fades upon its damask throne, unconscious of the worm that mind her own. Pale are those lips, where soft caresses hung, wan the warm cheek, and mute the tender tongue. Cold rests that feeling heart on Derwent's shore, and those love-lighted eyeballs roll no more. End of section 11「12 of the botanic garden a poem in two parts part one the economy of vegetation by erasmus darwin this librivox recording is in the public domain canto three lines 321 to 528 hear her sad consort stealing through the gloom of murmuring cloisters gazes on her tomb hangs in mute anguish o'er the scutcheoned hearse, or graves with trembling style the votive verse. Sexton, O oh, lay beneath this sacred shrine, when time's cold hand shall close my aching eyes, O oh, gently lay this wearied earth of mine, where wrapped in night my loved Milsena lies. So shall with purer joy my spirit move, when the last trumpet thrills the caves of death, catching the first whispers of my waking love, and drink with holy kiss her kindling breath. The spotless fair, with blush ethereal warm, shall hail with sweeter smile returning day, rise from her marble bed a brighter form, and win on buoyant step her airy way. Shall bend approved where beckoning hosts invite, on clouds of silver her adoring knee, approach with seraphim the throne of light, and beauty plead with angel tongue for me. 9. Your virgin trains on Brindley's cradle smiled, and nursed with fairy love the unlettered child. Spread round his pillow all your secret spells, pierced all your springs, and opened all your wells as now on grass with glossy fields revealed, glides the bright serpent, now in flowers concealed. Far shine the scales that gild his sinuous back, and lucid undulations mark his track. So with strong arm immortal Brindley leads his long canals and parts the velvet meads. Winding in lucid lines, the watery mass mines the firm rock or loads the deep morass. With rising locks a thousand hills alarms, Flings o'er a thousand streams its silver arms, Feeds the long vale, the nodding woodland laves, And plenty, arts, and commerce freight the waves. Nymphs, 
who erewhile round Brindley's early beer on snow-white bosoms showered the incessant tear, adorn his tomb. Oh, raise the marble bust, proclaim his honors, and protect his dust. With urns inverted round the sacred shrine, their osier wreaths let weeping naiads twine, while on the top mechanic genius stands, counts the fleet waves, and balances the lands. Note, on Brindley's Cradle Smiled, line 341, the life of Mr. Brindley, whose great abilities in the construction of canal navigation were called forth by the patronage of the Duke of Bridgewater, may be read in Dr. Kippis's Biographia Britannica. The excellence of his genius is visible in every part of the island. He died at Tunhurst in Staffordshire in 1772, and ought to have a monument in the cathedral church at Lichfield. End note. 10. Nymphs, you first taught to pierce the secret caves of humid earth and lift her ponderous waves. Bade with quick stroke the sliding piston bear the viewless columns of incumbent air. Pressed by the incumbent air the floods below, through opening valves in foaming torrents flow. Foot after foot with lessened impulse move, and rising seek the vacancy above. So when the mother, bending o'er his charms, clasps her fair nursling in delighted arms, throws the thin kerchief from her neck of snow, and half unveils the pearly orbs below. With sparkling eye the blameless plunderer owns her soft embraces, and endearing tones, seeks the salubrious fount with opening lips, spreads his inquiring hands, and smiles and sips. Note lift her ponderous waves line 366 the invention of the pump is of very ancient date being ascribed to one tzitzibis an athenian whence it was called by the latins machina tzitzibiana but it was long before it was known that the ascent of the piston lifted the superincumbent column of the atmosphere and that then the pressure of the surrounding air on the surface of the well below forced the water up into the vacuum and that on that account, in the common lifting pump, the water would rise only about thirty-five feet, as the weight of such a column of water was in general in equipoise to the surrounding atmosphere. The foamy appearance of water, when the pressure of the air over it is diminished, is owing to the expansion and escape of the air previously dissolved by it, or existing in its pores. When a child first sucks, it only presses or champs the teat, as observed by the great Harvey, but afterwards it learns to make an incipient vacuum in its mouth, and acts by removing the pressure of the atmosphere from the nipple, like a pump. End note. Connubial fair, whom no fond transport warms to lull your infant in maternal arms, who, blessed in vain with tumid bosoms, hear his tender wailings with unfeeling ear. The soothing kiss and milky rill deny to the sweet pouting lip and glistening eye. Ah, what avails the cradle's damask roof, the eider bolster and embroidered woof? Oft hears the gilded couch unpitied plains, and many a tear the tasseled cushion stains. No voice so sweet attunes his cares to rest, so soft no pillow as his mother's breast. Thus charmed to sweet repose when twilight hours shed their soft influence on celestial bowers, the cherub, innocence, with smile divine, shuts his white wings and sleeps on beauty's shrine. Note. Ah, what avails, line 387, from an elegant little poem of Mr. Jerningham's entitled Illate, exhorting ladies to nurse their own children. End note. 11. From dome to dome, when flames infuriate climb, sweep the long street, invest the tower sublime, gild the tall veins amid the astonished night, and reddening heaven returns the sanguine light. While with vast strides and bristling hair aloof, pale danger glides along the falling roof, and giant terror howling in amaze moves his dark limbs across the lurid blaze. Nymphs, 
You first taught the gelid wave to rise, hurled in resplendent arches to the skies. In iron cells condensed the airy spring, and imped the torrent with unfailing wing. On the fierce flames the shower impetuous falls, and sudden darkness shrouds the shattered walls. Steam, smoke, and dust in blended volumes roll, and night and silence repossess the pole. Note. Hurled in resplendent arches, line 406. The addition of an air cell to machines for raising water to extinguish fire was first introduced by Mr. Newsom of London and is now applied to similar engines for washing wall trees and gardens and to all kinds of forcing pumps and might be applied with advantage to lifting pumps where the water is brought from a great distance horizontally. Another kind of machine was invented by one Grail in which a vessel of water was every way dispersed by the explosion of gunpowder lodging in the center of it, and lighted by an adapted match. From this idea, Mr. Godfrey proposed a water bomb of similar construction. Dr. Hales, to prevent the spreading of fire, proposed to cover the floors and stairs of the adjoining houses with earth. Mr. Hartley proposed to prevent houses from taking fire by covering the ceiling with thin iron plates and Lord Mahone, by a bed of coarse mortar or plaster between the ceiling and floor above it. May not this age of chemical science discover some method of injecting or soaking timber with lime water, and afterwards with vitriolic acid, and thus fill its pores with alabaster? Or of penetrating it with siliceous matter by processes similar to those of Bergman and Achard? See Kronstadt's Mineral, 2nd edition, volume 1, page 222. End note. Where were ye nymphs in those disastrous hours, which wrapped in flames Augusta's sinking towers? Why did ye linger in your wells and groves, when sad Woodmason mourned her infant loves, when thy fair daughters with unheeded screams ill-fated Molesworth called the loitering streams? The trembling nymph on bloodless fingers hung, Eyes from the tottering wall the distant throng. With ceaseless shrieks her sleeping friend's alarms, Drops with singed hair into her lover's arms. The illumined mother seeks with footsteps fleet, Where hangs the safe balcony o'er the street. Wrapped in her sheet her youngest hope suspends, And panting lowers it to her tiptoe friends. Again she hurries on affection's wings, and now a third, and now a fourth she brings. Safe all her babes, she smooths her horrent brow, and bursts through bickering flames, unscorched below. So, by her son arraigned, with feet unshod, or burning bars, indignant Emma trod. Footnote. Woodmason, Molesworth, line 416. The histories of these unfortunate families may be seen in the annual register or in the gentleman's magazine. End note. E'en on the day when youth with beauty wed, the flames surprised them in their nuptial bed. Seen at the opening sash with bosom bare, with wringing hands and dark disheveled hair, the blushing beauty with disordered charms round her fond lover winds her ivory arms, beat as they clasp their throbbing hearts with fear, and many a kiss is mixed with many a tear. Ah, me! In vain the laboring engines pour round their pale limbs the ineffectual shower. Then crashed the floor, while shrieking crowds retire, and love and virtue sunk amid the fire. With piercing screams afflicted strangers mourn, and their white ashes mingle in their urn. 12. Pellucid forms, whose crystal bosoms show the shine of welfare or the shade of woe, who with soft lips salute returning spring, and hail the zephyr quivering on his wing, or watch untired the wintry clouds, and share with streaming eyes my vegetable care. Go, shove the dim mist from the mountain's brow, chase the white fog which floods the vale below, Melt the thick snows that linger on the lands, and catch the hailstones in your little hands. Guard the coy blossom from the pelting shower, and dash the rimy spangles from the bower. 
from each chill leaf the silvery drops repel and close the timorous floret's golden bell note shove the dim mist line 453 see note on line 20 of this canto end note note catch the hailstones line 456 see note on line 15 of this canto end note note from each chill leaf line 459 the upper side of the leaf is the organ of vegetable respiration as explained in the additional notes number 37 hence the leaf is liable to injury from much moisture on this surface and is destroyed by being smeared with oil in these respects resembling the lungs of animals or the spiracula of insects to prevent these injuries some leaves repel the dewdrops from their upper surfaces as those of cabbages other vegetables close the upper surfaces of their leaves together in the night or in wet weather as the sensitive plant others only hang their leaves downwards so as to shoot the wet from them as kidney beans and many trees see note on line eighteen of this canto End note. note golden bell line four hundred sixty there are muscles placed about the footstalks of the leaves or leaflets of many plants for the purpose of closing their upper surfaces together or of bending them down so as to shoot off the showers or dewdrops as mentioned in the preceding note the claws of the petals or of the divisions of the calyx of many flowers are furnished in a similar manner with muscles which are exerted to open or close the coral and calyx of the flower as in tragopogon anemone this action of opening and closing the leaves or flowers does not appear to be produced simply by irritation on the muscles themselves but by the connection of those muscles with a sensitive sensorium or brain existing in each individual bud or flower first because many flowers close from the defect of stimulus not by the excess of it as by darkness which is the absence of the stimulus of light or by cold which is the absence of the stimulus of heat now the defect of heat or the absence of food or of drink affects our sensations which had been previously accustomed to a greater quantity of them but a muscle cannot be said to be stimulated into action by a defect of stimulus two because the muscles around the footstalks of the subdivision of the leaves of the sensitive plant are exerted when any injury is offered to the other extremity of the leaf and some of the stamens of the flowers of the class syngenesia contract themselves when others are irritated see note on chondrilla volume two of this work from this circumstance the contraction of the muscles of vegetables seems to depend on a disagreeable sensation in some distant part and not on the irritation of the muscles themselves thus when a particle of dust stimulates the ball of the eye the eyelids are instantly closed and when too much light pains the retina muscles of the iris contract its aperture and this not by any connection or consent of the nerves of those parts but as an effort to prevent or to remove a disagreeable sensation which evinces that vegetables are endued with sensation or that each bud has a common sensorium and is furnished with a brain or a central place where its nerves are connected End note. so should young sympathy in female form climb the tall rock spectatress of the storm life's sinking wrecks with secret sighs deplore and bleed for others woes herself on shore to friendless virtue gasping on the strand bear her warm heart her virgin arms expand charm with kind looks with tender accents cheer and pour the sweet consolatory tear grief's cureless wounds with lenient balms assuage or prop with firmer staff the steps of age the lifted arm of mute despair arrest and snatch the dagger pointed to his breast or lull to slumber envy's haggard mien and rob her quivered shafts with hand unseen sound nymphs of helicon the trump of fame and teach hibernian echoes jones's name bind round her polished brow the civic bay 
and drag the fair philanthropist to day so from secluded springs and secret caves her liffy pours his bright meandering waves cools the parched vale the sultry mead divides and towns and temples star his shadowy sides note jones's name line four hundred seventy six a young lady who devotes a great part of an ample fortune to well-chosen acts of secret charity End note. thirteen call your light legions tread the swampy heath pierce with sharp spades your tremulous peat beneath with coulters bright the rushy sward bisect and in new veins the gushing rills direct so flowers shall rise in purple light arrayed and blossomed orchards stretch their silver shade admiring glebes their amber ears unfold and labor sleep amid the waving gold thus when young hercules with firm disdain braved the soft smiles of pleasure's harlot train to valiant toils his forceful limbs assigned and gave to virtue all his mighty mind fierce achilles rushed from mountain caves or sad aetolia poured his wasteful waves or lowering vales and bleating pastures rolled swept her red vineyards and her glebes of gold mined all her towns uptore her rooted woods and famine danced upon the shining floods the youthful hero seized his curled crest and dashed with lifted club the watery pest with waving arm the billowy tumult quelled and to his course the bellowing fiend repelled note fierce achilles line four hundred ninety five the river achilles deluged aetolia by one of its branches or arms which in the ancient languages are called horns and produced famine throughout a great tract of country this was represented in hieroglyphic emblems by the winding course of a serpent and the roaring of a bull with large horns hercules or the emblem of strength strangled the serpent and tore off one horn from the bull that is he stopped and turned the course of one arm of the river and restored plenty to the country whence the ancient emblem of the horn of plenty dict par monsieur danet End note. then to a snake the finny demon turned his lengthy form with scales of silver burned lashed with restless sweep his dragon train and shot meandering o'er the affrighted plain the hero god with giant fingers clasped firm round his neck the hissing monster grasped with starting eyes wide throat and gaping teeth curl his redundant folds and writhe in death and now a bull amid the flying throng the grisly demon foamed and roared along with silver hoofs the flowery meadows spurned rolled his red eye his threatening antlers turned dragged down to earth the warrior's victor hands pressed his deep dewlap on the imprinted sands then with quick bound his bended knee he fixed high on his neck the branching horns betwixt strained his strong arms his sinewy shoulders bent and from his curled brow the twisted terror rent pleased fawns and nymphs with dancing step applaud and hang their chaplets round the resting god link their soft hands and rear with pausing toil the golden trophy on the furrowed soil fill with ripe fruits with wreathed flowers adorn and give to plenty her prolific horn note dragged down to earth line five hundred seventeen described from an antique gem end note end of section twelve Section 13 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts. Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 3, lines 529 through 590. 14. On spring's fair lap, cerulean sisters pour from airy urns the sun-illumined shower. Feed with the dulcet drops my tender broods mellifluous flowers, and aromatic buds. 
hang from each bending grass and horrent thorn the tremulous pearl that glitters to the morn, or where cold dews their secret channels lave, and earth's dark chambers hide the stagnant wave, O pierce, ye nymphs, her marble veins, and lead her gushing fountains to the thirsty mead. Wide o'er the shining vales and trickling hills spread the bright treasure in a thousand rills. So shall my peopled realms of leaf and flower exult inebriate with the genial shower. Dip their long tresses from the mossy brink, with tufted roots the glassy current drink. Shade your cool mansions from meridian beams, and view their waving honors in your streams. Note. Spread the bright treasure. Line 540. The practice of flooding lands long in use in China has been but lately introduced into this country. Besides the supplying water to the herbage in drier seasons, it seems to defend it from frost in the early part of the year, and thus doubly advances the vegetation. The waters which rise from springs passing through marl or limestone are replete with calcareous earth, and when thrown over morasses, they deposit this earth and encrust or consolidate the morass. This kind of earth is deposited in great quantity from the springs at Matlock Bath, and supplies the soft porous limestone of which the houses and walls are there constructed, and has formed the whole bank for near a mile on that side of the Derwent on which they stand. The water of many springs contains much azotic gas or phlogistic air, besides carbonic gas or fixed air, as that of Buxton and Bath. This being set at liberty may more readily contribute to the production of nitre by means of the putrescent matters which it is exposed to by being spread upon the surface of the land, in the same manner as frequently turning over heaps of manure facilitates the nitrous process by imprisoning atmospheric air in the interstices of the putrescent materials. Water arising by land floods brings along with it much of the most soluble parts of the manure from the higher lands to the lower ones. River water in its clear state and those springs which are called soft are less beneficial for the purpose of watering lands as they contain less earthy or saline matter, and water from dissolving snow from its slow solution brings but little earth along with it, as may be seen by the comparative clearness of the water of snow floods. End note. Thus where the veins their confluent branches bend, and milky eddies with the purple blend, the child's white trunk, diverging from its source, seeks through the vital mass its shining course, or each red cell and tissued membrane spreads in living network all its branching threads. Maze within maze its tortuous path pursues, winds into glands, inextricable clues, steals through the stomach's velvet sides, and sips the silver surges with a thousand lips, fills each fine pore, pervades each slender hair, and drinks salubrious dewdrops from the air. Thus when to kneel in Mecca's awful gloom, or press with pious kiss Medina's tomb, League after league, through many a lingering day, steer the swart caravans their sultry way, or sandy waste on gasping camels toil, or print with pilgrim steps the burning soil. If from lone rocks a sparkling rill descend, or the green brink the kneeling nations bend, bathe the parched lip and cool the feverish tongue, and the clear lake reflects the mingled throng. The goddess paused. The listening bands awhile still seem to hear and dwell upon her smile. Then with soft murmur sweep in lucid trains down the green slopes and o'er the pebbly plains. To each bright stream on silver sandals glide, reflective fountain and tumultuous tide. So shoot the spider broods at breezy dawn their glittering network o'er the autumnal lawn. From blade to blade connect with cordage fine the unbending grass and live along the line, or bathe unwet their oily forms and dwell with feet repulsive on the dimpling well. So when the north congeals his watery mass, piles high his snows, 
and floors his seas with glass, while many a month, unknown to warmer rays, marks its slow chronicle by lunar days. Stout youth and ruddy damsels, sportive train, leave the white soil and rush upon the main. From isle to isle the moon-bright squadrons stray, and win in easy curves their graceful way. On step alternate borne, with balance nice, hang o'er the gliding steel, and hiss along the ice. End of section 13 Section 14 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 4, Lines 1 through 164. As when at noon in Hybla's fragrant bowers, Cacalia opens all her honeyed flowers, Contending swarms on bending branches cling, and nations hover on Aurelian wing. So round the goddess, ere she speaks, on high, impatient sylphs and gaudy circlets fly, quivering in air their painted plumes expand, and colored shadows dance upon the land. Note. Cacalia opens, line 2, the importance of the nectarium, or honey gland, in the vegetable economy, is seen from the very complicated apparatus which nature has formed in some flowers for the preservation of their honey from insects, as in the aconites or monks' hoods. In other plants, instead of a great apparatus for its protection, a greater secretion of it is produced that thence a part may be spared to the depredation of insects. The Cacalia suaveolens produces so much honey that on some days it may be smelt at a great distance from the plant, I remember once counting on one of these plants, besides bees of various kinds without number, above two hundred painted butterflies, which gave it the beautiful appearance of being covered with additional flowers. End note. 1. Sylphs, your light troops the tropic winds confine, and guide their streaming arrows to the line, while in warm floods ecliptic breezes rise, and sink with wings benumbed in colder skies. You bid monsoons on Indian seas reside, and veer, as moves the sun, their airy tide, while southern gales o'er western oceans roll, and Eurus steals his ice winds from the pole. Your playful trains on sultry islands borne turn on fantastic toe at eve and morn. With soft, susurrant voice alternate sweep Earth's green pavilions and encircling deep, Or, in itinerant cohorts, born sublime On tides of ether, float from clime to clime, Or waving autumn bend your airy ring, Or waft the fragrant bosom of the spring. Note. The Tropic Winds, line 9. See additional notes, number 33. End note. 2. When morn, escorted by the dancing hours, O'er the bright plains her dewy luster showers, Till from her sable chariot eve serene Drops the dark curtain o'er the brilliant scene, You form with chemic hands the airy surge, Mix with broad vans, with shadowy tridents urge. Sylphs, from each sunbright leaf that twinkling shakes O'er earth's green lap, or shoots amid her lakes, your playful bands with simpering lips invite, And wed the enamoured oxygen to light. Round their white necks with fingers interwove, Cling the fond pair with unabating love. Hand linked in hand on buoyant step they rise, And soar and glisten in unclouded skies. Whence in bright floods the vital air expands, And with concentric spheres involves the lands pervades the swarming seas and heaving earths, where teeming nature broods her myriad births, fills the fine lungs of all that breathe or bud, warms the new heart and dyes the gushing blood, with life's first spark inspires the organic frame, and, as it wastes, renews the subtle flame. Note. The Enamoured Oxygen, Line 34. 
The common air of the atmosphere appears by the analysis of Dr. Priestley and other philosophers to consist of about three parts of an elastic fluid unfit for respiration or combustion, called azote by the French school, and about one-fourth of pure vital air fit for the support of animal life and of combustion, called oxygen. The principal source of the azote is probably from the decomposition of all vegetable and animal matters by putrefaction and combustion. The principal source of vital air, or oxygen, is perhaps from the decomposition of water in the organs of vegetables by means of the sun's light. The difficulty of injecting vegetable vessels seems to show that their perspirative pores are much less than those of animals, and that the water which constitutes their perspiration is so divided at the time of its exclusion that by means of the sun's light it becomes decomposed. The inflammable air, or hydrogen, which is one of its constituent parts, being retained to form the oil, resin, wax, honey, etc., of the vegetable economy and the other part, which united with light or heat becomes vital air or oxygen gas, rises into the atmosphere and replenishes it with the food of life. Dr. Priestley has evinced by very ingenious experiments that the blood gives out phlogiston and receives vital air or oxygen gas by the lungs, and Dr. Crawford has shown that the blood acquires heat from this vital air in respiration. There is, however, still a something more subtle than heat, which must be obtained in respiration from the vital air, a something which life cannot exist a few minutes without, which seems necessary to the vegetable as well as to the animal world, and which, as no organized vessels can confine it, requires perpetually to be renewed. See note on Canto 1, line 401. End note. So pure, so soft, with sweet attraction shone, fair Psyche, kneeling at the ethereal throne. One with coy smiles the admiring court of Jove, and warmed the bosom of unconquered love. Beneath a moving shade of fruits and flowers, onward they march to Hymen's sacred bowers. With lifted touch he lights the festive train, sublime, and leads them in his golden chain joins the fond pair, indulgent to their vows, and hides with mystic veil their blushing brows. Round their fair forms their mingling arms they fling, meet with warm lip, and clasp with rustling wing. Hence plastic nature, as oblivion whelms her fading forms, repeoples all her realms. Soft joys disport on purple plumes unfurled, and love and beauty rule the willing world. Note, Fair Psyche, line 48, described from an ancient gem on a fine onyx, in possession of the Duke of Marlborough, of which there is a beautiful print in Bryant's Mythology, volume 2, page 392, and from another ancient gem of Cupid and Psyche embracing, of which there is a print in Spence's Polymetis, page 82. End note. Note, repeoples all her realms, line 60, Que mare navigerum et terras frugiferentis concelebras, per te quoniam genus omni animantum concipitur, visitque exhortum lumina folis. Lucretius. End note. 3. 1. Sylphs, your bold myriads on the withering heath, stay the fell Sirach's suffocating breath. Arrest Simum in his realms of sand, the poisoned javelin balanced in his hand. Fierce on blue streams he rides the tainted air, points his keen eye, and waves his whistling hair, while, as he turns, the undulating soil rolls in red waves, and billowy deserts boil. Note. Arrest Simum, line 65. Quote. At eleven o'clock, while we were with great pleasure contemplating the rugged tops of Chigre, where we expected to solace ourselves with plenty of good water, Idris cried out with a loud voice, quote, Fall upon your faces, for here is the Simum. Unquote. I saw from the southeast a haze come in color like the purple part of a rainbow, but not so compressed or thick. It did not occupy twenty yards in breadth, and was about twelve feet high from the ground. 
It was a kind of blush upon the air, and it moved very rapidly, for I scarce could turn to fall upon the ground with my head to the northward, when I felt the heat of its current plainly upon my face. We all lay flat upon the ground, as if dead, till Idris told us it was blown over. The meteor, or purple haze, which I saw was indeed past, but the light air that still blew was of heat to threaten suffocation. For my part I found distinctly in my breast that I had imbibed a part of it, nor was I free of an asthmatic sensation till I had been some months in Italy. Unquote. Bruce's Travels, Volume 4, page 557. It is difficult to account for the narrow track of this pestilential wind, which is said not to exceed twenty yards, and for its small elevation of twelve feet. A whirlwind will pass forwards and throw down an avenue of trees by its quick revolution as it passes, but nothing like a whirling is described as happening in these narrow streams of air, and whirlwinds ascend to greater heights. There seems but one known manner in which this channel of air could be affected, and that is by electricity. The volcanic origin of these winds is mentioned in the note on Chunda in Volume 2 of this work. It must be added that Professor Viro at Naples found that during the eruption of Vesuvius perpendicular iron bars were electric, and others have observed suffocating damps to attend these eruptions. Ferber's Travels in Italy, page 133. And lastly, that a current of air attends the passage of electric matter, as is seen in presenting an electrized point to the flame of a candle. In Mr. Bruce's account of this simum, it was in its course over a quite dry desert of sand, and which was in consequence unable to conduct an electric stream into the earth beneath it, to some moist rocks at but a few miles distance and thence would appear to be a stream of electricity from a volcano attended with noxious air, and as the bodies of Mr. Bruce and his attendants were insulated on the sand, they would not be sensible of their increased electricity as it passed over them, to which it may be added that a sulfurous or suffocating sensation is said to accompany flames of lightning and even strong sparks of artificial electricity. In the above account of the simum, a great redness in the air is said to be a certain sign of its approach, which may be occasioned by the eruption of flame from a distant volcano in these extensive and impenetrable deserts of sand. See note on line 294 of this canto. End note. You seize tornado by his locks of mist, burst his dense clouds, his wheeling spires untwist, wide o'er the west when borne on headlong gales, Dark as meridian night, the monster sails, howls in high air, and shakes his curled brow, lashing with serpent train the waves below, whirls his back arm, the forked lightning flings, and showers a deluge from his demon wings. Note, Tornadoes, lines 71. See additional notes, number 33. End note. 2. Sylphs. With light shafts you pierce the drowsy fog that lingering slumbers on the sedgewove bog. With webbed feet o'er midnight meadows creeps, or flings his hairy limbs on stagnant deeps. You meet contagion issuing from afar, and dash the baleful conqueror from his car, when, guest of death, from charnel vaults he steals, and bathes in human gore his armed wheels. Note, on stagnant deeps, line 82, all contiguous miasmata originate either from animal bodies as those of the smallpox or from putrid morasses. These latter produce agues in the colder climates and malignant fevers in the warmer ones. The volcanic vapors which cause epidemic coughs are to be ranked amongst poisons rather than amongst the miasmata which produce contagious diseases. End note. Thus when the plague, upborne on Belgian air, looked through the mist and shook his clotted hair, or shrieking nations steered malignant clouds and rained destruction on the gasping crowds, the beauteous eagly felt the venomed dart, Slow rolled her eye, and feebly throbbed her heart. Each fervid sigh seemed shorter than the last, 
and starting friendship shunned her as she passed. With weak unsteady step the fainting maid seeks the cold garden's solitary shade, sinks on the pillowy moss her drooping head, and prints with lifeless limbs her leafy bed. On wings of love her plighted swain pursues, shades her from winds and shelters her from dews, extends on tapering poles the canvas roof, spreads o'er the straw-wove mat the flaxen woof, sweet buds and blossoms on her bolster strows, and binds his kerchief round her aching brows, soothes with soft kiss, with tender accents charms, and clasps the bright infection in his arms. With pale and languid smiles the grateful fair applauds his virtues, and rewards his care. Mourns with wet cheek her fair companions fled on timorous step or numbered with the dead, calls to its bosom all its scattered rays, and pours on Thyrsus the collected blaze, braves the chill night, caressing and caressed, and folds her hero lover to her breast. Less bold, Leander at the dusky hour eyed as he swam the far love lighted tower breasted with struggling arms the tossing wave, and sunk benighted in the watery grave. Less bold, Tobias claimed the nuptial bed, where seven fond lovers by a fiend had bled, and drove, instructed by his angel guide, the enamoured demon from the fatal bride. Sylphs, while your winnowing pinions fanned the air, and shed gay visions o'er the sleeping pair. Love round their couch effused his rosy breath, and with his keener arrows conquered death. Note. The Beauteous Eagly, line 91. When the plague raged in Holland in 1636, a young girl was seized with it, had three carbuncles, and was removed to a garden, where her lover, who was betrothed to her, attended her as a nurse, and slept with her as his wife. He remained uninfected, and she recovered, and was married to him. The story is related by Vincentus Fabricius in the miscellaneous Cur and to Obs 188. End note. 4. 1. You charmed indulgent sylphs, their learned toil, and crowned with fame your Taurus cell and boil. Taught with sweet smiles, responsive to their prayer, The spring and pressure of the viewless air, How up-exhausted tubes bright currents flow Of liquid silver from the lake below, Weigh the long column of the incumbent skies, And with the changeful moment fall and rise, How, as in brazen pumps the pistons move, The membrane valve sustains the weight above, Stroke follows stroke, the gelid vapor falls, and misty dewdrops dim the crystal walls. Rare and more rare expands the fluid thin, and silence dwells with vacancy within. So in the mighty void, with grim delight, primeval silence reigned with ancient night. Note. Torricel and Boyle, line 128. The pressure of the atmosphere was discovered by Torricelli, a disciple of Galileo who had previously found that the air had weight. Dr. Hook and Monsieur du Hamel ascribed the invention of the air pump to Mr. Boyle, who however confesses he had some hints concerning its construction from de Garrick. The vacancy at the summit of the barometer is termed the Torricellian vacuum, and the exhausted receiver of an air pump the Boylean vacuum, in honor of these two philosophers. The mist and descending dew, which appear at first exhausting the receiver of an air pump, are explained in the Philosophical Transactions, Volume 78, from the cold produced by the expansion of air. For a thermometer placed in the receiver sinks some degrees, and in a very little time, as soon as a sufficient quantity of heat can be acquired from the surrounding bodies, the dew becomes again taken up. See additional notes number 7. Mr. Saussure observed on placing his hygrometer in a receiver of an air pump 
that though on beginning to exhaust it the air became misty and parted with its moisture, yet the hair of his hygrometer contracted, and the instrument pointed to greater dryness. This unexpected occurrence is explained by M. Monga, Annales de Chimie, Toma, 5. To depend on the want of the usual pressure of the atmosphere to force the aqueous particles into the pores of the hair, and M. Saussure supposes that his vesicular vapor requires more time to be redissolved than is necessary to dry the hair of his thermometer. Essays sur le hygrometrie, page 226. But I suspect there is a less hypothetical way of understanding it. When a colder body is brought into warm and moist air, as a bottle of spring water, for instance, a steam is quickly collected on its surface. The contrary occurs when a warmer body is brought into cold and damp air. It continues free from dew so long as it continues warm, for it warms the atmosphere around it, and renders it capable of receiving instead of parting with moisture. The moment the air becomes rarefied in the receiver of the air pump, it becomes colder, as appears by the thermometer, and deposits its vapor. But the hair of Mr. Saussure's hygrometer is now warmer than the air in which it is immersed, and in consequence becomes drier than before, by warming the air which immediately surrounds it, a part of its moisture evaporating along with its heat. End note. 2. Sylphs, your soft voices whispering from the skies, bade from low earth the bold Mongulfier rise, outstretched his buoyant ball with airy spring, and bore the sage on levity of wing. Where were ye, sylphs, when on the ethereal main young Rossier launched and called your aid in vain? Fair mounts the light balloon, the zephyr driven, parts the thin clouds and sails along the heaven, Higher and yet higher the expanding bubble flies, lights with quick flash and bursts amid the skies. Headlong he rushes through the affrighted air with limbs distorted and disheveled hair, whirls round and round, the flying crowd alarms, and death receives him in his sable arms. So erst with melting wax and loosened strings sunk hapless Icarus on unfaithful wings, his scattered plumage danced upon the wave, and sorrowing mermaids decked his watery grave. O'er his pale course their pearly sea-flowers shed, and strewed with crimson moss his marble bed. Struck in their coral towers the pausing bell, and wide in ocean tolled his echoing knell. Note. Young Rosier launched. Line 148. Monsieur Pilatre du Rossier, with a Monsieur Romain, rose in a balloon from Bologna in June 1785, and after having been about a mile high for about half an hour, the balloon took fire, and the two adventurers were dashed to pieces on their fall to the ground. Mr. Rossier was a philosopher of great talents and activity, joined with such urbanity and elegance of manners as conciliated the affections of his acquaintance and rendered his misfortune universally lamented. Annual Register for 1784 and 1785, page 329. End note. Note. And in wide ocean, line 164. Denser bodies propagate vibration or sound better than rarer ones. If two stones be struck together under the water, they may be heard a mile or two by any one whose head is immersed at that distance, according to an experiment of Dr. Franklin. If the ear be applied to one end of a long beam of timber, the stroke of a pin at the other end becomes sensible. If a poker be suspended in the middle of a garter, each end of which is pressed against the ear, the least percussions on the poker give great sounds. I am informed by laying the ear on the ground, the tread of a horse may be discerned at a great distance in the night, the organs of hearing belonging to fish are for this reason much less complicated than of quadrupeds, as the fluid they are immersed in so much better conveys its vibrations, and it is probable that some shellfish which have 
twisted shells like the cochlea and semicircular canals of the ears of men, and quadrupeds may have no appropriated organ for perceiving the vibrations of the element they live in, but may by their spiral form be in a manner all ear. End note. End of section 14. Section 15 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 4, lines 165 through 358. 5. Sylphs, you, retiring to sequestered bowers, where oft your priestly woos your airy powers, on noiseless step or quivering pinion glide, as sits the sage with science by his side, to his charmed eye in gay undress appear, or pour your secrets on his raptured ear. How nitrous gas from iron ingots driven drinks with red lips the purest breath of heaven, how, while conferva from his tender hair gives in bright bubbles empyrean air, the crystal floods phlogistic ores calcine, and the pure ether marries with the mine. Note, we're off to your Priestley, line 166. The fame of Dr. Priestley is known in every part of the earth where science has penetrated. His various discoveries respecting the analysis of the atmosphere and the production of a variety of new airs or gases can only be clearly understood by reading his Experiments on Airs, three volumes, octavo, Johnson, London. The following are amongst his many discoveries. 1. The discovery of nitrous and dephlogisticated airs. 2. The exhibition of the acids and alkalis in the form of air. 3. Ascertaining the purity of respirable air by nitrous air. 4. The restoration of vitiated air by vegetation. 5. The influence of light to enable vegetables to yield pure air. 6. The conversion by means of light of animal and vegetable substances that would otherwise become putrid and offensive into nourishment of vegetables. 7. The use of respiration by the blood parting with phlogiston and imbibing dephlogisticated air. The experiments here alluded to are 1. Concerning the production of nitrous gas from dissolving iron and many other metals in nitrous acid, which though first discovered by Dr. Hales, Static S, Volume 1, page 224, was fully investigated and applied to the important purpose of distinguishing the purity of atmospheric air by Dr. Priestley. When about two measures of common air and one of nitrous gas are mixed together, a red effervescence takes place, and the two airs occupy about one-fourth less space than was previously occupied by the common air alone. 2. Concerning the green substance which grows at the bottom of reservoirs of water, which Dr. Priestley discovered to yield much pure air when the sun shone on it, his method of collecting this air is by placing over the green substance, which he believes to be a vegetable of the genus Conferva, an inverted bell glass previously filled with water, which subsides as the air arises. It has since been found that all vegetables give up pure air from their leaves when the sun shines upon them, but not in the night, which may be owing to the sleep of the plant. 3. The third refer to the great quantity of pure air contained in the calces of metals. The calces were long known to weigh much more than the metallic bodies before calcination, insomuch that 100 pounds of lead will produce 112 pounds of minimum. The ore of manganese, which is always found near the surface of the earth, is replete with pure air, which is now used for the purpose of bleaching. Other metals, when exposed to the atmosphere, attract the pure air from it, and become calces by its combination, as zinc, lead, iron, and increase in weight in proportion to the air which they imbibe. End note. So in Sicilia's ever-blooming shade, when playful proserpine from Ceres strayed, led with unwary step her virgin trains o'er Etna's steeps and Enna's golden plains, plucked with fair hand the silver-blossomed bower, 
and purpled mead, herself a fairer flower. Sudden, unseen amid the twilight glade, rushed gloomy dis and seized the trembling maid. Her starting damsels sprung from mossy seats, dropped from their gauzy laps the gathered sweets, clung round the struggling nymph with piercing cries, pursued the chariot and invoked the skies. Pleased as he grasps her in his iron arms, frights with soft sighs, with tender words alarms, the wheels descending rolled in smoky rings, infernal cupids flapped their demon wings, earth with deep yawn received the fair, amazed, and far in night celestial beauty blazed. Note when playful proserpine line 178 the fable of proserpine being seized by pluto as she was gathering flowers is explained by lord bacon to signify the combination or marriage of ethereal spirit with earthly materials bacon's works volume 5 page 470 edit 4 to london 1778 this allusion is still more curiously exact from the late discovery of pure air being given up from vegetables, and that then in its unmixed state it more readily combines with metallic or inflammable bodies. From these fables, which were probably taken from ancient hieroglyphics, there is frequently reason to believe that the Egyptians possessed much chemical knowledge, which for want of alphabetical writing perished with their philosophers. End note. 6. Led by the sage, lo, Britain's sons shall guide huge sea balloons beneath the tossing tide, the diving castles, roofed with spheric glass, ribbed with strong oak, and barred with bolts of brass, buoyed with pure air, shall endless tracks pursue, and priestly's hand the vital flood renew. Then shall Britannia rule the wealthy realms, which ocean's wide insatiate wave o'erwhelms confine in netted bowers his scaly flocks part his blue plains and people all his rocks deep in warm waves beneath the line that roll beneath the shadowy ice isles of the pole onward through bright meandering vales afar obedient sharks shall trail her sceptred car with harnessed necks the pearly flood disturb stretch the silk rein and champ the silver curb Pleased round her triumph wandering tritons play, And sea-maids hail her on the watery way. Oft shall she weep beneath the crystal waves, O'er shipwrecked lovers weltering in their graves. Mingling in death the brave and good behold With slaves to glory, and with slaves to gold. Shrined in the deep shall day and spalding mourn, Each in his treacherous bell, sepulchral urn, Oft o'er thy lovely daughters hapless pierce, Her sights shall breathe, her sorrows dew their hearse. With brow upturned to heaven, we will not part, he cried, And clasped them to his aching heart. Dashed in dread conflict on the rocky grounds, Crash the mocked masts, the staggering wreck rebounds. Through gaping seams the rushing deluge swims, chills their pale bosoms, bathes their shuddering limbs, climbs their white shoulders, buoys their streaming hair, and the last sea-shriek bellows in the air. Each with loud sobs her tender sire caressed, and gasping strained him closer to her breast. Stretched on one bier they sleep beneath the brine, and their white bones with ivory arms entwine. Note led by the sage, line 195, Dr. Priestley's discovery of the production of pure air from such variety of substances will probably soon be applied to the improvement of the diving bell, as the substances which contain vital air in immense quantities are of little value as manganese and minimum. See additional notes number 33. In every hundred weight of minimum, there is combined about 12 pounds of pure air, now, as sixty pounds of water are about a cubic foot, and as air is eight hundred times lighter than water, five hundred weight of minimum will produce eight hundred cubic feet of air, or about six thousand gallons. Now, as this is at least thrice as pure as atmospheric air, 
a gallon of it may be supposed to serve for three minutes respiration for one man at present the air cannot be set at liberty from minimum by vitriolic acid without the application of some heat this is however very likely soon to be discovered and will then enable adventurers to journey beneath the ocean in large inverted ships or diving balloons. Mr. Boyle relates that Cornelius Drebel contrived not only a vessel to be rowed under water, but also a liquor to be carried in that vessel, which would supply the want of fresh air. The vessel was made by order of James I, and carried twelve rowers besides passengers. It was tried in the river Thames, and one of the persons who was in that submarine voyage told the particulars of the experiments to a person who related them to Mr. Boyle. Annual Register for 1774, page 248. End note. Note. Day and Spalding Morn, line 217. Mr. Day perished in a diving bell or diving boat of his own construction at Plymouth in June 1774, in which he was to have continued for a wager twelve hours one hundred feet deep in water, and probably perished from his not possessing all the hydrostatic knowledge that was necessary. See note on Ulva, volume two of this work. See annual register for 1774, page 245. Mr. Spaulding was professionally ingenious in the art of constructing and managing the diving bell, and had practiced the business many years with success. He went down, accompanied by one of his young men, twice to view the wreck of the Imperial East Indiaman at the Kish Bank in Ireland. On descending the third time in June 1783, they remained about an hour under water, and had two barrels of air sent down to them, but on the signals from below not being again repeated, after a certain time, they were drawn up by their assistants and both found dead in the bell. Annual Register for 1783, page 206. These two unhappy events may for a time check the ardor of adventurers in traversing the bottom of the ocean, but it is probable in another half-century it may be safer to travel under the ocean than over it, since Dr. Priestley's discovery of procuring pure air in such great abundance from the calces of metals. End note. Note. Hapless Pierce, line 219. The Hasluel East Indiaman, outward bound, was wrecked off Seacombe in the Isle of Purbeck on the 6th of January, 1786, when Captain Pierce, the commander, with two young ladies, his daughters, and the greatest part of the crew and passengers perished in the sea. Some of the officers and about seventy seamen escaped with great difficulty on the rocks, but Captain Pierce, finding it was impossible to save the lives of the young ladies, refused to quit the ship and perished with them. End note. 7. Sylphs of nice ear, with beating wings you guide the fine vibrations of the aerial tide. Join in sweet cadences the measured words, or stretch and modulate the trembling chords. You strung to melody the Grecian lyre, breathed the rapt song and fanned the thought of fire or brought in combinations deep and clear immortal harmony to handel's ear you with soft breath attune the vernal gale when breezy evening broods the listening vale or wake the loud tumultuous sounds that dwell in echo's many-toned diurnal shell you melt in dulcet chords when zephyr rings the aeolian harp and mingle all its strings, or trill in air the soft symphonious chime when rapt Cecilia lifts her eyes sublime, swell as she breathes her bosom's rising snow, or her white teeth in tuneful accents slow, through her fair lips on whispering pinions move, and form the tender sighs that kindle love. So playful love on Ida's flowery sides with ribbon rain the indignant lion guides, pleased on his brindled back the lyre he rings, and shakes delirious rapture from the strings. Slow as the pausing monarch stalks along, sheathes his retractile claws and drinks the song. Soft nymphs on timid step the triumph view, and listening fawns with beating hooves pursue. 
With pointed ears the alarmed forest starts, And love and music soften savage hearts. Note. Indignant Lion Guides, line 254, described from an ancient gem, expressive of the combined power of love and music in the Museum Florent. End note. 8. Sylphs, your bold hosts, when heaven with justice dread calls the red tempest round the guilty head, fierce at his nod assume vindictive forms and launch from airy cars the volleyed storms. From Asher's vales, when proud Sennacherib trod, poured his swollen heart, defied the living God, urged with incessant shouts his glittering powers, and Judah shook through all her massy towers. Round her sad altars pressed the prostrate crowd, hosts beat their breasts, and suppliant chieftains bowed. Loud shrieks of matrons thrilled the troubled air, and trembling virgins rent their scattered hair. High in the midst the kneeling king adored, spread the blaspheming scroll before the Lord, raised his pale hands and breathed his pausing sighs, and fixed on heaven his dim imploring eyes. O oh, mighty God, amidst thy seraph throng, who sitst sublime, the judge of right and wrong, thine the wide earth, bright sun and starry zone that twinkling journey round thy golden throne thine is the crystal source of life and light and thine the realms of death's eternal night o oh, bend thine ear thy gracious eye incline lo ashur king blasphemes thy holy shrine insults our offerings and derides our vows Oh, strike the diadem from his impious brows, tear from his murderous hand the bloody rod, and teach the trembling nations, Thou art God. Sylphs, in what dread array with pennons broad onward ye floated o'er the ethereal road, called each dank steam the reeking marsh exhales, contagious vapors and volcanic gales, gave the soft south with poisonous breath to blow and rolled the dreadful whirlwind on the foe hark o'er the camp the venomed tempest sings man falls on man on buckler buckler rings groan answers groan to anguish anguish yields and death's loud accents shake the tented fields high rears the fiend his grinning jaws and wide spans the pale nations with colossal stride, waves his broad falchion with uplifted hand, and his vast shadow darkens all the land. Note, Volcanic Gales, line 294. The pestilential winds of the east are described by various authors under various denominations, as Harmatan, Samael, Samium, Siraka, Kazmin, Saravansum, Monsieur de Beauchamp, describes a remarkable south wind in the deserts about Baghdad called Saravansum, or poison wind. It burns the face, impedes respiration, strips the trees of their leaves, and is said to pass on in a straight line, and often kills people in six hours. P. Cotta sur la météoro, analytical review, for February 1790. Monsieur Volney says the hot wind or ramson seems to blow at the season when the sands of the deserts are the hottest. The air is then filled with an extremely subtle dust. Volume 1, page 61. These winds blow in all directions from the deserts. In Egypt, the most violent proceed from the south by southwest, at Mecca from the east, at Surat from the north, at Basra from the northwest, at Baghdad from the west, and in Syria from the southeast. On the south of Syria, he adds, where the Jordan flows is a country of volcanoes, and it is observed that the earthquakes in Syria happen after their rainy season, which is also conformable to a similar observation made by Dr. Shaw in Barbary. Travels in Egypt, volume 1, page 303. These winds seem all to be of volcanic origin, as before mentioned, with this difference, that the simum is attended with a stream of electric matter. They seem to be in consequence of earthquakes caused by the monsoon floods, 
which fall on volcanic fires in Syria at the same time that they inundate the Nile. End note. 9. 1. Ethereal cohorts, essences of air, make the green children of the spring your care. O sylphs, disclose on this inquiring age one golden secret to some favored sage. Grant the charmed talisman, the chain that binds, or guides the chainful pinions of the winds. No more shall hoary Boreas, issuing forth with Eurus, lead the tempests of the north. Rhyme the pale dawn, or veiled in flaky showers, chill the sweet bosoms of the smiling hours. By whispering Oster waked shall Zephyr rise, meet with soft kiss, and mingle in the skies. Fan the gay floret, bend the yellow ear, and rock the uncurtained cradle of the year. Autumn and spring in lively union blend, and from the skies the golden age descend. Note. One Golden Secret, line 308. The suddenness of the change of the wind from northeast to southwest seems to show that it depends on some minute chemical cause, which, if it was discovered, might probably, like other chemical causes, be governed by human agency, such as blowing up rocks by gunpowder or extracting the lightning from the clouds. If this could be accomplished, it would be the most happy discovery that has ever happened to these northern latitudes, since in this country the northeast winds bring frost, and the southwest ones are attended with warmth and moisture. If the inferior currents of air could be kept perpetually from the southwest, supplied by new productions of air at the line, or by superior currents flowing in a contrary direction, the vegetation of this country would be doubled, as in the moist valleys of Africa, which know no frost. The number of its inhabitants would be increased, and their lives prolonged as great abundance of the aged and infirm of mankind, as well as many birds and animals, are destroyed by severe continued frosts in this climate. End note. 2. Castled on ice, beneath the circling bear, a vast chameleon spits and swallows air, or twelve degrees his ribs gigantic bend, and many a league his leathern jaws extend, half fish beneath his scaly volutes spread, and vegetable plumage crests his head, huge fields of air his wrinkled skin receives, from panting gills, wide lungs, and waving leaves. Then with dread throes subsides his bloated form, his shriek the thunder, and his sigh the storm. Oft high in heaven the hissing demon winds his towering course, upborne on winnowing fins steers with expanded eye and gaping mouth, his mass enormous to the affrighted south, spreads o'er the shuddering line his shadowy limbs, and frost and famine follow as he swims. Sylphs, round his cloud-built couch your bands array, and mould the monster to your gentle sway, charm with soft tones, with tender touches check, bend to your golden yoke his willing neck, with silver curb his yielding teeth restrain, and give to Kirwan's hand the silken rein. Pleased shall the sage, the dragon wings between, bend o'er discordant climes his eyes serene, with Lapland breezes cool Arabian vales, and call to Hindustan Antarctic gales, adorn with wreathed ears Kamshatka's brows, and scatter roses on Zealandic snows. Earth's wandering zones the genial seasons share, and nations hail him monarch of the air. Note. A vast chameleon. Line 322. See additional notes, number 33, on the destruction and reproduction of the atmosphere. End note. Note. To Kerwin's hand, line 342. Mr. Kerwin has published a valuable treatise on the temperature of climates, as a step towards investigating the theory of the winds, and has since written some ingenious papers on this subject in the transactions of the Royal Irish Society. End note. 10. 1. Sylphs, as you hover on ethereal wing, brood the green children of parturient spring, where in their bursting cells my embryons rest. I charge you guard the vegetable nest, 
Count with nice eye the myriad seeds that swell each vaulted womb of husk or pod or shell. Feed with sweet juices, clothe with downy hair, or hang enshrined their little orbs in air. Note. The myriad seeds, line 355. Nature would seem to have been wonderfully prodigal in the seeds of vegetables and the spawn of fish. Almost any one plant, if all its seeds should grow to maturity, would in a few years alone people the terrestrial globe. Mr. Ray asserts that 101 seeds of tobacco weighed only one grain, and that from one tobacco plant the seeds thus calculated amounted to 360,000. The seeds of the ferns are by him supposed to exceed a million on a leaf. As the works of nature are governed by general laws, this exuberant reproduction prevents the accidental extinction of the species, at the same time that they serve for food for the higher orders of animation. Every seed possesses a reservoir of nutriment designed for the growth of the future plant. This consists of starch, mucilage, or oil within the coat of the seed, or of sugar and subacid pulp in the fruits which belongs to it. For the preservation of the immature seed, nature has used many ingenious methods. Some are wrapped in down, as the seeds of the rose, bean, and cotton plant. Others are suspended in a large air vessel, as those of the bladder sina, staphylaea, and pea. End note. End of section 15. Section 16 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 4, lines 359 through 484. So, late described by Herschel's piercing sight, hang the bright squadrons of the twinkling night. Ten thousand marshalled stars, a silver zone, effuse their blended lustres round her throne. Suns call to suns, in lucid clouds conspire, and light exterior skies with golden fire. Resistless rolls the illimitable sphere, and one great circle forms the unmeasured year. Roll on, ye stars, exult in youthful prime. Mark with bright curves the printless steps of time. Near and more near your beamy cars approach, and lessening orbs on lessening orbs encroach. Flowers of the sky, ye too to age must yield, frail as your silken sisters of the field. Star after star from heaven's high arch shall rush. Suns sink on suns, and systems, systems crush. Headlong, extinct, to one dark center fall, And death and night and chaos mingle all. Till o'er the wreck, emerging from the storm, Immortal nature lifts her changeful form, Mounts from her funeral pyre on wings of flame, And soars and shines, another and the same. Note, and light exterior, line 364. I suspect this line is from Dwight's Conquest of Canaan, a poem written by a very young man, and which contains much fine versification. End note. Note. Near and more near. Line 369. From the vacant spaces in some parts of the heavens, and the correspondent clusters of stars in their vicinity, Mr. Herschel concludes that the nebulae, or constellations of fixed stars, are approaching each other, and must finally coalesce in one mass. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 75. End note. Note. Till o'er the wreck. Line 377. The story of the phoenix rising from its own ashes with a twinkling star upon its head seems to have been an ancient hieroglyphic emblem of the destruction and resuscitation of all things. There is a figure of the great platonic year with the phoenix on his hand, on the reverse of a medal of Adrian. Spence's Polymetus, page 189. End note. 2. Lo, on each seed within its slender rind, life's golden threads in endless circles wind. Maze within maze the lucid webs are rolled, 
and as they burst the living flame unfold the pulpy acorn ere it swells contains the oak's vast branches in its milky veins each raveled bud fine film and fibre line traced with nice pencil on the small design the young narcissus in its bulb compressed cradles a second nestling on its breast in whose fine arms a younger embryon lies folds its thin leaves and shuts its floret eyes grain within grain successive harvests dwell and boundless forests slumber in a shell so yon grey precipice and ivied towers long winding meads and intermingled bowers green files of poplars o'er the lake that bow and glimmering wheel which rolls and foams below in one bright point with nice distinction lie planed on the moving tablet of the eye so fold on fold earth's wavy plains extend and sphere in sphere its hidden strata bend incumbent spring her beamy plumes expands o'er restless oceans and impatient lands with genial lustres warms the mighty ball and the great seed evolves disclosing all life buds or breathes from indus to the poles and the vast surface kindles as it rolls note maze within maze line three hundred eighty three the elegant appearance on dissection of a young tulip in the bulb was first observed by marriott and is mentioned in the note on tulipa in volume two and was afterwards noticed by duhamel academy of sciences leuwenhoek assures us that in the bud of a currant tree he could not only discover the ligonous part but even the berries themselves appearing like small grapes chambers dictionary article bud mr baker says he dissected a seed of trembling grass in which a perfect plant appeared with its root sending forth two branches from each of which several leaves or blades of grass proceeded microscopy volume one page two hundred fifty two mr bonnet saw four generations of successive plants in the bulb of a hyacinth bonnet core organ volume one page one hundred three Haller's Physiology, Volume 1, page 91. In the terminal bud of a horse chestnut, the new flower may be seen by the naked eye covered with a mucilaginous down, and the same in the bulb of a narcissus, as I this morning observed in several of them sent me by Miss Blank for that purpose, September 16th. Mr. Ferber speaks of the pleasure he received in observing the buds of Hepatica and Pedicularis hirsuta, yet lying hid in the earth, and in the gems of the shrub Daphne miserion, and at the base of Osmunda lunaria, a perfect plant of the future year, discernible in all its parts a year before it comes forth, and in the seeds of Nymphaea nelumbo, the leaves of the plant were seen so distinctly that the author found out by them what plant the seeds belonged to the same of the seeds of the tulip tree or liriodendum tulipiferum amaean essed volume six end note note and the great seed line four hundred six alluding to the greek proton oon or first great egg of the ancient philosophy it had a serpent wrapped round it emblematical of divine wisdom an image of it was afterwards preserved and worshipped in the temple of Dioscuri, and supposed to represent the egg of Leda. See a print of it in Bryant's mythology. It was said to have been broken by the horns of the celestial bull, that is, it was hatched by the warmth of the spring. See note on Canto 1, line 413. End note. Note. And the vast surface, line 408. La organisation, le sentiment, le mouvement spontané, la vie n'existent qu'à la surface de la terre et dans le lieu exposé à la lumière. Traité de chimie par M. Lavoisier, tome 1, page 202. End note. 3. Come, ye soft sylphs who sport on Latian land. Come, sweet lipped zephyr and favonius bland teach the fine seed 
instinct with life, to shoot on earth's cold bosom its descending root, with pith elastic stretch its rising stem, part the twin lobes, expand the throbbing gem, clasp in your airy arms the aspiring plume, fan with your balmy breath its kindling bloom, each widening scale and bursting film unfold, swell the green cup and tint the flower with gold while in bright veins the silvery sap ascends, and refluent blood in milky eddies bends, while spread in air the leaves respiring play, or drink the golden quintessence of day. So from his shell on Delta's showerless isle bursts into life the monster of the Nile, first in translucent lymph with cobweb threads, the brain's fine floating tissue swells and spreads, Nerve after nerve the glistening spine descends, The red heart dances, the aorta bends, Through each new gland the purple current glides, New veins meandering drink the refluent tides, Edge over edge expands the hardening scale, And sheathes his slimy skin in silver mail. Earwhile, emerging from the brooding sand, With tiger paw he prints the brineless strand, High on the flood with speckled bosom swims, Helmed with broad tail and oared with giant limbs, Rolls his fierce eyeballs, clasps his iron claws, And champs with gnashing teeth his massy jaws. Old Nihilus sighs along his cane-crowned shores, And swarthy Memphis trembles and adores. Note, Teach the Fine Seed, line 411. The seeds, in their natural state, fall on the surface of the earth, and having absorbed some moisture, the root shoots itself downwards into the earth, and the plume rises in air, thus each endeavoring to seek its proper pabulum, directed by a vegetable irritability similar to that of the lacteal system and to the lungs in animals. The pith seems to push up or elongate the bud by its elasticity, like the pith in the callow quills of birds. The medulla, Linnaeus believes, to consist of a bundle of fibers, which diverging breaks to the bark, yet gelatinous producing the buds. The lobes are reservoirs of prepared nutriment for the young seed, which is absorbed by its placental vessels, and converted into sugar, till it has penetrated with its roots far enough into the earth to extract sufficient moisture, and has acquired leaves to convert it into nourishment. In some plants these lobes rise from the earth and supply the place of leaves, as in kidney beans, cucumbers, and hence seem to serve both as a placenta to the fetus and lungs to the young plant. During the process of germination, the starch of the seed is converted into sugar, as is seen in the process of malting barley for the purpose of brewing and is on this account very similar to the digestion of food in the stomachs of animals, which converts all their aliment into a chyle, which consists of mucilage, oil, and sugar. The placentation of buds will be spoken of hereafter. End note. Note. The Silvery Sap, line 419. See additional notes, number 36. End note. Note. Or Drink the Golden, line 422. Linnaeus, having observed the great influence of light on vegetation, imagined that the leaves of plants inhaled electric matter from the light with their upper surface. System of Vegetables Translated, page 8. The effect of light on plants occasions the actions of the vegetable muscles of their leaf stalks, which turn the upper side of the leaf to the light, and which open their calyxes and corals, according to the experiments of Abbe Tessier, who exposed a variety of plants in a cavern to different quantities of light. Hist de l'Académie Royale, and 1783. The sleep or vigilance of plants seems owing to the presence or absence of this stimulus. See note on Nimosa, volume 2. End note. 11. Come, ye soft sylphs, who fan the Paphian groves, and bear on sportive wings the callow loves. Call with sweet whisper, in each gale that blows, the slumbering snowdrop from her long repose. Charm the pale primrose from her clay-cold bed, 
unveil the bashful violet's tremulous head, while from her bud the playful tulip breaks, and young carnations peep with blushing cheeks. Bid the closed petals from nocturnal cold the virgin style in the silken curtains fold, shake into viewless air the morning dews, and wave in light their iridescent hues while from on high the bursting anthers trust to the mild breezes their prolific dust, or bend in rapture o'er the central fair, love out their hour, and leave their lives in air. So in his silken sepulchre the worm, warmed with new life, unfolds his larva form, erewhile aloft in wanton circles moves, and woos on hymen wings his velvet loves. Note love out their hour line 456 the vegetable passion of love is agreeably seen in the flower of the parnassia in which the males alternately approach and recede from the female and in the flower of nagella or devil in the bush in which the tall females bend down to their dwarf husbands but i was this morning surprised to observe amongst sir brooke boothby's valuable collection of plants at ashburn the manifest adultery of several females of the plant Collinsonia, who had bent themselves into contact with the males of other flowers of the same plant in their vicinity, neglectful of their own. September 16th. See additional notes, number 38. End note. Note. Unfolds his larval form. Line 458. The flower bursts forth from its larva, the herb, naked and perfect like a butterfly from its chrysalis winged with its coral wing sheathed by its calyx consisting alone of the organs of reproduction the males or stamens have their anthers replete with a prolific powder containing the vivifying fovilla in the females or pistils exists the ovary terminated by the tubular stigma when the anthers burst and shed their bags of dust the male fovilla is received by the prolific lymph of the stigma and produces the seed or egg, which is nourished in the ovary. System of Vegetables Translated from Linnaeus by the Litchfields Society, page 10. End note. 12. 1. If prouder branches with exuberance rude point their green gems, their barren shoots protrude, Wound them, ye sylphs, with little knives, or bind a wiry ringlet round the swelling rind. Bisect with chisel fine the root below, or bend to earth the inhospitable bough. So shall each germ with new prolific power delay the leaf bud and expand the flower. Closed in the style, the tender pith shall end, the lengthening wood and circling stamens bend. The smoother rind its soft embroidery spread in vaulted petals o'er their fertile bed, while the rough bark in circling mazes rolled forms the green cup with many a wrinkled fold, and each small bud scale spreads its foliage hard, firm round the callow germ, a floral guard. Note. Wound them, ye sylphs. Line 463. Mr. Whitmill advised to bind some of the most vigorous shoots with strong wire, and even some of the large roots. And Mr. Warner cuts what he calls a wild worm about the body of the tree, or scores the bark quite to the wood like a screw with a sharp knife. Bradley on Gardening, Volume 2, page 155. Mr. Fitzgerald produced flowers and fruit on wall trees by cutting off a part of the bark, Philosophical Transactions, and 1761. Monsieur Buffon produced some of the same effect by a straight bandage put round a branch, Act Paris, and 1738, and concludes that an engrafted branch bears better from its vessels being compressed by the callus. A complete cylinder of the bark about an inch in height was cut off from the branch of a pear tree against a wall in Mr. Howard's garden at Litchfield about five years ago. The circumcised part is now not above half the diameter of the branch above and below it, yet this branch has been full of fruit every year since, 
when the other branches of the tree bore only sparingly, I lately observed that the leaves of this wounded branch were smaller and paler, and the fruit less in size, and ripened sooner than on the other parts of the tree. Another branch has the bark taken off not quite all round, with much the same effect. The theory of this curious vegetable fact has been esteemed difficult, but receives great light from the foregoing account of the individuality of buds. A flower bud dies when it has perfected its seed, like an annual plant, and hence requires no place on the bark for new roots to pass downwards, but on the contrary leaf buds, as they advance into shoots from new buds in the axilla of every leaf, which new buds require new roots to pass down the bark, and thus thicken as well as elongate the branch. Now, if a wire or string be tied round the bark, many of these new roots cannot descend, and thence more of the buds will be converted into flower buds. It is customary to debark oak trees in the spring, which are intended to be felled in the ensuing autumn, because the bark comes off easier at this season, and the sapwood, or alburnum, is believed to become harder and more durable if the tree remains till the end of the summer. The trees thus stripped of their bark put forth shoots as usual with acorns on the sixth, seventh, and eighth joint, like vines. But in the branches I examined, the joints of the debarked trees were much shorter than those of other oak trees. The acorns were more numerous, and no new buds were produced above the joints which bore acorns. From hence it appears that the branches of debarked oak trees produce fewer leaf buds and more flower buds, which last circumstance, I suppose, must depend on their being sooner or later debarked in the vernal months, and, secondly, that the new buds of debarked oak trees continue to obtain moisture from the alburnum after the season of the ascent of sap in other vegetables ceases, which in this unnatural state of the debarked tree may act as capillary tubes, like the alburnum of the small debarked cylinder of a pear tree above mentioned, or may continue to act as placental vessels, as happens to the animal embryon in cases of superfetation, when the fetus continues a month or two in the womb beyond its usual time, of which some instances have been recorded, the placenta continues to supply perhaps the double office, both nutrition and of respiration. End note. Note. And bend to earth. Line 466. Mr. Hitt, in his treatise on fruit trees, observes that if a vigorous branch of a wall tree be bent to the horizon or beneath it, it loses its vigor and becomes a bearing branch. The theory of this, I suppose, to depend on the difficulty with which the leaf shoots can protrude the roots necessary for their new progeny of buds upwards along the bended branch to the earth contrary to their natural habits or powers, whence more flower shoots are produced which do not require new roots to pass along the bark of the bended branch, but which let their offspring, the seeds, fall upon the earth and seek roots for themselves. End note. Note. With new prolific power, line 467. About midsummer the new buds are formed, but it is believed by some of the Linnaean school that these buds may in their early state be either converted into flower buds or leaf buds, according to the vigor of the vegetating branch. Thus, if the upper part of a branch be cut away, the buds near the extremity of the remaining stem, having a greater proportional supply of nutriment, or possessing a greater facility of shooting their roots, or absorbent vessels down the bark, will become leaf buds, which might otherwise have been flower buds, and the contrary as explained in note on line 463 of this canto. End note. Note. Closed in the style, line 469. Quote, I conceive the medulla of a plant to consist of a bundle of nervous fibers, and that the propelling vital power separates their uppermost extremities. These, diverging, penetrate the bark which is now gelatinous and become multiplied in the new gem or leaf bud the ascending vessels of the bark being thus divided by the nervous fibers which perforate it and the ascent of its fluids being thus impeded the bark is extended into a leaf 
but the flower is produced when the protrusion of the medulla is greater than the retention of the including cortical part whence the substance of the bark is expanded in the calyx that of the rind or interior bark in the coral that of the wood in the stamens that of the medulla in the pistil vegetation thus terminates in the production of new life the ultimate medullary and cortical fibres being collected in the seeds linnaei systema veget page six edition fourteen end note where cruder juices swell the leafy vein stint the young germ the tender blossoms stain on each looped shoot a softer scion bind pith pressed to pith and rind applied to rind so shall the trunk with loftier crest ascend and wide in air its happier arms extend nurse the new buds admire the leaves unknown and blushing bend with fruitage not its own note nurse the new buds line four hundred eighty three mr fairchild budded a passion tree whose leaves were spotted with yellow into one which bears long fruit the buds did not take nevertheless in a fortnight yellow spots began to show themselves about three feet above the inoculation and in a short time afterwards yellow spots appeared on a shoot which came out of the ground from another part of the plant bradley volume two page one hundred twenty nine these facts are the more curious since from experiments of engrafting red currants on black ibid volume two the fruit does not acquire any change of flavor and by many other experiments neither color nor any other change is produced in the fruit engrafted on other stocks there is an apple described in bradley's work which is said to have one side of it a sweet fruit which boils soft and the other side a sour fruit which boils hard which mr bradley so long ago as the year seventeen twenty one ingeniously ascribes to the farina of one of these apples impregnating the other which would seem the more probable if we consider that each division of an apple is a separate womb and may therefore have a separate impregnation like puppies of different kinds in one litter the same is said to have occurred in oranges and lemons and grapes of different colors end note end of section sixteen Section 17 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Canto 4, lines 485 to 640. Thus when in holy triumph Aaron trod, and offered on the shrine his mystic rod, first a new bark its silken tissue weaves, new buds emerging widen into leaves fair fruits protrude in nascent flowers expand and blush and tremble round the living wand thirteen one sylphs on each oak bud wound the wormy galls with pygmy spears or crush the venomed balls fright the green locust from his foamy bed unweave the caterpillar's gluey thread chase the fierce earwig scare the bloated toad arrest the snail upon his slimy road arm with sharp thorns the sweet briar's tender wood and dash the sinips from her damask bud steep in ambrosial dews the woodbine's bells and drive the night moth from her honeyed cells so where the humming bird in chili's bowers on murmuring pinions robs the pendant flowers seeks where fine pores their dulcet balm distill and sucks the treasure with proboscis bill fair cypripedia with successful guile knits her smooth brow extinguishes her smile a spider's bloated paunch and jointed arms hide her fine form and mask her blushing charms in ambush sly the mimic warrior lies and on quick wing the panting plunderer flies note fair cypripedia line five hundred five the cypripedium from south america is supposed to be of a larger size and brighter colors than that from north america 
from which this print is taken. It has a large globular nectary about the size of a pigeon's egg of a fleshy color, and an incision or depression on its upper part much resembling the body of the large American spider. This globular nectary is attached to divergent slender petals not unlike the legs of the same animal. This spider is called by Linnaeus Arania avicularia, with a convex orbicular thorax, the center transversely excavated he adds that it catches small birds as well as insects, and has the venomous bite of a serpent. System Nature, Toma, 1, page 1034. Monsieur Lonvillier de Poincy, Histoire naturelle des Antilles, cap 14, article 3, calls it phalange, and describes the body to be the size of a pigeon's egg, with a hollow on its back like a navel and mentions its catching the hummingbird in its strong nets. The similitude of this flower to this great spider seems to be a vegetable contrivance to prevent the hummingbird from plundering its honey. About Matlock and Derbyshire, the fly ophrys is produced, the nectary of which so much resembles the small wall bee, perhaps the apis ichneumonia, that it may be easily mistaken for it at a small distance. It is probable that by this means it may often escape being plundered. See note on Lonicera in the next poem. A bird of our own country called a willow wren, Motacilla, runs up the stem of the crown imperial, Fritillaria coronalis, and sips the pendulous drops with its petals. This species of Motacilla is called by Re Regulus non Christatus, White's History of Selburn. End note. Note. Illustration. Cypripedium, London. Published December 1st, 1791 by J. Johnson. St. Paul's Churchyard. End note. 2. Shield the young harvest from devouring blight, the smut's dark poison, and the mildew white, deep-rooted mold, and ergot's horn uncouth, and break the canker's desolating tooth. First in one point the festering wound confined, Mines unperceived beneath the shriveled rind, Then climbs the branches with increasing strength, Spreads as they spread, and lengthens with their length. Thus the slight wound, engraved on glass annealed, Runs in white lines along the lucid field, Crack follows crack, to laws elastic just, And the frail fabric shivers into dust. Note. Shield the Young Harvest, line 511. Linnaeus enumerates but four diseases of plants. Erysici, the white mucor or mold, with sessile tawny heads, with which the leaves are sprinkled, as is frequent on the hop, humulus, maple, acer, etc. Rubigo, the ferruginous powder sprinkled under the leaves, frequent in ladies' mantle, alchemilla, etc. Clavus, when the seeds grow out into larger horns, black without, as in rye, this is called ergot by the French writers. Ustulago, when the fruit instead of seed produces a black powder, as in barley, oats, etc., to which perhaps the honeydew ought to have been added, and the canker, in the former of which the nourishing fluid of the plant seems to be exuded by a retrograde motion of the cutaneous lymphatics, as in the sweating sickness of the last century. The latter is a phagedenic ulcer of the bark, very destructive to young apple trees, and which in cherry trees is attended with a deposition of gum arabic, which often terminates in the death of the tree. End note. Note. Ergot's horn, line 513. There is a disease frequently affects the rye in France, and sometimes in England in moist seasons, which is called ergot, or horn seed. The grain becomes considerably elongated and is either straight or crooked, containing black meal along with the white, and appears to be pierced by insects, which were probably the cause of the disease. Mr. Duhamel ascribes it to this cause, and compares it to galls on oak leaves. By the use of this bad grain amongst the poor, Diseases have been produced, attended with great debility and mortification of the extremities, both in France and England. 
Dicht Raison, article Siegle, Philosophical Transactions. End note. Note. On glass annealed. Line 519. The glass makers occasionally make what they call proofs, which are cooled hastily, whereas the other glass vessels are removed from warmer ovens to cooler ones, and suffered to cool by slow degrees, which is called annealing, or kneeling them. If an unnealed glass be scratched by even a grain of sand falling into it, it will seem to consider of it for some time, or even a day, and will then crack into a thousand pieces. The same happens to a smooth-surfaced lead ore in Derbyshire, the workmen having cleared a large face of it, scratch it with picks, and in a few hours many tons of it crack to pieces and fall with a kind of explosion. Whitehurst's Theory of Earth Glass dropped into cold water, called Prince Rupert's Drops, explode when a small part of their tails are broken off, more suddenly indeed, but probably from the same cause. Are the internal particles of these elastic bodies kept so far from each other by the external crust that they are nearly in a state of repulsion into which state they are thrown by their vibrations from any violence applied? Or, like elastic balls in certain proportions suspended in contact with each other, can motion once began be increased by their elasticity till the whole explodes? And can this power be applied to any mechanical purposes? End note. 14. 1. Sylphs, if with morn destructive Eurus springs, O oh, clasp the harebell with your velvet wings, screen with thick leaves the jasmine as it blows, and shake the white rime from the shuddering rose, whilst Amaryllis turns with graceful ease her blushing beauties and eludes the breeze. Sylphs, if at noon the fritillary droops, with drops nectarious hang her nodding cups, thin clouds of gossamer in air display, and hide the veil's chaste lily from the ray. Whilst Erythrina o'er her tender flower bends all her leaves and braves the sultry hour, shield when cold Hesper sheds his dewy light, mimosa's soft sensations from the night. Fold her thin foliage, close her timid flowers, And with ambrosial slumbers guard her bowers, O'er each warm wall while Syria flings her arms, And wastes on night's dull eye a blaze of charms. Note. Illustration. Erythrina Corallodendron. London, published December 1st by J. Johnson, St. Paul's Churchyard. End note. Note. With ambrosial slumbers, line 538, many vegetables during the night do not seem to respire, but to sleep like the dormant animals and insects in winter. This appears from the mimosa and many other plants closing the upper sides of their leaves together in their sleep, and thus precluding that side of them from both light and air, and from many flowers closing up the polished or interior side of their petals, which we have also endeavored to show to be a respiratory organ. The irritability of plants is abundantly evinced by the absorption and pulmonary circulation of their juices. Their sensibility is shown by the approaches of the males to the females and of the females to the males in numerous instances, and, as the essential circumstance of sleep consists in the temporary abolition of voluntary power alone, the sleep of plants evinces that they possess voluntary power, which also indisputably appears in many of them by closing their petals or their leaves during cold or rain or darkness or from mechanic violence. End note. 2. Round her tall elm with dewy fingers twine the gadding tendrils of the adventurous vine from arm to arm in gay festoons suspend her fragrant flowers, her graceful foliage bend, swell with sweet juice her vermil orbs, and feed, shrined in transparent pulp, her pearly seed. Hang round the orange all her silver bells, and guard her fragrance with Hesperian spells. Bud after bud her polished leaves unfold, and load her branches with successive gold. 
so the learned alchemist exulting sees rise in his bright matras diana's trees drop after drop with just delay he pours the red fumed acid on potosi's oars with sudden flash the fierce bulitions rise and wide in air the gas phlogistic flies slow shoot at length in many a brilliant mass metallic roots across the nettled glass branch after branch extend their silver stems bud into gold and blossoms into gems note diana's trees line five hundred fifty two the chemists and astronomers from the earliest antiquity have used the same characters to represent the metals and the planets which were most probably outlines or abstracts of the original hieroglyphic figures of egypt these afterwards acquired niches in their temples and represented gods as well as metals and planets whence silver is called diana or the moon in the books of alchemy the process for making diana's silver tree is thus described by lemery dissolve one ounce of pure silver in acid of nitre very pure and moderately strong mix this solution with about twenty ounces of distilled water add to this two ounces of mercury and let it remain at rest in about four days there will form upon the mercury a tree of silver with branches imitating vegetation one as the mercury has a greater affinity than silver with the nitrous acid the silver becomes precipitated and being deprived of the nitrous oxygen by the mercury sinks down in its metallic form and luster two the attraction between silver and mercury which causes them readily to amalgamate together occasions the precipitated silver to adhere to the surface of the mercury in preference to any other part of the vessel three the attraction of the particles of the precipitated silver to each other causes the beginning branches to thicken and elongate into trees and shrubs rooted on the mercury for other circumstances concerning this beautiful experiment see mr keir's chemical dictionary article arbor diane a work perhaps of greater utility to mankind than the lost alexandrian library the continuation of which is so eagerly expected by all who are occupied in the arts or attached to the sciences End note. so sits enthroned in vegetable pride imperial q by thames's glittering side obedient sails from realms unfurrowed bring for her the unnamed progeny of spring attendant nymphs her dulcet mandates hear and nurse in fostering arms the tender year plant the young bulb inhume the living seed prop the weak stem the erring tendril lead or fan in glass-built fanes the stranger flowers with milder gales and steep with warmer showers delighted thames through tropic umbrage glides and flowers antarctic bending o'er his tides drinks the new tints the sweets unknown inhales and calls the sons of science to his veils in one bright point admiring nature eyes the fruits and foliage of discordant skies twines the gay floret with the fragrant bough and bends the wreath round george's royal brow sometimes retiring from the public wheel one tranquil hour the royal partners steal through glades exotic pass with step sublime or mark the growths of britain's happier clime with beauty blossomed and with virtue blazed mark the fair scions that themselves have raised sweet blooms the rose the towering oak expands the grace and guard of britain's golden lands fifteen sylphs who round earth on purple pinions borne attend the radiant chariot of the morn lead the gay hours along the ethereal height and on each dun meridian shower the light sylphs who from realms of equatorial day to climes that shudder in the polar ray from zone to zone pursue on shifting wing the bright perennial journey of the spring bring my rich balms from mecca's hallowed glades sweet flowers that glitter in arabia's shades fruits whose fair forms in bright succession glow 
gilding the banks of Arno or of Po, each leaf whose fragrant steam with ruby lip gay China's nymphs from pictured vases sip, each spicy rind which sultry India boasts, scenting the night air round her breezy coasts, roots whose bold stems in bleak Siberia blow, and gem with many a tint the eternal snow, barks whose broad umbrage high and ether waves o'er Andes steeps and hides his golden caves, and where yon oak extends his dusky shoots wide o'er the rill that bubbles from his roots, beneath whose arms, protected from the storm, a turf-built altar rears its rustic form, sylphs, with religious hands fresh garlands twine, and deck with lavish pomp Hygieia's shrine, call with loud voice the sisterhood that dwell on floating cloud, wide wave, or bubbling well, stamp with charmed foot, convoke the alarmed gnomes from golden beds and adamantine domes, each from her sphere with beckoning arm invite, curled with red flame, the vestal forms of light. Close all your spotted wings, in lucid ranks, press with your bending knees the crowded banks, cross your meek arms, incline your wreathed brows, and win the goddess with unwearied vows. O wave, Hygieia, o'er Britannia's throne thy serpent wand, and mark it for thy own. Lead round her breezy coasts thy guardian trains, her nodding forests and her waving plains. Shed o'er her peopled realms thy beamy smile, and with thy airy temple crown her isle. The goddess ceased, and calling from afar the wandering zephyrs, joins them to her car mounts with light bound and graceful as she bends whirls the long lash the flexile rein extends on whispering wheels the silver axle slides climbs into air and cleaves the crystal tides burst from its pearly chains her amber hair streams o'er her ivory shoulders buoyed in air swells her white veil with ruby clasp confined round her fair brow and undulates behind. The lessening coursers rise in spiral rings, pierce the slow-sailing clouds, and stretch their shadowy wings. End of section 17section 18 of the botanic garden a poem in two parts part one the economy of vegetation by erasmus darwin this librivox recording is in the public domain additional notes note one meteors ethereal forms you chase the shooting stars or yoke the volleyed lightning to your cars canto one line 115 there seem to be three concentric strata of our incumbent atmosphere, in which, or between them, are produced four kinds of meteors, lightning, shooting stars, fireballs, and northern lights. First, the lower region of air, or that which is dense enough to resist by the adhesion of its particles the descent of condensed vapor, or clouds, which may extend from one to three or four miles high. In this region, the common lightning is produced from the accumulation or defect of electric matter in those floating fields of vapor, either in respect to each other, or in respect to the earth beneath them, or the dissolved vapor above them, which is constantly varying both with the change of the form of the clouds, which thus evolve a greater or less surface, and also with their ever-changing degree of condensation. As the lightning is thus produced in dense air, it proceeds but a short course on account of the greater resistance which it encounters, is attended with a loud explosion, and appears with a red light. 2. The second region of the atmosphere, I suppose, to be that which has too little tenacity to support condensed vapor or clouds, but which yet contains invisible vapor, or water in aerial solution. This aerial solution of water differs from that dissolved in the matter of heat, as it is supported by its adhesion to the particles of air, and is not precipitated by cold, in this stratum it seems probable that the meteors called shooting stars are produced, and that they consist of electric sparks, or lightning, 
passing from one region to another of these invisible fields of aqueous solution. The height of these shooting stars has not yet been ascertained by sufficient observation. Dr. Blagden thinks their situation is lower down in the atmosphere than that of fireballs, which he conjectures from their swift apparent motion, and ascribes their smallness to the more minute division of the electric matter by which they are supposed to consist, owing to the greater resistance of the denser medium through which they pass than that in which the fireballs exist. Mr. Brydone observed that the shooting stars appeared to him to be as high in the atmosphere when he was near the summit of Mount Etna as they do when observed from the plain. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 63. As the stratum of air in which shooting stars are supposed to exist is much rarer than that in which lightning resides, and yet much denser than that in which fireballs are produced, they will be attracted at a greater distance than the former, and at a less than the latter. From this rarity of the air, so small a sound will be produced by their explosion as not to reach the lower part of the atmosphere. Their quantity of light from their greater distance being small, it is never seen through dense air at all, and thence does not appear red like lightning or fireballs. There are no apparent clouds to emit or to attract them, because the constituent parts of these aqueous regions may possess an abundance or deficiency of electric matter and yet be in perfect reciprocal solution. And lastly, their apparent train of light is probably owing only to a continuance of their impression on the eye, as when a fire stick is whirled in the dark it gives the appearance of a complete circle of fire. For these white trains of shooting stars quickly vanish, and do not seem to set anything on fire in their passage, as seems to happen in the transit of fireballs. 3. The second region or stratum of air terminates, I suppose, where the twilight ceases to be refracted, that is, where the air is three thousand times rarer than at the surface of the earth, and where it seems probable that the common air ends, and is surrounded by an atmosphere of inflammable gas tenfold rarer than itself. In this region I believe fireballs sometimes to pass, and at other times the northern lights to exist. One of these fireballs, or Draco Volans, was observed by Dr. Pringle and many others on November 26, 1758, which was afterwards estimated to have been a mile and a half in circumference, to have been about 100 miles high, and to have moved towards the north with a velocity of near 30 miles in a second of time. This meteor had a real tail many miles long, which threw off sparks in its course, and the whole exploded with a sound like distant thunder. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 51. Dr. Blagden has related the history of another large meteor, or fireball, which was seen the 18th of August, 1783, with many ingenious observations and conjectures. This was estimated to be between 60 and 70 miles high, and to travel 1,000 miles at the rate of about 20 miles in a second. The fireball had likewise a real train of light left behind in its passage, which varied in color, and in some part of its course gave off sparks or explosives where it had been brightest, and a dusky red streak remained visible perhaps a minute. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 74. These fireballs differ from lightning and from shooting stars in many remarkable circumstances. As their very great bulk, being a mile and a half in diameter, they're traveling 1,000 miles nearly horizontally, they're throwing off sparks in their passage and changing colors from bright blue to dusky red and leaving a train of fire behind them, continuing about a minute. They differ from the northern lights in not being diffused, but passing from one point of the heavens to another in a defined line, and this in a region above the crepuscular atmosphere, where the air is 3,000 times rarer than at the surface of the earth. There has not yet been even a conjecture which can account for these appearances. One I shall therefore hazard, which, if it does not inform, may amuse the reader. In the note on line 123, it was shown that there is probably a supernatant stratum of inflammable gas or hydrogen over the common atmosphere, and whose density at the surface where they meet must be at least ten times less than that upon which it swims, like chemical ether floating upon water, and perhaps without any real contact. 1. In this region, where the aerial atmosphere terminates and the inflammable one begins, the quantity of tenacity or resistance must be almost inconceivable, in which a ball of electricity might pass 1,000 miles with greater ease than 
through a thousandth part of an inch of glass. 2. Such a ball of electricity passing between inflammable and common air would set fire to them in a line as it padded along, which would differ in color according to the greater proportionate co-mixture of the two airs, and from the same cause there might occur greater degrees of inflammation or branches of fire in some parts of its course. As these fireballs travel in a defined line, it is pretty evident from the known laws of electricity that they must be attracted, and as they are a mile or more in diameter, they must be emitted from a large surface of electric matter, because large knobs give larger sparks, less diffused and more brightly luminous than less ones or points, and resist more forcibly the emission of the electric matter. What is there in nature can attract them at so great a distance of one thousand miles, and so forcibly as to detach an electric spark of a mile diameter? Can volcanoes at the time of their eruptions have this effect, as they are generally attended with lightning? Further observations must discover these secret operations of nature. As a stream of common air is carried along with the passage of electric aura from one body to another, it is easy to conceive that the common air and the inflammable air between which the fireball is supposed to pass will be partially intermixed by being thus agitated, and so far as it becomes intermixed it will take fire and produce the linear flame and branching sparks above described. In this circumstance of their being attracted, and thence passing in a defined line, the fireballs seem to differ from the coruscations of the aurora borealis, or northern lights, which probably take place in the same region of the atmosphere, where the common air exists in extreme tenuity, and is covered by a still rarer sphere of inflammable gas ten times lighter than itself. As the electric streams which constitute these northern lights seem to be repelled or radiated from an accumulation of that fluid in the north, and not attracted like the fireballs, this accounts for the diffusion of their light as well as the silence of their passage, while their variety of colors and the permanency of them, and even the breadth of them in different places, may depend on their setting on fire the mixture of inflammable and common air through which they pass as seems to happen in the transit of the fireballs. It was observed by Dr. Priestley that the electric shock taken through inflammable air was red, in common air it is bluish. To these circumstances perhaps some of the colors of the northern lights may bear analogy, though the density of the medium through which light is seen must principally vary its color, as is well explained by Mr. Morgan, Philosophical Transactions, Volume 75. Hence lightning is red when seen through a dark cloud, or near the horizon, because the more refrangible rays cannot penetrate so dense a medium. But the shooting stars consist of white light, as they are generally seen on clear nights and nearly vertical. In other situations their light is probably too faint to come to us, but as in some remarkable appearances of the northern lights, as in March 1716, all the prismatic colors were seen quickly to succeed each other, these appear to have been owing to real combustion as the density of the interposed medium could not be supposed to change so frequently, and therefore these colors must have been owing to different degrees of heat, according to Mr. Morgan's theory of combustion. In Smith's Optics, page 69, the prismatic colors and optical deceptions of the northern lights are described by Mr. Coates. The Torricellian vacuum, if perfectly free from air, is said by Mr. Morgan and others to be a perfect non-conductor, this circumstance, therefore, would preclude the electric streams from rising above the atmosphere. But as Mr. Morgan did not try to pass an electric shock through a vacuum, and as air, or something containing air, surrounding the transit of electricity may be necessary to the production of light, the conclusion may perhaps still be dubious. If, however, the streams of the northern lights were supposed to rise above our atmosphere, they would only be visible at each extremity of their course, where they emerge from or are again emerged into the atmosphere, but not in their journey through the vacuum. For the absence of electric light in a vacuum is sufficiently proved by the common experiment of shaking a barometer in the dark. The electricity produced by the friction of the mercury in the glass at its top is luminous if the barometer has a little air in it, but there is no light if the vacuum be complete. The aurora borealis, or northern dawn, is very ingeniously accounted for by Dr. Franklin on principles of electricity. He premises the following electric phenomena. 1. 
that all new fallen snow has much positive electricity standing on its surface, two, that about twelve degrees of latitude round the poles are covered with a crust of eternal ice which is impervious to the electric fluid, three, that the dense part of the atmosphere rises but a few miles high, and that in the rarer parts of it the electric fluid will pass to almost any distance. Hence he supposes there must be a great accumulation of positive electric matter on the fresh-fallen snow in the polar regions, which, not being able to pass through the crust of ice into the earth, must rise into the rare air of the upper part of our atmosphere, which will the least resist its passage, and passing towards the equator descend again into the denser atmosphere, and thence into the earth in silent streams. And that many of these appearances attending these lights are optical deceptions, owing to the situation of the eye that beholds them, which makes all ascending parallel lines appear to converge to a point. The idea, above explained in note on line 123, of the existence of a sphere of inflammable gas over the aerial atmosphere would much favor this theory of Dr. Franklin, because in that case the dense aerial atmosphere would rise a much less height in the polar regions, diminishing almost to nothing at the pole itself, and thus give an easier passage to the ascent of the electric fluid, and from the great difference in the specific gravity of the two airs and the velocity of the Earth's rotation, there must be a place between the poles and the equator where the superior atmosphere of inflammable gas would terminate, which would account for these streams of the aurora borealis not appearing near the equator. Add to this that it is probable the electric fluid may be heavier than the magnetic one, and will thence, by the rotation of the Earth's surface, ascend over the magnetic one by its centrifugal force, and may thus be induced to rise through the thin stratum of aerial atmosphere over the poles. See note on Canto 2, line 193. I shall have occasion again to mention this great accumulation of inflammable air over the poles, and to conjecture that these northern lights may be produced by the union of inflammable with common air, without the assistance of the electric spark to throw them into combustion. The antiquity of the appearance of northern lights has been doubted, as none were recorded in our annals since the remarkable one on November 14, 1574, till another remarkable one on March 6, 1716, and the three following nights, which were seen at the same time in Ireland, Russia, and Poland, extending near 30 degrees of longitude, and from about the 50th degree of latitude over almost all the north of Europe. There is, however, reason to believe them of remote antiquity, though inaccurately described. Thus the following curious passage from the Book of Maccabees, B. 2. C. V is such a description of them as might probably be given by an ignorant and alarmed people. Quote, Through all the city, for the space of almost forty days, there were seen horsemen running in the air in cloth of gold, and armed with lances like a band of soldiers, and troops of horsemen in array encountering and running one against another, with shaking of shields and multitude of pikes, and drawing of swords and casting of darts, and glittering of golden ornaments and harness. End, quote. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts. Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Note 2. Primary Colors. Cling round the aerial bough with prisms bright, and pleased untwist the sevenfold threads of light. Canto 1, line 117. The manner in which the rainbow is produced was in some measure understood before Sir Isaac Newton had discovered his theory of colors. The first person who expressly showed the rainbow to be formed by the reflection of the sunbeams from drops of falling rain was Antonio de Dominis. This was afterwards more fully and distinctly explained by Descartes, but what caused the diversity of its colors was not then understood. It was reserved for the immortal Newton to discover that the rays of light consisted of seven combined colors of different refrangibility, which could be separated at pleasure by a wedge of glass. Pemberton's View of Newton Sir Isaac Newton discovered that the prismatic spectrum was composed of seven colors in the following proportions, 
Violet, 80. Indigo, 40. Blue, 60. Green, 60. Yellow, 48. Orange, 27. Red, 45. If all these colors be painted on a circular card in the proportions above mentioned, and the card be rapidly whirled on its center, they produce in the eye the sensation of white. And any one of these colors may be imitated by painting a card with the two colors which are contiguous to it, in the same proportions as in the spectrum, and whirling them in the same manner. My ingenious friend, Mr. Galton of Birmingham, ascertained in this manner by a set of experiments the following propositions, the truth of which he had preconceived from the above data. 1. Any color in the prismatic spectrum may be imitated by a mixture of the two colors contiguous to it. 2. If any three successive colors in the prismatic spectrum are mixed, they compose only the second or middlemost color. 3. If any four successive colors in the prismatic spectrum be mixed, a tint similar to a mixture of the second and third colors will be produced, but not precisely the same, because they are not in the same proportion. 4. If beginning with any color in the circular spectrum, you take of the second color a quantity equal to the first, second, and third, and add to that the fifth color, equal in quantity to the fourth, fifth, and sixth, and with these combine the seventh color in the proportion it exists in the spectrum, white will be produced. Because the first, second, and third compose only the second, and the fourth, fifth, and sixth compose only the fifth, therefore if the seventh be added, the same effect is produced, as if all the seven were employed. 5. Beginning with any color in the circular spectrum, if you take a tint composed of a certain proportion of the second and third, equal in quantity to the first, second, third, and fourth, and add to this the sixth color, equal in quantity to the fifth, sixth, and seventh, white will be produced. From these curious experiments of Mr. Galton, many phenomena in the chemical changes of colors may probably become better understood, especially if, as I suppose, the same theory must apply to transmitted colors as to reflected ones. Thus it is well known that if the glass of manganese, which is a tint probably composed of violet and indigo, be mixed in a certain proportion with the glass of lead, which is yellow, that mixture becomes transparent. Now from Mr. Galton's experiments it appears that in reflected colors such a mixture would produce white, that is, the same as if all the colors were reflected, and therefore, in transmitted colors, the same circumstances must produce transparency, that is, the same as if all the colors were transmitted. For the particles, which constitute the glass of manganese, will transmit red, violet, indigo, and blue, and those of the glass of lead will transmit orange, yellow, and green, hence all the primary colors by a mixture of these glasses become transmitted, that is, the glass becomes transparent. Mr. Galton has further observed that five successive prismatic colors may be combined in such proportions as to produce but one color, a circumstance which might be of consequence in the art of painting. For if you begin at any part of the circular spectrum above described and take the first, second, and third colors in the proportions in which they exist in the spectrum, these will compose only the second color equal in quantity to the first, second, and third. Add to these the third, fourth, and fifth in the proportion they exist in the spectrum, and these will produce the fourth color equal in quantity to the third, fourth, and fifth. Consequently, this is precisely the same thing as mixing the second and fourth colors only, which mixture would only produce the third color. Therefore, if you combine the first, second, fourth, and fifth in the proportions in which they exist in the spectrum, with double the quantity of the third color, this third color will be produced. It is probable that many of the unexpected changes in mixing colors on a painter's easel, as well as in more fluid chemical mixtures, may depend on these principles rather than on a new arrangement or combination of their minute particles. Mr. Galton further observes that white may universally be produced by the combination of one prismatic color and a tint intermediate to two others which tint may be distinguished by a name compounded of the two colors, to which it is intermediate. Thus white is produced by a mixture of red with blue-green, of orange with indigo-blue, of yellow with violet-indigo, of green with red-violet, of blue with orange-red, of indigo with yellow-orange, of violet with green-yellow, 
which he further remarks exactly coincides with the theory and facts mentioned by Dr. Robert Darwin of Shrewsbury in his account of ocular spectra, who has shown that when one of these contrasted colors has been long viewed, a spectrum or appearance of the other becomes visible in the fatigued eye. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 76, for the year 1786. These experiments of Mr. Galton might much assist the copperplate printers of calicoes and papers in colors, as three colors or more might be produced by two copper plates. Thus, suppose some yellow figures were put on by the first plate, and upon some of these yellow figures and on other parts of the ground, blue was laid on by another copper plate. The three colors of yellow, blue, and green might be produced, as green leaves with yellow and blue flowers. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts. Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Note 3. Colored Clouds. Eve's silken couch with gorgeous tints adorn, or fire the arrowy throne of rising morn. Canto 1, line 119. The rays from the rising and setting sun are refracted by our spherical atmosphere, hence the most refrangible rays, as the violet, indigo, and blue, are reflected in greater quantities from the morning and evening skies, and the least refrangible ones, as red and orange, are last seen about the setting sun. Hence Mr. Begelin observed that the shadow of his finger on his pocketbook was much bluer in the morning and evening, when the shadow was about eight times as long as the body from which it was projected. Mr. Melville observes that the blue rays being more refrangible are bent down in the evenings by our atmosphere, while the red and orange being less refrangible continue to pass on and tinge the morning and evening clouds with their colors. See Priestley's History of Light and Colors, page 440. But as the particles of air, like those of water, are themselves blue, a blue shadow may be seen at all times of the day, though much more beautifully in the mornings and evenings, or by means of a candle in the middle of the day. For if a shadow on a piece of white paper is produced by placing your finger between the paper and a candle in the daylight, the shadow will appear very blue. The yellow light of the candle upon the other parts of the paper apparently deepens the blue by its contrast, these colors being opposite to each other, as explained in note 2. Colors are produced from clouds or mists by refraction as well as by reflection. In riding in the night over an unequal country, I observed a very beautiful colored halo round the moon whenever I was covered with a few feet of mist, as I ascended from the valleys, which ceased to appear when I rose above the mist. This, I suppose, was owing to the thinness of the stratum of mist in which I was immersed. Had it been thicker, the colors refracted by the small drops of which a fog consists would not have passed through it down to my eye. There is a bright spot seen on the cornea of the eye when we face a window, which is much attended to by portrait painters, this is the light reflected from the spherical surface of the polished cornea and brought to a focus. If the observer is placed in this focus, he sees the image of the window. If he is placed before or behind the focus, he only sees a luminous spot, which is more luminous and of less extent the nearer he approaches to the focus. The luminous appearance of the eyes of animals in the dusky corners of a room or in holes in the earth may arise in some instances from the same principle viz. the reflection of the light from the spherical cornea, which will be colored red or blue in some degree by the morning, evening, or meridian light, or by the objects from which that light is previously reflected. In the cavern at Colebrook Dale, where the mineral tar exudes, the eyes of the horse, which was drawing a cart from within towards the mouth of it, appeared like two balls of phosphorus when he was above one hundred yards off, and for a long time before any other part of the animal was visible. In this case, I suspect the luminous appearance to have been owing to the light, which had entered the eye, being reflected from the back surface of the vitreous humor, and thence emerging again in parallel rays from the animal's eye, as it does from the back surface of the drops of the rainbow. 
and from the water drops which lie, perhaps without contact, on cabbage leaves and have the brilliancy of quicksilver. This accounts for this luminous appearance being best seen in those animals which have large apertures in their iris, as in cats and horses, and is the only part visible in obscure places, because this is a better reflecting surface than any other part of the animal. If any of these emergent rays from the animal's eye can be supposed to have been reflected from the choroid coat through the semi-transparent retina, this would account for the colored glare of the eyes of dogs or cats, and rabbits in dark corners. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Botanic Garden, A Poem in Two Parts, Part 1, The Economy of Vegetation, by Erasmus Darwin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Note 4. Comets. Alarm with comet blaze the sapphire plain, the wan stars glimmering through its silver train. Canto 1, line 133. There have been many theories invented to account for the tales of comets. Sir Isaac Newton thinks that they consist of rare vapors raised from the nucleus of the comet, and so rarefied by the sun's heat as to have their general gravitation diminished, and that they in consequence ascend opposite to the sun, and from thence reflect the rays of light. Dr. Haley compares the light of the tales of comets to the streams of the aurora borealis, and other electric effluvia. Philosophical Transactions, number 347. Dr. Hamilton observes that the light of small stars are seen undiminished through both the light of the tails of comets and of the aurora borealis, and has further illustrated their electric analogy, and adds that the tails of comets consist of a lucid, self-shining substance which has not the power of refracting or reflecting the rays of light. Essays. The tail of the comet of 1744 at one time appeared to extend above 16 degrees from its body, and must have thence been above 23 millions of miles long. And the comet of 1680, according to the calculations of Dr. Haley on November the 11th, was not above one semi-diameter of the earth, or less than 4,000 miles to the northward of the way of the earth, at which time had the earth been in that part of its orbit, what might have been the consequence? No one would probably have survived to have registered the tremendous effects. The comet of 1531, 1607, and 1682, having returned in the year 1759, according to Dr. Haley's prediction in the Philosophical Transactions for 1705, there seems no reason to doubt that all the other comets will return after their proper periods. Astronomers have in general acquiesced in the conjecture of Dr. Haley that the comets of 1532 and 1661 are one and the same comet from the similarity of the elements of their orbits, and were therefore induced to expect its return to its perihelium, 1789. As this comet is liable to be disturbed in its ascent from the sun by the planets Jupiter and Saturn, Dr. Maskelyne, expected its return to its perihelium in the beginning of the year 1789, or the latter end of the year 1788, and certainly sometime before the 27th of April 1789, which prediction has not been fulfilled. Philosophical Transactions, Volume 76. End of Section 21